Background to Betrayal, The Tragedy of Vietnam. Hilaire du Berrier. Background English Paperback The Americanist Library. The Americanist Library. Dot. Reaches for its manuscripts to every corner of the earth, and to every era of man's culture. For the ideals represented by America at its best have been acclaimed alike by the Roman, Cicero, 2000 years ago, by the Frenchman, Bastiat, a hundred years ago, and by the Korean, Syngman Rhee, only yesterday. Is published for readers of every clime and color and creed, and of every nationality. An American or a German or an Egyptian or a Japanese or an Australian, a Catholic or a Protestant or a Jew or a Mohammedan or a Buddhist, each alike can be or become a good Americanist, in the fundamental meaning of that term which these volumes will strengthen and support. Dot. Seeks to make readily available, in a uniform and inexpensive format, a growing series of great books that define many battle lines in the long war between freedom and slavery. The first fully recorded engagement in that war was between the constructive forces of Athenian individualism and the destructive forces of Spartan collectivism. Those prototypes find their recurrent spiritual reincarnation today in the bitter contemporary struggle between the Americanist and the communist systems. For the Americanist, always and everywhere, Education is the basic strategy, honor truth is the vital weapon. It is top purpose of this series to supply searchlights and alarm bells, and weaponry honor the will to win, for those who believe that Bryant's admonition must be heeded in every age. Not yet, O oh freedom! Close thy lids in slumber, for thine enemy never sleeps. Copyright Copyright 1965 by Western Islands Published by Western Islands 395 Concord Avenue Belmont, Massachusetts 02178. All rights reserved. Library of Congress Catalog Card Number 6524091. Introduction. At the time this book is being published, the heated words of dispute over what is really happening in Vietnam have soared into a conflagration. Everybody from Suzanne Labin and Senator Dodd to Henry Cabot Lodge and Maxwell Taylor has versions to give you of who is doing what to whom, and why and for what purpose. And in some of these versions, anyway, any resemblance to the truth is purely coincidental. This book, however, is not concerned primarily with the present tragedy in Vietnam. Its subtitle is The Tragedy of Vietnam, which indicates a far longer perspective. The carefully stage managed horror now being acted out in that unhappy country is of great interest because of the undisclosed purposes for which this fraud is being perpetrated and prolonged. But this volume is history, not conjecture. It was the destruction and demoralization of anti communist groups and leaders in South Vietnam, already carried out by the end of the Eisenhower administration through the regime it had imposed on the Vietnamese people to which the current confusion is but an epilogue. And regardless of whatever whole new tragedy this confusion may be intended to serve in turn as a prologue, the author of this book is simply attempting to make clear the background to the total betrayal. It is apparent, to anybody who will study all of the antics on this stage with prerequisite knowledge and objective vision, that communist influences are pulling strings and determining actions on both sides exactly as we now know to have been the case in the Korean War. And it is entirely possible that a repetition of that sham, on a far more extensive scale and with far more serious aspects and results, might be in the making. A war between ourselves and the Chinese Communists, in and supposedly over Vietnam, exactly as took place in Korea, would enable left-wing influences in the present administration, and their Soviet allies to make even more effective use, than has been achieved so far, of the highly publicized but wholly factitious feud between Red Russia and Red China. As in World War II, the Soviets would again become our noble allies. The rapprochement between our government and the Soviet government could be made visibly far greater, and in detailed practical effect far more extensive than it is today. And the regimentation that could be imposed on the American people, 
by an administration which has already shown itself to be hell-bent for tyranny, with this war against Red China as the excuse, would make the government controls of World War II look like a study in free enterprise and personal liberty. When communist-led students and communist front groups parade and picket against our remaining in Vietnam, right while the actual results of our staying there continue to be so damaging to any residue of real anti-communist strength in that country, you can be sure that the plotters activating these poor misguided puppets are seeking to support the belief, of the even more misguided American people, that we really are trying to save Vietnam from communism, and are willing to use force to do so. This psychological build-up of a willingness on the part of the American people to accept a state of war against the Red Chinese is just one of a great many straws in the wind, indicating that such a phonally controlled, play-acting, but horribly cruel war, may be blowing towards us. But this book is not written or published because of, nor is it in any way based on, any such hypothesis, or possibility. Its purpose is merely to make available to the American people a knowledge of what has gone before, a knowledge of the situation that has gradually been created in Indochina by agencies of our government and the communists working together, ever since we put Ho Chi Minh in business with our money and equipment in 1944. This is so that whatever use is made of that situation in the future, the new developments can be well enough understood by enough of our fellow citizens to keep those developments from being quite so disastrous to our country. Robert Welch At the end of the 18th century the Nguyen dynasty reigned over southern Annam, which lay to the south of China. Tonkin the province to the north of Annam and bordering on China proper, see maps in center section, had been retaken from China and Nguyen power appeared supreme, when a merciless revolt shook the land. The Nguyen's were swept away, and chaos succeeded them. In France the first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, was restoring order to a tortured country and, in a great burst of energy, Frenchmen sailed far and wide over the world. It was in 1801 that one of these leagued with a descendant of the Nguyen's and helped to bring Annam, the middle country, Tonkin to the north, and Cochin China to the south, once more under Nguyen rule. The empire of Annam was born, and France made her entry into the world that was to become known as Indochina. In 1858 a French naval force on its way home from a joint Franco-British expedition against China put in at a port about halfway up the east coast which the French commander, Rigault de Genuilly, called Touraine and which the Americans now know as Dianan. From there the French sailed south and occupied Saigon. Four years later, in 1862, the Emperor Tadu granted France a foothold on the east coast of his southern province. Cochin China, and with it ceded the island of Palokandor, noted today for its prison. The following year, in 1863, King Noradam of Cambodia placed himself under the protection of France. Then came 1866, the year of Francis Garnier's great exploration of the Mekong River in search of a commercial route to the southern provinces of China. In 1867 the west coast of Cochin China was ceded to France. Six years later a minor incident led to fighting and Francis Garnier occupied Hanoi to restore order. Garnier was killed but the protectorate he established over the northern province of Tonkin remained. Garnier's successor was in turn killed in 1882. The following year war broke out with China. French forces debarked at Haiphong, defeated. The Chinese in a year of fighting and in 1885 signed the Treaty of Shenzhen out of which, two years later, France's Indochina Union came into being. On the east coast lay Vietnam, or the Empire Art Annam as it was also called. Landlocked Laos bordered Vietnam on the west. South of Laos and wedged between Siam and Vietnam was Cambodia. Gradually Laos and the Kingdom of Cambodia were added to the protectorate which the French established. By 1884 the three lands were known as French Indochina. Three kingdoms had previously existed in Laos. The Kingdom of Luang Prabang was an ally of Siam. 
Vientiane was a vassal of Annam, and the kings of Champasak were vassals of the powerful rulers of Liwang Prabang until Siam invaded the country early in the 19th century. Vientian power was destroyed by the Siamese, and thereafter the rulers of Liwang Prabang reigned supreme. Under the French protectorate France replaced Siam in the affairs of Laos, and the implantation of French culture continued unhindered in Indochina until 1940, when Japan wrung permission from Admiral de Coup, the French governor-general, to send in troops supposedly to see that material was not being transported to Chinese forces over the French railway to the north. Admiral de Coup resisted as long as he could, but his position was hopeless. He was cut off from France, his aviation was non-existent, and his forces had ammunition for only a day and a half of fighting. Neither Britain nor America was prepared to come to his aid. Cordell Hull was America's Secretary of State at the time. French Ambassador Street Quentin asked, in Washington, shall we resist? If I were you I would yield, Mr. Hull replied. According to Mr. Charles Boland's minutes of the Cairo Tehran papers, it was by a secret agreement between President Roosevelt and Joseph Stalin on December 1, 1943, that France's premature elimination from Southeast Asia and the sowing of wars to come were effected. Franklin D. Roosevelt, we are told but Mr. Bolan, was 100% in agreement, at Tehran, with Marshal Stalin that France should not get back Indochina. The war that France fought to retain Indochina within the French community and free from communism terminated on May 7, 1954, with the fall of the fortified position of Dien Bien Phu, after five months of heroic resistance. Communist members of the French National Assembly rose to their feet and applauded when the assembly was informed that Dean Bian Phu had fallen. It was established that a one-hour strike by American planes could have saved the beleaguered garrison and changed the course of history. On five separate occasions such a strike was discussed, but each time reasons were found to rule out American rescue from the air. The first such proposal came on March 25, 1954, when Admiral Arthur W. Radford, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and France's General Lely talked of a limited tactical air strike against the Viet Minh, in view of the appearance of Chinese heavy artillery and anti-aircraft batteries at Dien Bien Phu. Admiral Radford favored the strike. Chances of its leading to massive Chinese intervention were considered nil. Rather, it was believed that American determination would discourage Peking from further adventures. Congress presumably at the request of John Foster Dulles, the U.S. Secretary of State, vetoed the proposal. By April 2 the situation at Dien Bien Phu was becoming desperate. Dulles' reaction was to call French Ambassador Henri Bonnet for a one-hour talk and outline a nebulous, time-consuming and probably unfeasible plan for joint action by America, Australia, New Zealand and Britain. Paris saw it as a prelude to internationalization of the conflict, without any assurance that an anti-communist victory was Mr. Dulles' aim. On April 23 Mr. Dulles was in Paris, preparing for the forthcoming Geneva Conference. Georges Bidalt of France showed him an urgent message from General Henri Navarre, stating that only immediate, massive American air support could save the garrison at Dien Bien Phu. Mr. Dulles replied that no such support was possible without a preliminary political agreement with the other powers having vital interests in Southeast Asia, particularly Great Britain. This time Britain refused to cooperate. Dean Bian Phu fell on May 7. Less than two weeks earlier the conference had opened in Geneva. French Premier Lamel asked U.S. Ambassador Dillon what the attitude of America would be if an honorable peace could not be obtained or if before the end of the conference, the military situation should deteriorate further. Ambassador Bonnet had instructions to put the same question before the Department of State. Principal points of the American reply, delivered on May 15, were not encouraging. France must formally demand American intervention. Britain, Thailand, the Philippines, Australia and New Zealand must receive the same request. Any intervention that might follow must be under the United Nations. 
France must openly declare the three states of Indochina independent, even to permitting their secession from the French community, if they wished. Manifestly Washington was playing for time. The fifth and last attempt to enlist American support came on May 24, when Foreign Minister Bidalt appealed to General Walter Biddle Smith, then you. S. Under Secretary of State. Smith held out some encouragement. Not only was eventual air support possible, said he, but American Marines could be moved into Indochina without it constituting an act of war, according to the Constitution, or necessitating congressional approval. For several weeks the Lanial government clung to this final hope. In the end even such support as Lebanon obtained in three days in 1958 was refused. Allegedly a small group headed by Secretary of Defense Charles E. Wilson and the generals Ridgway and Twining, and supported by the senators who had consistently worked to block a French victory, was responsible for Washington's final reply, a modified version of the conditions specified on May 15. Deprived of American support, the Lanial government fell in Pierre Mendes France, the socialist rose to conclude the treaty by which Tonkin and that part of Annam above the 17th parallel were given to Ho Chi Minh, the communist. Annam below the 17th parallel and all of Cochin China were to be evacuated by the communists until a referendum, set for 1956, might decide under which section, north or south, the country would be reunited. Thus, by a circuitous route and at the cost of 170,000 casualties, French and native, the Roosevelt Stalin Accord of December 1, 1943, was fulfilled and the story of so called Free Vietnam began. Said Mr. Dulles, a year will be enough for us to train the South Vietnamese government and army to take over and be on their own. Hilaire du Berrier. Note. Readers are urged to refer to the appendix section at the rear of this volume. It is believed that the information contained there will be an aid to understanding the story of Vietnam. The brainwashing machine the showcase for democracy at work the blow falls on South Vietnam's Chinese the downgrade becomes perceptible the police state America supported price tag for disaster the chain reaction prelude to the end. Americans had no say in what was done in their name in South Vietnam. A small, firmly knit group succeeded in making South Vietnam the proving ground for their ideas, which millions of Vietnamese will expiate in chains and for which all Americans will stand accused before history. Chapter 1 Vietnam Vietnam is the land to the south, which is to say the land to the south of China, where the center of the universe was said to be. A rich patina of story hangs over Vietnam's steaming jungles and spongy swamps. Strange tribes live in the high central plateau to the north. In neighboring Cambodia existed the ancient empire of the Khmers, builders of the sacred city of Angkor Wat, around which, so the natives say, the forest is traversed by phantom armies led by weeping queens on shadowy elephants. Above the 17th parallel is North Vietnam, the state of communist Ho Chi Minh, whose followers call themselves Viet Minh, light of the land. There are approximately 60,900 square miles to Ho Chi Minh's country with a population of some 16,200,000. South Vietnam, the land below the 17th parallel, has an area of roughly 66,350 square miles and a population between 15 million and 15 million 500,000. The reunification of these two Vietnams, under the East's concept or ours, is the objective that has made South Vietnam a battlefield. In this struggle, as regards communism America's role was defensive, the role of reaction, never initiative. Only in advancing the leader of our choice were we aggressive. America staked her own prestige and Southeast Asia's future on Goad and DM, an unknown ascetic of strange moods and violent rages. It was from a faceless group in Washington with international ramifications, not from his countrymen, that he received his mandate. Our study of this struggle begins in the spring of 1954 in Geneva, Switzerland. 
France had lost the costly Battle of Dien Bien Phu and the Lanyul government was groping for a way to extricate itself from an unpopular war, though it meant the end of a hundred years of occupation and the markets on which a sector of the French economy existed. Much drivel has been written about the communist victory at Dien Bien Phu. For eight years Americans interested in foisting Godin Diem on his countrymen and the American public, for reasons known only to themselves, held up the Washington Post puppet as a miracle worker. None of the experts gave him a chance against the army that had defeated the French, was the line parroted by Angie Biddle Duke, who headed American Friends of Vietnam, the propaganda front set up to circumvent the foreign agent's registration law. What experts? Angie Biddle Duke? Public Relations Huckster Harold Doram? Joseph Buttinger, the Austrian Socialist, Lieutenant General Ian Michael Daniel, who left the U.S. Army to help sell DM in America, Wesley Fischel, who indoctrinated the students of Michigan State University with the DM hoax and called it education. The real experts knew that the French debacle in Indochina was no proof of communist Viet Minh invincibility American labor leaders through their connections with the French unions and French socialists knew that socialist leader Pierre Mendes France's personal representative, who was high commissioner in Indochina by appointment of Premier Lamel, was in contact with the enemy, ironing out their peace terms for a year and a half while the French army was fighting General Henri Navarre, the French commander knew that the Battle of Dien Bien Phu was lost the day it became known that the Lamel government had agreed to a conference in Geneva. From that moment all the force Ho Chi Minh could muster was thrown into a frontal attack on Dien Bien Phu in order to gain a psychological victory to exploit at the conference table. It was a Pyrrhic victory. Ho had no army with which to occupy Laos, seize Cambodia and threaten South Vietnam when it was over. It would have taken four years to rebuild the army he had lost. But the West was never told this, for the French left wished to justify surrender and the American left wished to portray D.M., the labor leader's brother, as the miracle man before whom victorious communism on the march had lost confidence and halted. The French regarded their sacrifices in Indochina as a standard-bearing struggle for Western civilization, as did the Americans in Korea. The communist world and its sympathizers depicted it as a rearguard action to preserve colonialism and nothing more. Naturally the conference arranged in Geneva was weighted from the first against the French. Britain, France, communist China and Russia gathered around the table with the United States looking on. Over tow shoulders or China mid Russia appeared communist Ho Chi Minh's foreign minister, Pham Van Dong. Anthony Eden represented Britain's pivotal position, bridging east and west in the center of the seesaw. He alone had a representative in Peking and his country traded on a large scale with Russia. No one could accuse him of supporting either Mao Zedong or Bao Dai, the Vietnamese ruler whose country was on the operating table. Molotov spoke for Russia, Chuen Lai for Red China, Foreign Minister George Isbidalt for France and Pham Van Dong for Ho Chi Minh. Secretary of State Dulles flew in, stayed for a few days and departed, leaving General Bidil Smith as his observer. Bao Dai, the Emperor of Vietnam and Chief of State, accompanied by his cousin, Prince Buulak, the Prime Minister, sat in the Vmias Hotel in Avian, powerless to affect history in one way or the other while their affairs of state were being settled. As one by one the countries concerned took up their positions around the conference table in Geneva, the situation looked something like this, Molotov, when he bothered to be civil, did so for reasons of propaganda. He wanted a peace that would permit the infiltration of soldiers without uniform, political agents of the Viet Minh, into areas still occupied by the French, a peace that would permit a gradual dilution and eventual elimination of everything representing the Occident from Southeast Asia. Chuen Lai was not satisfied with a communist triumph. His aim was the yellowing of the rest of Asia by complete elimination of the white man. Time was working for him. He and Ho Chi Minh could afford to be patient. Unlike Eden and Bidalt and Bidil Smith, they did not have to reckon with public opinion. Whether peace came or not was all the same to them, 
they had only to await a more favorable time and reopen hostilities. Pham Van Dong, the lieutenant and spokesman of Ho Chi Minh, was flanked by Molotov and Chu. The Chinese were the theoreticians of the bloc, the most insulting, the most unyielding, but it was to the Russians that Dong was deferential. Eden stoutly denied charges of neutralism but his thinking was, nevertheless, along traditional British mercantile lines, namely that it was better to sacrifice half of Indochina than risk any loss for England. He felt that communism should be stopped, but Indochina was neither the place nor the time. Better to wait till Hong Kong or Malay or Singapore were threatened. In his pocket, as he negotiated, was a telegram from Nehru telling him to do anything as long as it meant peace. No one knew where America stood. Monsieur Bidault complained that lack of American support prevented his sowing discord between the Chinese and the Russians. Dean Bian Fu had fallen on May 7, 1954, after a heroic resistance. On May 11, at 10.30 a.m., Mr. Dulles held a Washington press conference. He had just returned from Geneva. He had no statement to make, but he was ready to answer questions. Daniel Skar of CBS asked if Southeast Asia could be defended if Indochina fell. Mr. Dulles replied, I believe so. A murmur went through the room. Another voice asked, Mr. Secretary, do you regard Laos and Cambodia as necessary for the defense of Southeast Asia? They are important, replied Mr. Dulles, but not essential. To Monsieur Bidault, informed of the Dulles statements while still at the conference table, they had the effect of a knife between the shoulder blades. Notice had been served that come what might, America would not intervene. Behind Bidault the support of a war-weary France dropped alarmingly. Britain knew, France knew, and the negotiating Reds knew that the game was over. Admiral Radford was more than disappointed, he had previously stated that if Indochina fell the sole remaining line for the defense of the Southeast Asia Peninsula would run from the Christmas across Malaya, a continental line which the British had held for three days against the Japanese and which President Eisenhower had described as barely defendable. Mr. Dulles' statements before the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations a few days later were equally conducive to disaster for the West. He said, the United States can intervene in Indochina only through the United Nations. It was the Red Bloc's green light. Bidalt wanted peace, but not at any price. His reproach to the United States was not for having refused intervention but for letting the belligerent Reds, a wavering Eden, and Bidalt's political enemies in France, know that he could expect no support from America, and this at the moment when he was fighting with his back to the wall. A few days later the Lanial government, in which Bidalt was Minister of Foreign Affairs, fell, to be followed by the government of Pierre Mendes France, the Socialist. It was Premier Mendes France who terminated the long drawn out conference at Geneva giving Ho Chi Minh the area of Vietnam north of the 17th parallel. Bao Dai was given the area to the south and a promise of a referendum in 1956 for the reunification of the country. As the date for that referendum approached, the American press, essentially pro Mendes France but anti French, see for example the article by Joseph Buttinger in the special issue of the new leader dated June 27, 1955, reproached France for having sold out Vietnam at Geneva. Ignored was the fact that the final terms of the Geneva Accord of 1954 were the work of Mendes France and of him alone and were terms that had much to do with France's repudiation of Mendes France 18 months later. Mendes France's toppling of the Lanial government on June 18 was accomplished by a cunning combination of anti-Americanism and leftist demagoguery, he charged that Monsieur Bidault had tried to bring about an American intervention that would have started another world war. On assuming the premiership his first act was to quash an indictment against the heavily commenced infiltrated observer to Earth for leaking military information to the Viet Minh. Outstanding on the observer to Earth's editorial staff was Daniel Guerin, who later organized the anti-fascist committees within the French army for the purpose of filing and pushing reports made by communist trained draftees against their officers.
Garin wrote the book The Popular Front, such was Pierre Mendes France, the socialist whose lectures were to become the gospel on European affairs at America's Brandeis University. When the French Jute raided Guerin's Paris apartment early one morning in the winter of 1956, a Brandeis University professor was there. America's replacement of France in Southeast Asia dates officially from Mendes France's granting of complete independence in 1954 to the French Union, which is roughly parallel to the British Commonwealth. It was no secret that international forces described as liberal had worked ceaselessly toward the destruction of France's empire since the early years of World War II. A significant paragraph in General Eisenhower's crusade in Europe deals with President Roosevelt's trip to Egypt prior to the invasion of Europe. I complained that the President showed no interest in the problems confronting Operation Overlord, the invasion of Europe, his mind being entirely occupied with plans for France's colonies and his determination that they should not return to their pre-war status. There were no few men around the President, from State Department's information section to his closest advisers, to feed constantly that determination and to advance to key positions Americans who would further such a policy. Whether the policy favored the advancement of communism by chance or was designed to that end is something no congressional committee is ever likely to make clear. Our first Indochina policy was only a general one existing in the minds of a few well-placed men. It lasted from 1940 to the end of World War II and aimed at the elimination of French influence. There was no opposition to it, for the policy was never openly declared. It was the period of great friendship with Russia and an almost childish dream of a Jean Jacques Rousseau post-war world wherein, by simply driving out the colonialists, the little people of Africa and Asia would revert to their original, good, and peaceful states. The second American policy in Indochina lasted from 1945 to a date that is hard to establish because it did not end abruptly, it embarrassedly tiptoed out. We might set it as 1951. It was a continuation and natural development of the first and marked the period of our active support of Ho Chi Minh. Ho, educated in Moscow's Orient University had been sent to China in 1925 with Borodin, the agent charged with the communization of China. Ho was arrested in Hong Kong in 1931 and was later expelled as head of the Bureau of the Third International, which was entrusted with the preparation of communist revolutions in Southeast Asia. After VJ Day French resistance groups whose members had risked their lives to aid Americans and rescue downed pilots in Indochina against the explicit orders of the British, under whose command they were, were pushed aside with a hasty sowing of freedom medals, and overnight American political and military support was thrown behind Ho Chi Minh. Any American who warned against the possible results of such a policy, or who expressed forebodings based on long Far East experience and knowledge of the personalities we were using and supporting, was ruthlessly dropped if an American employer and blacklisted if he were not, on charges that he was working against America. As those attempting to warn America saw it, the picture looked something like this. Ho Chi Minh had returned to Indochina after VJ Day, August 15, 1945, with an elastic timetable but two inflexible goals. First, he was to beguile us into helping him drive out the French. With Indochina in his hands the communization of Southeast Asia would be simple. In 1941 the Chinese Britain, looking ahead to the post-war period when France would again be a commercial rival, wished to prevent France from having any claim to American gratitude. Franco-American cooperation in the Far East could be an obstacle to British policies and commerce. Southern Commander, Chang Fa Kwai had recognized Ho Chi Minh as head of a government in exile in Luchao, on Chinese soil, where Ho had taken refuge. Chang Fa Kwai had his eyes on the rich provinces of Kwangzai, Yunnan and Kwangtung as possible fiefs for himself. He counted on Ho to drive out the French after American arms had eliminated the Japanese, then he would suppress Ho and spread a sort of warlord control southward over Tonkin. As we shall see later, on behalf of the U.S., 
General George C. Marshall was willing to agree to this if the Chinese nationalist government at Nanking would accept Mao and Chu. Within three years of its founding, Ho's shadow government in Luchao was enjoying full diplomatic status and receiving a stream of American arms. In return for this, OSS agents were being fed reports of prodigious feats against the Japanese. Actually there was only one instance on record of any friction between the Viet Minh and the Japanese, an incident in an isolated village where eight Japanese were killed. After VJ Day it was to Ho and his American equipped forces that the Japanese surrendered more arms, well aware of the trouble it would cause Japan's enemies, the Americans and the Chinese and the French. Ho made good use of his Mosca training. Conscious of the importance of his first impression on the Allied missions entering Indochina, he held his troops in check. They were well disciplined, spreading out in an orderly manner while political agents worked on Vietnamese nationalists and Western allies alike. Vietnamese anti-communists were assured by her that everything would be all right. He had the Americans behind him and would form a national government in which all parties would be represented as soon as the French were ousted. But, he insisted to the Vietnamese, it is important that you recognize me as the leader of the United Nationalist Front. I have to play down your importance because the Americans are not satisfied with the passive role you played in the war against the Japanese. If you start asserting yourselves and challenging my authority, the Americans will support the French. It is hardly likely that all of the Americans taken in by Ho's agents were loyal, well-meaning dupes. Mr. Harold R. Isaacs, the Newsweek correspondent whose articles of that period glorified Ho as a native George Washington, could not have been completely fooled. Mr. Isaacs had been a journalist in Shanghai in 1931 and 1932 at the time when Ho was expelled from Hong Kong for his revolutionary work as head of the Southeast Asia Bureau of the Communist Third International. That was the Shanghai period of American communist Eugene Dennis and the master German communist spy, Richard Sorge. Mr. George Sheldon the OSS officer who returned to Saigon to continue his support of Ho Kaiman from a desk in the U.S. Embassy, must have worked with his eyes open, both as an American vice consul then and later as an international cooperation administration official in Saigon. Lug An, the Vietnamese boy who worked as General Philip Gallagher's interpreter and who, after VJ Day, hitchhiked to ride to Shanghai in the general's plane to stir up a revolt of Annamite troops in the French garrison, could never deny his culpability if confronted with the details of his machinations of that period. Down and out in Paris in 1956, Legs Yuan offered a report of his nine years in the employ of American intelligence to both the Russians and the British. The French already had it. In this detailed account, Legs Yuan named his American contacts, particularly blaming Major Batty and Professor Knapp, both OSS officers, for tricking him into being a spy for the Americans, then dropping him without money after nine years of what Legs Yuan termed loyal services. This Legs Yuan report has particular interest. He told how, when it came time for the Americans to leave Indochina they took him to Bangkok with them because the French would kill him if he stayed behind. He stated that at the request of the Americans he helped organize the Vietnam American Friendship Association, behind which Ho Chi Minh's supporters operated from Bangkok, Thailand. Lag Xuan continued that work. In Bangkok he was supplied with a camera and a press card from Siam Rat News Agency as a blind and was then sent on missions to Hamburg, Geneva and Spain. This, it must be borne in mind, was during the period when American liberals were working to undermine the Franco government. In mid-1959 Legs Yuan was reported to be employed again by the American army, giving aptitude tests in Paris. Whatever part Legs Yuan played in organizing the Friendship Association mentioned, there is evidence of extremely efficient communist direction behind the apparently guileless natives and cause-hungry Americans who were taken in by it. The Friendship Association spread to America, and was incorporated in the state of New York as a non-profit organization. 
on June 28, 1946, with headquarters at 796 9th Avenue, New York City, in an apartment rented by one Andre Pham. Little investigation was done about Pham in our post-war enthusiasm for oppressed peoples. In 1944 Paul Dowoshk of 256 West 52 Street posted a $500 bond for Mr. Pham and Nathan Sinkman acted as his attorney. That was all that was known. Pham's group published a propaganda organ known as the Vietnamese Bulletin, which was printed by Fred Lurch on West 52 Street. The line of communications between Pham and his principals ran through a Vietnam center at 543 Silam Road. Bangkok, a Vietnamese on Pacific Avenue in San Francisco, and the Indian Consul General in Saigon. Among the members and sympathizers of the association we find such names as Robert Dilson, editor of the Socialist Call and lawyer for the Workers' Defense League, Richard J. Walsh, Harold R. Isaacs, Norman Thomas, Virginia T. Adloff, Anthony Vangeli, Clara Damon, Pearl Buck, J. J. Singh. Roger Baldwin of American Civil Liberties Union, and Mr. George Sheldon, the OSS officer who returned to Saigon as an American vice consul and whose report on Indochina appeared in the Far Eastern Survey, of the Institute of Pacific Relations, on December 18, 1946. Miss Maud Russell, connected with a group describing itself as for a democratic Far Eastern policy, was on the subscription list of FAM's bulletin. The full list of those connected with our 1946 meddling, which was as misguided as our 1954 meddling with the internal politics of this region, would make an interesting history, as would the list of sympathizers attending the Vietnam Friendship Organization's dinner at New York's Hotel McAlpin in 1948, and the speeches these sympathizers made. The Korean War brought to the American in the street, and at a painful price sudden realization of where he was being taken. Without a ripple the Vietnam American Friendship Association faded from sight, its activators sliding unobtrusively into other fronts, entrenching themselves in the overlapping folds of our ponderous and intriguing aid agencies, or in the overstaffed ranks of our foreign service and intelligence agencies. Robert Dilson was to turn up a decade later as legal counsel for the American Committee on Africa, the chaotic continent where the officials responsible for our debacle in Indochina were, by coincidence or otherwise, appearing as consuls and ambassadors. Disillusionment with Ho Chi Minh was never openly admitted. The Ho camp in America simply folded its tent like the Arabs and silently stole away to another camping ground. When the North Koreans started rolling southward. Overnight Indochina became a second front potentially capable of tying down communist Chinese forces who might otherwise be deployed against United Nations troops in Korea. A feverishly active third period of American policy was ushered in. Military, diplomatic, and economic missions were rushed to the embattled French, who were being pressed by the enemy America had armed in 1945 and supported ever since. But our officials made no pretense of pointing out the communist menace to the young Vietnamese intellectuals they had told to refuse all cooperation with the French until given complete and immediate independence. MacArthur fought communism, but colonialism was the enemy our State Department was fighting. A firm, centralized French command was necessary to the prosecution of the war, but we merely went through the motions of supporting it. Policy number three was, superficially at least, a bold face from policies 1 and 2, but General Philip Gallagher was never approached for having broadcast over Ho Chi Minh's radio in 1946. He was transferred to, of all places, Orleans, France. It must also be remembered that the Americans who had been thrown out of government service for opposing policy number 2, and whom time had proved right, were never taken off the blacklist. They were never given another government job. But the men who had supported Ho Chi Minh and ousted every loyal American counseling against it, remained where they were. They were the ones charged with implementing the new policy, which was in direct contradiction to everything they had worked tirelessly and ruthlessly to achieve.
it was to them that any military and political missions charged with cooperation with the French were sent for guidance and expert advice. How enthusiastically the old team followed their new orders is open to question. A parallel fact is worth noting. Loud and vociferous complaints rose from the American left against this third policy of support for the French against Ho Chi Minh. A group of professors, an Austrian socialist leader and naturalized American, a State Department specialist on Indochina who had never lived there, the political tacticians of labor, and muddled thinkers by the score opposed our official policy in speech and print. None was accused of working against America, or otherwise threatened. The extent to which official sabotage of policy number no. three and protection of its detractors extended may be deduced from a conversation Monsieur Jean Leton, the French Minister for Overseas Affairs, had with an official high in our government, on one of Monsieur Leton's trips to Washington. Said the official, whose name Monsieur Leton would not divulge in mid 1959 because the man was still in our government. I will not hide the fact from you that I and an important number of my colleagues desire to see a Ho Chi Minh victory in Indochina and we will do all in our power to achieve that end. Policy number three continued until the end of the Korean War. America was then no longer involved in Far East fighting. The Korean settlement in 1953 removed all but theoretical American interest in prolonging the war in Indochina or maintaining the French. Slowly but inevitably, from the moment a diversionary war in the South ceased to be necessary to draw red Chinese arms and manpower from the Korean front, American interest in France versus communism waned. It had a last rally on its deathbed, inspired partly by the gallant defense of Dean Bian Phu and partly by a sudden and grim public realization that a red victory might set unpredictable events into motion. But it was not enough to lead us beyond sympathy, weapons and money. The French expeditionary force did the dying. For many who survived, a grave was already being prepared in Algeria by the same men and groups who had advised and armed Ho Chi Minh in Indochina. The fourth and final phase of our policy in what had been known as Indochina was a natural consequence of policies 1, 2, and 3. It can be described as America's experiment with the cult of the personality, the picking of a man and the backing of that man against his country rather than the country against communism. General O'Daniel may be regarded as the principal military exponent of this policy. Numerous senators and State Department officials advanced it on the political level. Since the brother of the man on whom America's helps were placed and prestige risked was a labor leader in Saigon. American labor and its allies of the international socialist left reached out to practice diplomacy and a form of international politics of their own. Under this fourth period of American policy in South Vietnam, the same solid front of support appeared that had protected Ho Chi Minh in 1945 and 1946. A new propaganda front organization, the American Friends of Vietnam, sprang up where the old pro-Ho Vietnam American Friendship Association had been. A loyal American could no longer write an honest report on anything that our activists in Vietnam were doing without fear of retaliation. Reports unfavorable to the man America was backing were not judged, statement by statement, on a scale of truth or untruth. They were rejected outright and their authors threatened with trumped-up charges and loss of passports for working against America. If they were government employees they were transferred. Nowhere else in American society or politics did this organized, high-handed machine of retaliation function so ruthlessly against all criticism. The man it protected was Ngo Din Diem. Our press and certain officials complained bitterly that the Accord of March 8, 1949, which gave Vietnam a relationship to France similar to that Canada enjoys with Britain, did not grant sufficient independence. It granted enough, however, that between March and August of 1950 the personnel in the American legation rose from 7 to 100. 100 earnest liberals, each of whom, with the exception of one able minister, Donald Heath, considered himself a soldier in the war against colonialism. France that year spent $614 million, 
or 10% of the national budget to fight Ho Chi Minh, the enemy in front. No one told thinking Americans about the sabotage in the rear. Four years later the American in the street still knew nothing of the long-range planning that was going on, but the new leader, the political organ of the AFL-CIO, on February 22, 1954, four months before DM was eased into power, carried an article by David J. Dallin entitled How to Win in Indochina. American labor, reaching out into diplomatic and military spheres where it had no business, was already dictating policies that in ten short years were to bring America to the brink of a disaster as grim as Dean Bianfu. Chapter 2. Bao Dai. Bao Dai. The former emperor, reigned again in South Vietnam under the title of Chief of State when America replaced the withdrawing French. American prestige was at an all-time high, and South Vietnam was supposed to be America's showcase for democracy. Here was America's first experiment at replacing the discredited colonials of Europe and introducing a government and life generally prefaced as American way of, and held to be the ideal for all the world. Bao Dai, the son of Kai Din, Emperor of Annam, Bao Dai means guardian of greatness, ascended the throne in 1925 at the age of 12. Bao Dai was not a resolute ruler. Neither was he as bad as the press, more determined to rid the world of monarchs than to use constitutional monarchy as an ideal against communist totalitarianism, has painted him. General MacArthur had good reason for preserving the throne in Japan. That Bao Dai was irresolute is incidental. He would have passed in time. The monarchy, had it been strengthened, could have served the country in its civil war and contributed to stability. Bao Dai was charged by his detractors with having collaborated with the Japanese. He had yielded to Japanese pressure, subscribed to Japan's Greater East Asia theme and abolished the treaties with France. Those who tried to negotiate with the Japanese military from a position of weakness found it hard honestly to blame him. The Japanese of the war period conducted themselves more like savage beasts than either diplomats or soldiers. They were drunk with a power that took the combined forces of Britain and America for years to defeat. The helpless Bao Dai agreed to anything, then resisted in the only way he knew, with complete immobility. The same cannot be said for Sukuno and other leaders we have supported since. Our press, in its build-up for the kill, accused Bao Dai of having collaborated with Ho Chi Minh in the post-war period. They overlooked the fact that Ho Chi Minh was armed and supported during that period by us, the power to whom Bao Dai was expected to look for leadership. Behind Bao Dai stretched a line of nine kings, four of whom had died in exile, the others under more or less natural circumstances. The main reason for the throne's loss of power had been its inability to oppose the French victoriously. Beneath Bao Dai, in a twisting, coiling mass that the wife of an America charged affair was later to compare with a basket of eels, writhed Vietnam. The political spectrum ranged from communism to the conservatism of old Asia's mandarins from patriotism to self-interest and from idealism to plain love of intrigue. Bao Dai's life was not the sinecure it has been painted. Had as much effort been directed to strengthening Bao Dai as was employed in ruining him, and with him the monarchy, a strong Vietnam directed by a premier heading a broad-based popular government might have welded the disparate groups into a solid front against the Reds. Bao Dai could have been replaced by his son, Bao Long, under a regency headed by Bao Dai's wife the Empress, Nam Phu Wong. Given independence after the war with Ho Chi Minh, and guidance not primarily committed to the establishment of a socialist republic, the dynasty might have survived and in time regained its force. It was never given the chance. America's first direct contact with Bao Dai at the Geneva Conference of 1954 was also America's first indication of what we intended to do if anything, in Indochina. Mr. Dulles had flown back to Washington. The conference was deadlocked. It was Sunday afternoon, the end of April. General Biddle Smith entered a hired Cadillac bearing license plate VD-14724. With the State Department eagle flying from the radio antennae, 
he drove to the hotel in a Vien where Bao Dai and his cousin, Prince Buulak, the premier, were staying. The, the three men talked for an hour and fifteen minutes. The essence of what General Bidil Smith had to say was this, I do not believe that you and the French can get an honorable armistice out of the communists. They do not want to share the country, and neither do you. You must continue the war and, at the same time, continue to negotiate peace. Eisenhower cannot intervene directly, as in Korea, for internal political reasons. He was specifically elected on the platform of GI return from Korea, he cannot turn around now and send them to Indochina. But we can give you the strong Vietnamese army you lack. We will train your army. You will have your own generals and general staff. Put pressure on the French to let us instruct your new divisions, that is the limit of our intervention. No fault can be found with the general's proposition. It sounded straightforward and sensible. At the time a satisfactory negotiated peace seemed unlikely. Continued resistance, if it was backed by American support and encouragement, was certainly advisable, considering the state copyright F. Ho Kiman's army after Dean Bian Phu. Yet for all of Bidil Smith's apparent sincerity, Bao Dai must have had some second thoughts. The man is no fool. At times, in a pinch, he has shown rare intelligence, and those tight spots in which only good judgment saved his life gave him every reason for being cynical. He showed no resentment when General Bidil Smith told him that Mr. Dulles had been called home suddenly, otherwise he would have come in person. It is a safe guess, however, that a year later, when told that Mr. Dulles had boasted that he had never contacted Bao Dai or spoken to him in person, Bao Dai was not surprised. He had a memory. What of this emperor whom the entire American press tore to shreds in the spring of 1955? Cartoonists sneered at him and men supposed to be supplying news, tore at him with a savagery never applied to Stalin. No one attempted to tell the story of the foreign educated young son of heaven who returned to his country at the age of 18 thinking he was going to reign and who learned that his job was to sign papers prepared by petty civil servants whom he despised. And to whom could he explain his position? Accordingly he drew more and more into himself. His energy he released by hunting tigers. The young liberals who knew nothing of his problems accused him of betraying his country, but did nothing to help him to strengthen it. Then came the merciless years under the Japanese the constant pressure to join Japan's Greater East Asia movement and declare war on the West. Bao Dai navigated the shoals till the morning in March of 1945 when the Japanese decided to exterminate the French. Bao Dai knew nothing about it. He was in the jungle, tracking elephants, when a Japanese regiment suddenly surrounded him. A Japanese general handed him a paper which he was summarily told to sign if he wanted to live. The emperor did what he had done all his life. His policy was to ride the tide and see what could be done later. So he affixed his seal to the paper, dispossessing the French and proclaiming independence. He knew the Japs were about to collapse but what he did not know was that what was to follow them would be worse. The minute the Jap grip relaxed, Ho Kiman sent him another paper to sign, accompanied by a threat. It was regarding Bao Dai's abdication. Bao Dai signed it. What else could he do? Bear in mind, Ho Chi Minh, not Bao Dai, was the post-war protégé of America's General Philip E. Gallagher, who represented the greatest power on earth, and Ho's plan was to both use Bao Dai and destroy him. So the title of Emperor was replaced by Supreme Counselor and the Son of Heaven was taken away from his wife and family and carted off to Hanoi to be paraded at communist meetings under the name of Citizen Vintui. His wife and children were held as hostages back in Nanam. Someone once wrote, a king who has fallen must see strange sights, so bitter a thing is the heart of man. Not one of the smart American journalists saxing Bao Dai ever bothered to mention the period he spent in Ho Kiman's hands as a living dead man with his life hanging by a thread. A false step, a slip of the tongue, the slightest error would have cost him his head. Everything depended on his art of dissimulation, the ability to keep smiling, 
to act contented, to go through the farce of auto-criticism and avowed repentance. Nothing was spared him, even to letting Uncle Ho embrace him in public. But General Gallagher was sitting beside Uncle Ho in his box in the opera house in Hanoi in those days. The Viet Minh carefully calculated new ways of insulting Bao Dai, even to inviting him to dinner with his former chauffeur. And Bao Dai had to profess to like it. It was a matter of living from one day to the next, but each day he felt the net closing tighter. A mistake, a gesture and he would have been put to death. Two years later Bao Dai told his cousin, at night I used to ask myself why haven't they liquidated me? Yet he knew the answer. They did not dare because of the anger of the masses. The Reds knew that the man they were degrading was still, for millions of little people, their emperor, a divine being whose death the heavens would avenge by some frightful calamity. Therefore, while the masses were being reducated, it was the game of Ho and the Tongbo, his communist committee, to go on using Bao Dai even as they discredited him. The political commissaries preached that he was nothing but a traitor who must be destroyed with all the superstitions surrounding him. Strangely enough, in almost identical words. David Cernbrun, of Columbia Broadcasting System, wrote in Collier's magazine of September 30, 1955, DM must not only remove Bao Dai, but do it in such a way that he no longer has any usefulness as a symbol of Vietnamese unity. Mr. Cern Brun, with never a word about those harrowing months in the hands of the Reds, for to mention them would have knocked his thesis into a cocked hat, used the argument that if Bao Dai were not destroyed he might become a possible turncoat to the Reds. Actually there was no reason, with the unpredictable dangers ahead why any symbol of Vietnamese unity should be deliberately destroyed, much less one that Ho Chi Minh wished with all his heart to see exterminated, and this was one who, having been bitten once, would never walk into a Viet Minh trap again if he could help it. As 1945 drew to a close bow Dai knew he was living on borrowed time. The moment the emperor image was destroyed there would be no reason for maintaining citizen Vintui. Ho Chi Minh and his committee were as obsessed with the necessity of destroying their prisoner in 1945 as David Cernbrun was ten years later, but their immediate preoccupation was to break him morally as well as politically. Bao Dai's life depended on his being able to convince his captors that he was no longer capable, mentally or morally, of working against them. At the slightest manifestation of independence they would have had him shot. So dawned 1946. By this time Lu Han, the Chinese warlord from Yunnan province, was looting Indochina by virtue of the Potsdam Agreement which authorized Chiang Kai-shek to accept Japanese surrender in northern Indochina. Lu Han had always given Chiang trouble, so Chiang dangled the opportunity of looting France's colony down to the 16th parallel before his arrogant warlord, to get him out of Yunnan. While Lu Han's personal troops stripped everything in their path in Indochina like a horde of locusts, Chiang sent another general to occupy Yunnan, for such was the way of doing things in the east. Ho Chi Minh and his military commander General Jiap knew that if they killed Bao Dai, Lu Han would use it as an excuse to wipe out their red regime. Among the Tongbo the debate raged. Was it wiser to risk Bao Dai's falling into the hands of Lu Han, or would it be better to take the plunge, execute him and have done with it? While they argued, a mob trooped into the town under Lu Han's protection, crying, Long live Bao Dai. The Tongbo, the dreaded Red Council, decided that assassination was too dangerous. They moved their prisoner to a village inn. The Tonkin Delta where he was held under house arrest in a hut wondering each day whether it would be a ball in the head or poison in his food. A month passed, then Ho Chi Minh arrived, all smiles. In his pocket was an order for execution. However, he embraced Bao Dai and said, I want you to become head of the government. I will be your assistant, your number two. Then the oriental game began. Bao Dai protested that he was not worthy of the job. The honor was too great. For hours the subterfuge, the insistence on the part of Ho and the claims of abject incapacity of Bao Dai, went on. 
had he yielded the suspicions of the Tongbo would have been substantiated, he still had ambition and could, if opportunity presented, be tempted to head a movement, in which case he should be shot on the spot. By lulling Ho's suspicions, Bao Dai got back to Hanoi. The Ho and Jiap were having their troubles with the Chinese. The insatiable Lu Han was demanding more and more money. How was Lu Han to know that where he was going his rapacity was to avail him nothing? When the time came, it was not to Yunnan that he was to return, loaded with treasure. Chiang piled Lu Han and his army on boats and shipped them to Manchuria, where Mao Zedong and Chuan Lei exterminated all but Lu Han and his personal guard. But that was yet to come. Wealth, not war against communism, was Lu Han's prime consideration, in his ignorance of the fact that communism would soon destroy him. Ho Kaiman and his counselors were desperate and here they made their big mistake. They sent Bao Dai to bargain with Yunnan's insatiable warlord. It was the first chance that presented itself for a getaway and Bao Dai grabbed it. Lu Han put him on an American plane bound for Nanking. No sooner was Bao Dai installed in Nanking in 1946, than General Marshall, the Tatok Chiang Kai shek into taking the Reds into his government, went to see him. Marshall offered Bao Dai big things, but his conditions were exorbitant. The final clause, in essence, was, do not have too many ambitions. Vietnam is only an artificial country. Tonkin is really a meridional province of China and must go back to her. Marshall was having trouble getting Chiang to accept Mao Zedong and Chuan Lei and their communist hordes. To make the pill easier to swallow he had conceived the idea of offering Chiang Tonkin as a sweetener, which in turn entailed offering Bao Dai something in return for signing a paper dismembering his country, while his signature was still worth something. This time Bao Dai refused. Certain Americans with interests at stake in Marshall's game never forgave him. That was when Bao Dai went to Hong Kong. Everyone abandoned him. Had it not been for some of his friends in the Bank of Indochina he would have had nothing. The year 1946 drew to a close. For Bao Dai the future looked black. However, a reaction was setting in among the humble toilers in the jungle villages and rice paddies. Not content with levying taxes for the war against the French, the Viet Minh had set out to destroy everything that pertained to their country's past civilization. Ho's class war and the terror that accompanied it were spread to the smallest hamlet. Notables and the rich were wiped out mercilessly, with the dregs of the village doing the executing. All of the laws of religion and tradition were profaned. The young insulted the old, sons turned against their fathers, youngsters denounced their families. Who could doubt that these sacrileges were the cause of all their calamities? Anam's ancient hierarchy rose from village notable to emperor, but within each level all men observed with respect the consideration due to their ancestors, to the old, to heaven and to the emperor. In this system it was the emperor who served as intermediary between the deities and man. Each year in his palace in Hue he traced the first furrow, that the harvest might be bountiful in his land. The villagers had had enough of murder and longed for the old days. Monsieur Leon Pignan was French High Commissioner in Indochina at the time. Pignan watched the fence straddling, the collaboration and profiteering of the Vietnamese in the cities and looked for a way to bring Vietnam into the war to save herself. To him, the masses of the country were the answer. He started, cautiously at first, then insistently, on his plan to bring back Bao Dai. The former emperor who was then in Hong Kong and forsaken by everybody, overnight became sought after. He found himself with a court. Yet, broke as he was, he was not going to go back merely to sign papers. If there was a chance of saving the country, it depended on his convincing his people that he was not a puppet. And he had no illusions. He knew that the ever-increasing weight of Red China would eventually burst through like a flood. He also knew the Viet Minh and their methods. It was in 1947 that the first French emissary, Monsieur Ch, was dispatched to Hong Kong to negotiate terms for Bao Dai's return, and with that trip the international intrigues began. 
Britain entered into the game, anti-communist. In principle but still happy if they could torpedo anything planned by the French. Vietnamese appeared from nowhere to surround the exile they had abandoned. Like flies attracted to a bowl of sugar, they swarmed back and swore fidelity. Among them was Bao Dai's archenemy, Ngodin Diem, but since Diem was the son of Ngodin Ka, the nine button Mandarin who had served Bao Dai's father, Bao Dai took him in. It is the opinion of most Americans who consider themselves well informed on Vietnamese affairs that Ngodin Diem entered into our calculations with his arrival in America in 1951. And it is worth remarking that nowhere in the numerous biographical sketches published by Time magazine is DM's 1947 period in Hong Kong with Bao Dai ever mentioned. Actually, throughout the long negotiations in Hong Kong, DM was the agent of questionable Americans already envisaging their own game in Indochina. Bao Dai hated DM but he feared him. He knew that for 20 years DM had never concealed his hatred of the throne. But the club DM held over Bao Dai in Hong Kong was his claim to have an in with the Americans. Everything supported DM's claims. Each morning he went to the American consulate. That he was received, trusted, even courted was evident from the statements, notes, and suggestions he brought back. With Bao Dai's advice originating in the American consulate on those morning visits in conversations between agents who will probably remain faceless and a DM who became more anti French with each passing day, Monsieur Pignan's emissary was forced to bid higher and higher. Eventually, Ch reported to his chief in Saigon that the Hong Kong branch of the team that in New York, Washington, and Bangkok supported Ho Chi Minh was sabotaging there. His and Pignan's plan to mobilize the country behind the traditional emperor. For almost two years the fruitless dickering with Bao Dai dragged on, blocked by Ngo Din Diem's arguments against Bao Dai's return. Don't accept their terms. You eleven dishonor yourself forever. Don't go back until they give you complete independence was the theme. Meanwhile Ho Kai Min advanced. At last Bao Dai was told to make his choice with France or with Ngodin Diem and his friends. Bao Dai made his decision. There was a terrible last scene between him and Diem, and Bao Dai took off for Paris to make final arrangements for the desperate gamble. The agreement with France was signed on March 8, 1949. It granted immediate limited independence within the French Union with a pledge of increasing independence ahead. Britain's relationship with her former colonies within the Commonwealth is a fair comparison. Bao Dai would have his own cabinet and army and a free hand in internal affairs. Foreign policy would coincide with that of France. The French would maintain bases, special courts for French citizens and special consideration for French advisers and the French language, in reality little more than America enjoys in Korea. Bao Dai's choice, however, was to cost him dearly. It meant a few more years of grace for America's prestige throughout the East, but in the end Ngodin Diem and the foreign supporters, thwarted with him when the down and out emperor opted for the French, were to have their revenge, a revenge for which the American taxpayer and the growing boys destined to die in the score settling would ultimately pay. It was to Dalat, the scene of so many tiger hunts as a boy, that Bao Dai returned in his chartered Dakota, on April 27, 1949. His reason for refusing to go to Saigon was that the French representative and military commander still occupied Noradam Palace, which in the public mind was associated with the retention of power. The beautiful Empress Nam Phuong remained in France, where she had been transported by the French with her two sons and three daughters, while her husband, even if he did not win the war, succeeded in restoring their fortunes. The war dragged on to its close. The French graves mounted while politicians reasoned, after the manner of politicians everywhere, that a slow drain would be accepted. Some 177,000 soldiers had been lost under the tricolor by the time Pierre Mendes France put over on his countrymen the vast hoax that he had delivered an ultimatum to the Reds and that their signature to the treaty by which he abandoned half of Vietnam was a national triumph. Had Bao Dai yielded in 1946 to George Marshall, 
North Vietnam would have been communized eight years earlier. The men who pressed for that signature triumphed in the end, and the French soldiers who fought to thwart them died in vain. It was Bao Dai's fate to be forever a pawn, if not in the game of big power politics then the pawn of his ambitious countrymen who sought to prove to the young revolutionaries of the capital that they were not servile courtiers by vying among themselves to see who could be most discourteous to their emperor. A few days later they would return separately to profess undying devotion and apologize privately for their words they had spoken in public. All this Bao Dai bore without a word. He watched the French fade out and the team on whom he had turned his back in 1949 in Hong Kong close in, with Ngo Din Diem in the forefront. Their day had come. Wearily Bao Dai signed another paper. Chapter 3 NGO Din Diem. It was from an office in New York in 1954 that Monsieur Pignan, the French delegate to the United Nations who had been France's High Commissioner to Indochina, watched the drama unfold. He had no doubt as to the course it would take. He knew too well the dramatis personae, the motivations, the weaknesses and all the pressures at play to have any illusions. With the failure of his Baudai experiment, an experiment sabotaged as much by the French section of the International Socialist Party as by America, Monsieur Pignan was relegated to the French delegation to United Nations. Baudai had been unyielding in his refusal to go to Saigon as long as the French occupied Noradam Palace, and the various Vietnamese factions and factions within factions were in the end obstructionist. Some groups tried to advance their interests by flattering Baudai, others courted the pro Ho Chi and pro American left by insulting him. French officials haggled over every line in their agreement and the mass of Vietnamese waited to see which way things were going to turn. Bao Dai's reaction, as always, was to draw into himself. He was too weak to command, too proud to argue his case, and, looking at the forces around him, he undoubtedly concluded that there was no one to whom it was worth bothering to explain. In the end he went back to Cannes and bought a twelve-room house, referred to for reasons of dignity as the Chateau de Thoronc. On the battlefield the French setbacks continued, which provided occasion for the crusaders against colonialism to fight for their cure-all. Few Americans had ever seen a Vietnamese, but all were convinced that, given independence, the fencesitors in Vietnam would flock en masse to the recruiting office. Thousands of Vietnamese clamored for visas to America. Each had his reason, some, who had transferred black market and piaster exchange fortunes to Hong Kong, wanted to get out while the getting was good, others saw political futures in currying favor with the Americans. But without influence an American visa was hard to get. D.M., the inside man of the consulate team in Hong Kong in 1949, had no trouble. Thus in 1951 we find him living in Mary Knoll Jr. Seminary in Lakewood, New Jersey, from which address he became, as Raymond Cartier expressed it, the Lion of the Anti-Colonialists in Washington and the Catholic Cardinal of the New York Diocese, while his brother operated through his own labor union in Saigon and was slipping his men into international labor organizations. Every line of the sugary biography presented as news by time of April 4, 1955, should be read and analyzed by those who paid to get facts during the period of our infatuation with D.M. but instead were given propaganda on which to form their opinions. Though D.M. resided in the seminary in Lakewood from 1951 to 1953, Time noted that he often went down to Washington to buttonhole State Department men and congressmen and urged them not to support French colonialism. The French may be fighting communists, D.M. argued, but they are also fighting the people. A stupid line when one stops to analyze it, and certainly not one to bear weight with the parents and wives of American boys for whom the honor of being killed by those same communists was thus reserved for ten years later. But time never went into this, and the men buttonholed in State Department apparently never questioned such reasoning. According to Senator Mike Mansfield's own article in Harper's Magazine of January 1956, 
he and Supreme Court Justice William Douglas were taken in by DM at a luncheon in Washington and thereafter supported his game, the object of which was DM's establishment as ruler of Vietnam. Senators, congressmen, labor leaders exercising political pressure, and powerful news organs, were converted to the idea that America must also fence it, like the able-bodied Vietnamese, and not help the French. Because though they may be fighting the communists they are also fighting the people. As a result enough pressure was created that no two-hour air strike came from our fifth fleet to shatter the Viet Minh military machine after they had sacrificed first their elite and then their reserves in frontal attacks against Dean Bian Phu for a spectacular victory to exploit at the conference in Geneva. What was never spread out before the congressmen applying rubber stamps to our policy, or before the idealistic public. Approving it was the sinuous route of oriental intrigue and the use of ruse upon ruse by the Ngodin brother team. To the Mandarin believing power his due, nothing one does to achieve this power is dishonest. For honest DM to write letters to senators and congressmen for no other reason than to get a courteous reply for new to display before hesitant Vietnamese in Saigon as irrefutable proof of DM popularity and support in Washington, was only natural. The Vietnamese capacity for cunning, dissimulation and outright deception is something the inexperienced American can hardly conceive. It is no monopoly of the Viet Minh, or the Viet Cong, as they now call themselves, a contraction of Viet Cong Sang, meaning Vietnam Communists. Both sides consider it good politics. While Nu practiced his dupery in Saigon, DM practiced his in Washington. An example, Monsieur Jean Leton flew into the capital as French Minister for Overseas Affairs to seek help in the war against Ho Chi Minh. DM requested an appointment. Monsieur Leton knew him, in fact, knew all his family. He considered Brother Coy, the one killed by the Communists, the most intelligent of the Ngodins. DM at the time was pushing his campaign against helping the French. Nevertheless, he went to Leton's hotel stayed for an hour, discussed nothing of any importance, and left. That evening the word was circulated by DM's supporters, no important Frenchman comes to Washington without asking to see DM. Monsieur Leton called him in to ask his advice this afternoon. Thus the myth that there is no one else was planted, nurtured and reared to mighty oak proportions in the American mind. Nu's tactics were identical with Ho Chi Minh's in 1946. Nu demanded temporary solidarity of the distrustful southerners, saying, if the Americans are convinced that you all want my brother they will put him in. And after we kick out the French you can have elections. If you don't get behind my brother, he threatened, they, the Americans, will support the French. Nu drew the correspondent for the biggest afternoon paper in Paris into the DM game by omitting the line about kicking out the French and emphasizing the promise that with their manners premier the Americans would shoulder the burden of the war. One of the first things DM did on assuming power was to expel said journalist, Monsieur Lucien Baudard, from the country. So it went. Honest DM, he who never hesitated to use. Every trick in the book to deceive or corrupt others when it was to his advantage, won his nomination to the premiership of South Vietnam not in Vietnam but in America. When he came up against newsmen during his Washington campaign his obtuseness was ascribed to lack of familiarity with the language. The fluctuations between wooden silence, complete lack of articulateness when asked about his program and a torrent of abuse laying all his country's ills at the door of the colonialists, even these were turned to DM's advantage. If he had no answer to questions about his political plans he lowered his eyes and protested that his only desire was to be in the church, that he could never be a politician because of his inability to compromise with evil. Neither he nor the journalists who quoted this drivel ever referred to those years in America as other than exile. The inference was that he had fled for his life under threat of a summary trial at which no attorney would dare defend him, in sum, the fate so many anti-communist Vietnamese were to suffer at a later date under him and his brother, sentenced to death or long prison terms in absentia, and their property confiscated. 
Over and over it was repeated that DM had refused to accept a ministerial post since 1932 because his country was not free. No attempt to help Baudi attain that freedom was ever made by Ngod and DM. And no one, apparently, wondered why this refusal should be such a glorious tribute to DM or shameful thing for Baudi. From the start the deception of the American people was inexcusable. The truth of the matter was that no competent psychiatrist reading the gushing biography in time of April 4, 1955, would have cleared DM for an executive job in any organization. Touching on the atmosphere of austerity in the conservative surroundings of his boyhood, Time wrote that he prayed a couple of hours every day, got up at 5 a.m. to study, exploding into tantrums if interrupted by his brothers or sisters. As dictator of a country, his monumental rages and outbursts, if interrupted or crossed, were to bring forth more than invectives. He may erupt into sudden violence, the time biography continued. Considering someone he dislikes, he will sometimes spit across the room and snarl dirty type. From the office of the French UN delegation in New York, Monsieur Pignan watched developments with the weary resignation of a man frustrated and disgusted, but from the standpoint of historian philosopher still interested in the story, every inside detail of which he knew like a book. He regarded D.M. as he was, a man who took refuge behind a blank silence or a burst of indiscriminate accusations whenever he was confronted by unpleasant facts. Pignan watched as those hawking this stubborn man with an aramander and mind reached further and further for superlatives with which to describe him, even to the point of fabricating a heroic resistance record against the Japanese. Monsieur Pignan could thumb back through files giving dates and details General Navarre, in his book Lag Edlando Chine, told of Admiral de Coup issuing an order for DM's arrest as a Japanese collaborator, whereupon DM took refuge in the home of a Japanese named Komatsu, a fact which permitted Komatsu to return to Saigon two years after DM's rise to power and embark on a mission for DM to negotiate with Ho Chi Minh in North Vietnam. Undoubtedly the American public would have risen in indignation had they been told about these negotiations. Monsieur Pignan also noticed that when D.M. left America in 1953 it was not to go back to his country where he was needed, but to go instead to Belgium, seat of the all-powerful International Confederation of Free Trade Unions in whose councils his labor leader brother was so powerful. From Belgium he went to Paris, and the road inevitably led to the twelve-roomed chateau in Cannes. It was mid-June of 1954. The strange little man without warmth, without humor, stood before the former emperor who was still addressed as Vorta Majestor Sire, though officially then he was chief of state. Baudai knew the tempers, the strange moods, the quick changes from timidity to aggressive fury, in the obstinate ascetic turned inward upon himself by his years of isolation from human feelings. Baudai knew of the aloof disregard the man had for those who stood in his sectarian, revolutionary path. If asked to choose a premier for those perilous times, with the good of the country in mind, D.M. was the last man Baudai would have named, but he had no choice. On bended knees D.M. swore allegiance to his emperor. Baudai, after all the vicissitudes through which he had passed, took this one in his stride. He pretended to have forgotten the stormy session in Hong Kong five years before. He knew that the man before him had never been known to forgive a grudge. However, Bao Dai went through with his part, he named DM his prime minister with full powers to form a government. His last injunction was integrate the sects into a national community, unite the country that is left to us. The Empress Nam Phuong, like DM a Catholic, begged DM to save and strengthen the dynasty for her son Bao Long. Bao Dai wrote a check for a million piastres to pay for the spontaneous demonstrations that were to impress the Americans and instill enthusiasm among the Vietnamese. D.M. thanked him as he pocketed it and later penned a formal reply. Sire, if ever you find fault with my actions, you have but to speak the word and I shall step down. 1 June 26, 1954, at the age of 54, 
DM went home to take over, and America's responsibility started. Ten years later, on June 22, 1964, black headlines proclaimed the degree of our success from the newsstands of New York. Showdown in Asia, screamed the journal American. We move up a Marine division. And for nine of those ten years the journal American, along with the rest of the news media of America, told its readers we were winning. Imagine Saigon as it was when DM returned with a million piastres with which to hire a clack. Forty-three-year-old brother Nu was living in what John Osborne, of life, was to describe later as his fly-specked union headquarters. Another brother Ngo Dinthuk, 57, was a priest. Ngo Din Khan, 41, and the youngest brother, 39-year-old Ngo Din Luin, were unknowns. These were to provide the base on which DM intended to build his power. Beyond them would come the in-laws, and their in-laws, spreading downward through ever-widening rings of cousins. A French-trained general named Nguyen Van Hin, son of former Premier, Nguyen Van Tam, was chief of staff of the army. Le Van Van, the ex-pirate known as Bay Ivan when he ruled the impenetrable Bingzuin swamps where he was born, headed the Saigon police. A colorful character, this Le Van Van. Time told its readers that he bought the police, from Bao Dai, for a million dollars, a statement which was no more true than most of the reports given the American public. The truth of the matter was that Bay Ivan had proved himself able to beat the communists at their own game, and the communists, when he was appointed police chief, were the capital's number one problem, as we shall see later. There is no doubt that self-interest was behind his courting of Bao Dai to the point of getting himself named chief of police, but he rose almost to nobility when the big test came. Aside from the police force, he maintained a private army, called the Bingzuin after the swamp which had been his fief. Colon. The Chinese city beyond the Wai Bridge connecting it with Saigon, was the capital's vice center and Le Van Vin's monopoly. But as Monsieur Litty, first president of the Saigon Court of Appeals, was to admit, there was no law against gambling, opium and prostitution in his country. Colin supported the army of the Bingzuin, and the Bingzuin were the terror of the Reds. And after Le Van Vin took over the police, I never had cause to reproach him. Then there were the two sects. The Cao Dai, numbering almost three million adepts, was ruled by Pope Pham Kong Tak, from his papal see in Tai Nin. The Cao Dai also had an army capable of mobilizing, in a pinch, some 25,000 men. And after the Cao Dai came the Ho Hao, with their claim to two million followers, a private army, and the passive support of some 400,000 Cambodians in the area between Kuntho and Long Xuyin. General Hin would have to be removed and replaced by a man loyal to the family if the power of the Ngodins was to be firmly established. As we shall see, Brother Nu considered himself the theoretician of the family, the driving force responsible for his brother's accession to power, and as such he went about solving the problem of consolidating their position. Once firmly established they would take over the army. Later they would crush Levanvan, the police, the Bingzuin and the sects, and after that there would be no protective force between the Ngodins and the people. Brother Nu had married into the Tran Van family. While the ascetic DM remained isolated behind his presidential palace doors, Nu and his father-in-law, Tran Van Kuong, during the days of the Japanese occupation one of Bao Dai's ministers, set to erecting something that would satisfy the Americans by having the appearance of a government. But the real director of the project was Madame Kiwong, Gnu's mother-in-law. The wife is often the true head of the family in Vietnam. Whatever appearance of power she may leave her husband in public, she is capable of terrifying him at home. She may appear to be frail in her diaphanous robes, but inwardly she is a human dynamo and her opacity is boundless. If she climbs upward beyond the family and into public affairs, out of her mind emerges the thread from which the web is woven to make fast each new gain. As the Ngodins, and in their wake the Tranvans, moved upward, Madame Kuong spread an unbelievable web of palace intrigue that was later morally to bankrupt America in the eyes of the world.
From her hands this web was to pass to her daughter. The one question no one asked was, how did the man on whose coat tails this family rode up would ever get his appointment? The Austrian socialist leader, naturalized American Mr. Joseph Buttinger, of whom the reader will learn much more in this history, wrote in the new leader of June 27, 1955, in the hour of military and political catastrophe, the French remembered Godin D.M. The statement is misleading. What Mr. Buttinger means by the French is the French socialists. No French leader to the right of Mendes France's extreme left position and France's American influenced labor leaders had or would have approved DM's appointment. Yet it was the falling Daniel government that as one of its last official acts did the actual sponsoring. The pressure must have been terrific. By what authority, democratic process or pressure, was DM rather than some recognized leader forced upon the Emperor Baudai and the country? Senator Mike Mansfield, until the title became embarrassing, was proud of being referred to as DM's godfather. Colonel Edward Lansdale, in a paper written for Michigan State University, which happily for the Colonel the Pentagon refused to permit to be published, wrote, There has been much nonsense and romance written about the appointment of Ngodin DM as President to Council in 1954. Allegedly, this appointment was engineered by you. S. Officials. The truth is that none of the Americans in position of decision, either in Washington or Saigon, knew DM. MSU submitted this Lansdale paper to this author for comment. So who did know him? Mr. Ngo Kai Min, a counselor of the French Union, told this author, Bill Gibson and David Bain were at the Vietnam desk in the American Embassy in Paris in 1954. Gibson went to Cannes twice to ask Baudai to appoint DM Premier. Baudai did not want to do so. He stalled for time. Monsieur Lee Toom was by then Minister of the Associated States, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. Lanyal was still Premier and Monsieur Baudalt was Foreign Minister. Baudai called for help and Monsieur Lee Toom was sent down to see him. To Lee Toom Baudai said, The Americans want DM. What shall I do? You are independent now, it is up to you, Monsieur Lee Toom replied. Baudai then decided against DM, but the American embassy put pressure on the French Foreign Office, saying, You have lost half of Indochina. We have put too much money and arms in that to write off the other half. If you cannot save it, quit obstructing us and support DM. So Baudai told Lee Toom to go back and tell Baudai to sign the appointment. The Foreign Office informed the publisher of Paris' largest afternoon paper, France Sawyer, that Washington had requested both France and Baudai to turn the Vietnamese government over to Ngo Dinh Diem at the beginning of the 1954 Geneva Conference. Jean Latagai, one of the leading French authorities on Southeast Asia, states that at America's request General Lili, the French commander in Indochina, told Baudai he should turn the government over to Ngodin DM. In late April 1956, French Foreign Minister Christian Pine in an after-dinner speech told his listeners that Ngodin DM was made Premier of South Vietnam shortly after the Geneva Conference began in 1954. This appointment followed an agreement between Paris and Washington in which Washington demanded DM's appointment as a prerequisite to the continuation of American aid. This led Mr. Nguyen the true Ayn, a former municipal councillor from Hanoi, to send open letters to President Eisenhower and President Cote in which he said, Thank you, Mr. Bina, for your frankness which throws light on the drama of South Vietnam. The world and our country have wondered how we got Ngodin DM as Premier. We now know that it was not, as his partisans say, because of his integrity and popularity but because of the favor he was able to solicit from France and America. Now that we have it from an official source that these two Occidental powers got together outside of our country one fine day in 1954 and imposed on us a chief and government that suited them, Mr. Truein continued, will the same two governments take him away and refrain from meddling in Vietnamese politics in the future? Monsieur Mark Jackie, Minister of the Associated States under the Lanial government, 
was approached by a friend of DMS named Tun that can with a request for support. Monsieur Jacquet mentioned the meeting to Baudai, who snorted, he, DM, wouldn't last three weeks. At that time Baudai intended to appoint his chief of cabinet, Nguyenda, as premier to succeed his cousin, Prince Buulak. A short time later in the spring of 1954 Monsieur Jacquet met DM at a dinner and asked what his program would be if he were to head a government. What foreign policy, what social policy, what about the finances and the army? DM did not reply. What would you do about the Vietnamese who are in the French army? Jack asked. DM still did not answer, but a friend with him spoke up and said, we would throw them out and send them back to the farms. Maybe later we would take a few of them back. Why? asked Jackie. Because they are suspect, was the answer. Since the French trained troops were the only ones capable of making a stand against the communists, Jack opposed DM's appointment from that day on. Only Paul Devinat, the French Secretary of State for Civil Aviation, and his secretary, Monsieur Varae, were for DM. Devonat had once directed a parliamentary investigation in Saigon and was regarded as a leading authority on Indochina. He refused the portfolio of Minister of the Associated States when Jacquet resigned, and in 1956 was to write an article for Politique étrangerie, a publication put out by the office of the French Premier, in which Devinat justified DM's anti-French attitude on grounds that France had always opposed his nomination. No disclaimer of French responsibility could be more official than this article written by a pro-DM official. So we come back to the conclusion that certain Americans, and they alone, were behind the selection which both Colonel Edward Lansdale and Joseph Buttinger, the socialist, wished to make appear the result of spontaneous popularity and Baudi's submission to his country's popular will. DM's biographical sketch in the 1957 edition of A Sixth Who S Who, presumably written by himself, reads, Returned to Vietnam June 26, 1954 with full civil and military power to form a government, Prime Minister July 7, 1954, proclaimed Vietnam a republic and became president, October 26, 1955. And that is as much as the American people are likely to learn from their press or any Senate Foreign Relations Committee headed by Senator Mike Mansfield. Now for a look at the crew of this new ship hot state on whose launching Washington liberals broke the champagne bottle. Chapter 4 N.G. Odin N.H.U. and his in-laws Nu was 43 when the brother through whom he and his wife were ultimately to rule a nation was made premier. Those who studied with Nu in France, where he specialized in treaties, constitutions and charters, knew him as an evasive, shy student from Indochina. Most summed him up as having an inferiority complex. None imagined that the weak schoolmate would one day become merciless, imposing on a country the fear that in his mind was inextricably linked with respect. He read Machiavelli and later explained his application of Machiavellian principles by describing himself as a Catholic of the left. To his followers he preached the curative virtues of prisons and political internment camps, in other words, the arms of the leader incapable of inspiring a following. When Ho Chi Minh rose to power in post-war Indochina, Young Nu's first reaction was to exclaim, he needs us intellectuals. Unfortunately for Nu, Ho felt that he was doing well with the time-tried communist team he had built up over the years. He was wary of young John Oscar lately and preferred to surround himself with men whose loyalties had been proved when the going was rough. This threw New back into the game of opportunism, drawing what he could from French pressure on the communists and Ho Chi Minh's pressure on the French, and leading each to believe he had something to offer. The group he gathered around him was called the Movement for Independence and Peace. Only by acquiring a following would Nu be in position to demand of either side the consideration he felt he ought to have, so what he built up was a following of fancesitors. The name Movement for Independence and Peace was well chosen. It came out of the Communist Handbook. Independence was a magic word with the Americans and peace was the jingo of the Reds. 
there were two ways of acquiring peace as the war aged between Ho Chi Minh and the French. One was by helping the French win, the other by making them lose. And as Time magazine admitted, Nu did all in his power to prevent the peace part of his platform from coming about through an anti-communist victory. His excuse for an obstructionist policy was that the country was not free, the same argument being used so effectively by his brother in Washington. It met with the approval of the Americans. Force them, the French, to give independence to Indochina and they will form a crusade for liberty, proclaimed Senator John F. Kennedy in Washington, at the darkest moment of the struggle. With some American help Nu fastened his grip on the labor movement in Vietnam and thereafter the international labor organizations plugged for him in Geneva, Brussels, New York, Washington and the lesser capitals of their respective members. Labor was the striking fist of Nu's political action, which he conducted under another name, the Humanist Workers Revolutionary Party. It had a familiar ring. When defeat came in 1954 and the country was divided, Nu charged the French with treason and betrayal. Armistice was described as abandonment and used as an argument for demanding the appointment of his brother, D.M. American opinion, which had been so easily maneuvered into defending Nu's refusal to lift a finger while the fighting was going on, fell equally hard for his cry that the armistice was betrayal when the fighting was lost. The do-good theorists claimed that he represented a third force, hostile to both communism and the French, and that he was impeded by conviction from helping either. This specious explanation made him acceptable to America's government and press, despite his non-resistance to the communists. In Nu's case the whole theory was rot. Many Vietnamese were in the third force category sincerely, Tom Bayan in a conflict. But Ngo Dinh Nu was never one of them. He and his intellectuals of the left remained in the middle from opportunism, not scruples. They were waiting to see which side would triumph. They made no attempt to conceal their sympathy for Ho, the communist, who was doing the fighting against the French. In fact there was a strong bond between Nu and most, if not all, of the Americans in Vietnam at that time in their desire to see the communists and the French file themselves off against each other, thereby leaving the field for a solution which each visualized according to his lights. In their game the devout DM was never anything but a front, and Nu played every angle to advance him. The pattern employed has since become classic. It was the policy of American labor to organize native unions in the colonies of our allies then to push the native union as a revolutionary political force. When the European power granted independence under American governmental pressure brought about by the other hand of the same unions, the right of the union leader to head the nation was claimed on the assertion that he had won independence. Considering the double role of American labor in these operations, the claim was justified. In former colonies where a monarchical form of government existed, the next move was invariably against the throne, also in the name of democracy. Thus the labor leaders supplanted the king. Tunisia is an example of this operation. It was at an Afalcio Congress in San Francisco in September 1951 that Bagiba was given his mandate and the support of the American press and State Department to liberate and lead Tunisia. The Moroccan dynasty temporarily escaped the same fate through the popularity of Muhammad II, but the days of the monarchy are numbered. The hate campaign against the Emperor Baudai, which a perusal of old newspapers and magazines discloses, merits study now that the heat of the moment is past. The goal was simple, to create a socialist world you create socialist nations. In Vietnam we were at the stage of attack against the throne. Next would come establishment of the doctrine of the Humanist Workers Revolutionary Party, which Nu headed when the political parties of Vietnam met for a congress in Saigon on September 6, 1953. Nu made a breast-beating speech, dear to the hearts of leftist demagogues everywhere. It sounded fine as printed by the liberal press. He demanded liberty, independence, a broad-based government representative of the people, and a national assembly honestly and freely elected, before which the government would stand accountable. 
It is interesting to reflect that a year later the speaker himself was imprisoning Vietnamese for demanding the same liberties that he had claimed in 1953 without fear of arrest by Bao Dai and the French, and no American newsman or government official protested new socialist program aimed at destroying the throne and tightening the grip of himself and his family. Rather, they encouraged it. Peter Kalliser, the Far East correspondent for Columbia Broadcasting System, wrote an illuminating piece for Collier's magazine of July 6, 1956. We are working towards a socialistic state, he quoted New as saying, a non-Marxist state of free cooperatives where management and labor share con. Trill of industry. Stripped of its flowery rhetoric and studied with an eye on Sukino, Mr. New's non-Marxist personal Marxism should never have been reassuring. Continues Mr. Kalisa. DM's brother, Ngo De Nu, is the second most important personage in Free Vietnam. Slight, cat-like on his feet, with a large head and brilliant A's, Nu is a political infighter, a sort of combination Jim Farley and Harry Hopkins. Nu's Humanist Revolutionary Workers' Party, membership figures confidential, forms the left-wing core of DM's broad national revolutionary movement. A clique limited to the Ngodin family and its hangers on Mr. Callis are described as a broad national revolutionary movement. No questions were asked by Senator Fulbright's committee, which investigated public relations men using American aid to lobby for foreign governments or leaders, when that committee went through the motions of probing such matters in 1963. Why was this piece written? How did this particular man happen to write it and Collier S. print it? and how much did it cost? These are questions that would give an irate public a heyday. The first person to play a part in News' consolidation of power was his imperious mother-in-law, Madame Tran Van Kiwong. The second was his beautiful wife, who married when she was fifteen to get away from home because her mother had slapped her, and who in turn edged out her mother. Next came the head of News' secret police, Albert Pham Gokthau whom the inspired pen of Joe Allsop converted into an anti-communist hero, though Thao's career as intelligence chief for Ho Kim in a few years before was an open book and his seventy-some thousand informers, reporting on their neighbors, public servants and even ministers of government were the terror of South Vietnam. Each of the principal characters forming the foundation for news naked wielding of power deserves a book and even a cursory study cannot but cast some doubts on the leader whose props rested on such a following. Let us take a look at the head of the Tran Van family. History is full of stories of indomitable women, some legendary, some real. But if one is to look for examples of the native tigress with all her energy, ruthlessness and rapacity, Vietnam is a country in which the type is both indigenous and contemporary. Here we find by Ho Thi Hao, or Madame T. Bay, as she was called, the communist guerrilla leader, with her band of foreign legion deserters and Jap mercenaries. Madame T. Bay made merciless robots out of her followers. She was in her thirties when her unit, Chidoi 12, of Ho Kimen's southern army ravaged the Hockman area while France's high commissioner in Indochina, Monsieur Pignan, was working to bring back Bao Dai. With her assassination squads, her own propaganda corps, police force, Ministry of Economy and Political Bureau, she built herself an empire founded on terror and brainwashing. She dressed in a black uniform with a coat in her belt and a gun slung over her shoulder. Death was the punishment for any infraction of the rules Madame T. Bay applied with an iron hand. Then there was Madame Lithin Gam, the wife of the Ho Hao general, Tran Van Sio I, who blew up her husband's own chief of staff with a hand grenade for holding out on her in a business deal. There was a time when Bao Dai's mother, secure in the power she wielded in old Vietnam, was referred to as a tigress also. All things being as they were, the chances were high that Tran Van Kiwong, the son of the rich Mandarin, or court official, family who took his doctorate in law in Paris in 1922 would have a grasping, dominating shrew for a wife. It was not a question of what percentage of Vietnamese women possess these qualities, 
rather did it hinge on Kiwong's chances of rising high enough for his wife to reach the thin atmosphere where a consciousness of power is ever present above a certain level of heaviness sets in among the females of the species, and the latent avidity for more of everything becomes a mania. Kiwong was doomed from the start, for he was related to the imperial family, therefore of the circle to which power and opportunity for more power are natural. Kiwong was cultured, his manners were charming, and for generations his ancestors had administered Annam for its emperors. In 1938 he was vice president of the Grand Council for Economic Interests of Indochina. As the name would imply, the post's opportunities for profit were many. In 1940 he became a member of the Federal Council. Then in 1945, just before the Japanese collapse, Bao Dai made him Minister of Foreign Affairs and Vice President of the Cabinet of Ministers, an honor which Tran Van Kiwong the man did not forget when the test came. It was Tran Van Kiwong the husband who was hammered into rejecting the obligations of honor. Through the war years with the Viet Minh, Kiwong did nothing till the very end, in 1953, when he accepted a comparatively unimportant post as judge of the French Vietnamese Court of Cassation which was similar to the Supreme Court in America. During those years when Kuong remained in the wings his authoritative wife was the active member of the clan. She became a counselor of the French Union, the legislative body that sat at Versailles, with all the perquisites and privileges that appertained thereto. These included the opportunities offered by the exchange office which we have mentioned. For the Tran Van Kuong fortune like that of Bao Dai himself and all the other leading families of Annam and Cochin China, had suffered by the war, first during the stagnation period under the Japanese, then under the ruthless despoiling by Ho Kai Ming. When Ngo Din Diem returned in 1954 with his full powers, military and civil, to form a government, command reposed, literally, in the hands of his brother Nu. But Nu's mother-in-law, the counselor of the French Union, was supreme boss within the family. She was the one who made money while Nu tended his roses in Dalat or organized political labor unions in Saigon. Hers was the spotlight, the trips to parliamentary meetings where she sat with those whose decisions made front page news, while her frustrated daughter, married to the indigent Rose Fancier and coffee house conspirator, suffered from boredom. And even worse, anonymity. Lucien Baudard, the French writer on the Far East, wrote of Madame Nu. All her powers of rage I saw when Baudai returned to power and D.M. refused to be Prime Minister. At the time she was living in Dalat in at Audrey House. When she could stand no more she would telephone Baudai and ask him to come and get her. A sumptuous car would call for her while her husband smelled his flowers. Later, things were worse. In Saigon the life of the Nhis was almost clandestine. They lived in modest rooms adjoining a religious clinic. The first time I went there I crossed a dusty yard where the washing was hung out to dry. Out of a passage covered with corrugated metal came a young woman in a white tunic and green pants. She was shabbily dressed. Children clung to her. She was so depressed by disappointment I did not recognize her. All she had to do was wash clothes cook meals and wipe their children. With DM's sudden projection into a position of power in the last days of June 1954, the petulant daughter of the Kuongs was swept upward as a member of the new ruling family. And, though her father was immediately made Minister of State, an indefinite post specifying no particular field of responsibility but permitting everything, by the unwritten. Laws of protocol operating within families Madame Nu theoretically took precedence over her mother. Yet the mother had experience and she was not to give up without a fight. The palace intrigues started. It was both a power struggle and a score settling. Jean Lata Guy, author of numerous books on Vietnam which the Pentagon would do well to study, described Nu's wife, who was destined to win in the end, as the courageous enterprising sister-in-law who, while D.M. worked from within the seminary in New Jersey, was the belle of the court at Dalat, and the intimate of Bao Dai. Paris Match, September 14, 1963
but Lata Guy excused her frivolities and dalliances as weapons of a woman who knew what she wanted. This ravishing woman with the cool head, he continued, never forgot to serve her clan in all her strayings. She is credited with a certain number of affairs. They were always to gain an end. They served the cause of the Ngodins. Madame Nu played a great part in the rallying of certain young officers at a time when DM could not have survived without gaining the support of the army. Could it be that this is one reason for the revenge that she is so determined to take on men? DM never could stand the presence of a woman. He felt ill at ease and immediately became obnoxious, except in the case of his beautiful sister-in-law, who in her way, by her ambition and her tenacity, is a man. She rendered immense service to the family, and they knew they could depend on her. If she sinned, it was by fidelity to her own. O Ictes, the French Diplomatic Weekly, of November 11, 1963, all but mentioned by name the official in the American Embassy to whose winning over by Madame Nu the Vietnamese, inveterate gossips, credited the perpetuation of the family's grip. Roto Ictes the beautiful sister-in-law of the president based all her power on the physical attraction she exercised over military chiefs and also, why not admit it question mark on American counselors and diplomats in Saigon. It took time for Beauty and Wiles to dislodge the mother who had been so long in the spotlight. Through the first year of Ngodin ascendancy visualize Madame Kuong as ensconced in the center of a vast web. Her husband she sent off to Washington to sit in an embassy. Pham Duikam, whom Saigon gossip insisted was her lover, she presented with an ambassadorship to France. When Nguyen Hu Cho, the husband of one of her daughters was, as rumor had it, a former lover or not, one thing is certain, the daughter never wanted to marry him and so hated the union that eventually she announced her intention of getting a divorce and marrying a Frenchman. Whereupon Madame Nu arrested her own sister and the sister attempted suicide. But all this was yet to come. Nguyen Hu Cho, while Madame Kuang was distributing sinecures, became Secretary of State to the Presidency, a job that would correspond to that of Assistant to the President in America, except that in Vietnam the new President accepted advice only from his brother and later, out of fear of her ages, from his sister in law. Kiwong's brother, Tran Van Du, was set up as Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Kiwong son, Tran Van Kim, eventually became press chief, a post which he held until Nu made him nominal head of the secret police toward the end of the regime. It was accepted that should anything happen to DM, Tran Van Kiwong would remain in Washington to maneuver the Americans while Tran Van Du, his brother, would move into Noradam Palace. At the top of the pyramid, holding all the strings, was Madame Kiwong. The third brother of the Tran Van family, Tran Van Fuok, Madame Kiwong dispatched to the hinterlands as mayor of Dalat and chief of security for the High Plateau region. There he remained until a 40 million piesta scandal involving slaughterhouse taxes back in Saigon provided an excuse to make him Saigon police prefect in the spring of 1959. The only real change in the power set up from 1954 to 1956 was Madame Nu's gradual edging out of her mother. It was still within the family circle, and its effect was to lock out more securely than ever the political leaders who had borne the brunt of the fight for independence. The result was a police state run by two Mandarin families, one of which, the Tran Vans, was still bound by a certain loyalty to tradition and emperor. The personal ambitions of the other, the Ngodins were boundless. D. M. and Nu and the latter's grasping wife were determined to sweep the table clean and establish a new dynasty, themselves. One heard nothing in America of D. M.'s sister, Madame Tiela, through all this, but she was there though she occupied no government post, she waxed rich on her ice monopoly in central Vietnam and advanced her son-in-law, Tran Trun An as Secretary of State for Defense. Her brother-in-law, Nguyen Van Thoi, from 1954 to May 1955 she pushed into the lucrative post of Minister of Planning and Reconstruction. Chapter 5 The People Thwarted From the first no voice of advice or criticism was permitted. 
and as the stranglehold of the strange man and his power-hungry family tightened, the suppression of southern demands for a voice in their own government became more ruthless. The new premier, no one forgot for a moment, was a northerner from Hugh, and had been installed by America. Southerners who had gone through with the farce of affecting enthusiasm wanted him to live up to his share of the bargain, that is, an election in which they could install a leader of their own. Instead they were hounded into exile or summarily arrested. So within a matter of weeks after assuming power in 1954, DM became known as the parachute it dropped from above by a foreign power, America, and without roots in the soil. Anyone repeating this in the United States was denounced by those who were working so hard to cram Godin DM down the throats of his countrymen. Brother News insurance against criticism was to saturate homes, offices and neighborhoods with informers whose job it was to stop justified complaints by arrests, not reforms. One exception existed, one opposing voice which DM and New dared not silence. It was permitted to continue as a sort of ineffectual resistance for six years, as proof that they were democratic. Whenever DM was asked why he did not enlarge his government, the answer, duly repeated and approved by the entire American press, was, they, the Southerners, won't cooperate with me. Probably never in the history of the world was refusal to be a yes man found to be an evil by so many theoretically idealistic Americans. The one opposing voice permitted to live in liberty, if not to actually campaign, served to make the Vietnamese in the street more cynical of our whole policy. This man was Phan Huy Dan, sometimes known as Phan Keng Day, and he is worth more than a paragraph in any honest study of America's big experiment. Phan not only would Dan, as he was called, be the only opposition leader at liberty to dispute power with. Madam News family, the trans, if something had happened to DM, but he provides an excellent example of the sort of man to whom our agents were invariably drawn. Dan had been all things to all people in his time, depending on who was dispensing the perquisites. Politically he had ranged from fervent monarchist to popular democrat. In 1946, when the Die Viet Party under Nguyen Tun Hoan attempted a coup d'etat against Ho Chi Minh, Dan was in on it with a group calling themselves the Dai Chung, Great Masses. The attempt failed because the French were trying to get along with Ho Chi Minh at the time, and they regarded Ho Chi Minh as the lesser threat. In all justice it must be remembered that America was also granting Ho agrarian reform a garb and considerable support. Those in the Dai Viet plot who were able to escape fled to China. Among them, leaving his wife in a village some hundred and fifty miles away and taking with him the daughter of a party member who had been doing his cooking, went Dan. The Dai Viet accused him of taking the party's funds. In 1947 the nationalist leaders brought their scattered organizations together again and converged on Hong Kong to demand a say in the new agreement Bao Dai was negotiating with the French. They promised they would stick together but Dan used the rest of the group as a bargaining point to advance himself. In return for a post as personal counselor to Bao Dai, he sold out his friends and helped form what they considered to be a puppet cabinet. In 1952 the Americans, each trying to apply his own theories to Southeast Asian politics, attempted to sell the idea of a third force, a movement, previously mentioned, that would oust both Bao Dai and the French and then oppose the Reds. This period provided the material for Graham Greene's book, The Quiet American. Jean Gregory, publisher of The Times of Vietnam was the American Graham Greene fictionalized in this novel. A thread in Greene's plot concerns the involvement of the hero with terrorist bombings in Vietnam. In real life, an American named Mackay connected with the OSS was credited with furnishing explosives for a theater bombing in 1952 and was expelled from the country by the French. The CIA was said to be behind his return to Vietnam after DM's rise to power. The third force idea was not a new one. Other nationalist leaders had tried and rejected it when they found that activities against Bao Dai always aided Ho Chi Minh indirectly and invariably only made more necessary the continuation of their French rule. 
Baudai himself had tried an anti-French, anti-communist third force platform and failed for lack of support. American liberals, however, were more ardent in fighting colonialism than they ever were in the war against communism. They backed a new Vietnamese party which they put down to organizing in Thailand. He was given plenty of money, and every effort was made to attract recruits. But Dan was a northerner. Old scores had not been forgotten and his movement collapsed. In preparation for his next try, he dropped the girl who had fled to Hong Kong with him in 1946 and married a woman from Cochin China, hoping it would make him a southerner by marriage. Northern Vietnam, it will be recalled, was known as Tonkin, Annam occupied the center, and Cochin China was the land to the south. Later Dan was to try to form still another new party, which he called the Democratic Bloc, named to attract American support. Why was this political adventurer the only man permitted to go through the motions of opposition to the premier whose towering rages had already become the terror of the country? Others fled, had their property confiscated, disappeared into prison, drew death sentences or simply disappeared. But Fan Huey Dan lived under a magic protection. The explanation, he had dug in with OSS during the war. The green officers whom he convinced of his importance then based their reports on his information. To admit, then or later, that Fan Huey Dan was a phony would be to admit that they had been fooled. How sound Dan's information had been was immaterial. We won the war and his superiors were promoted. When it was over, those who wished to escape the hazards of competitive life automatically became China specialists or Southeast Asia specialists regardless of how ignorant they had been a year before. Many transferred to Central Intelligence Agency, others returned to the USA as businessmen. Fan Huey Dan. Kept in with all of them wherever he went an invisible umbrella protected him, it was the whisper, keep in good with him, he is an American agent. Whether he was or not ceased to matter. The whisper was insufficient to prevent DM and Nu from touching him until their headiness, their conviction that America could not get along with without them, they threw caution to the winds, but that days was still far off through the despotic suppressions of the early years, the fact that men who were American agents had direct pipelines to Washington were friends of Fan Huey Dan, placed him above persecution. 45. As the centralization of power spread downward through DM's immediate family, to thin out through in-laws and widening circles of cousins, resentment of America as the power responsible for the repressive and alien family kept pace with the growing hatred of DM. And as was only natural, the fact and source of Dan's protection, which no other Vietnamese enjoyed, inevitably worked against him and us. The stigma applied to him as tool of the Americas offset any advantages he enjoyed through his limited freedom of movement. A malaise gripped the country, a realization that day by day the family in power was tightening its grip and that unless something were done and done quickly, it would be too late. The political parties were restless, but they and their splinter groups pulled against each other. Jealous leaders refused, even temporarily, to unite in a common front. Thus Nu was permitted, through his secret police and agitators, to practice the game of divide and rule. Antagonisms between northerners and southerners, both anti-communist, increased. The most important of the nationalist, anti-communist political parties opposing DM's growing power was the Die Viet Party we have mentioned, the party that in 1946 came within a breath of beating Ho Chi Minh. The Dai Viet leader, Dr. Nguyen Tun Hon, still convinced of the purity of all things American, a delusion that was fostered through his personal friendship with and confidence in American Ambassador Donald Heath, prepared to fly to Washington in late 1954, with a visa provided him by Ambassador Heath. All that was necessary, Dr. Hone thought, was to explain to the Americans and they would rectify their mistake of backing DM. The two religious sects, the Cao Dai and the Ho Hao, were alarmed, but not yet to the point of making a move. In 1953 they had formed a united national front, as they called it, with the Bing Zhuin, the organization of Levanvin who was to become head of the police in 1954. 
The Bing Zhuine was more than a gang of pirates, it had the organizational attributes of a secret society, one of those brotherhoods to be found in the Orient and nowhere else. The eyes and the ears of the Bing Zhuine were everywhere. They alone had proved that they could beat the communists at their own game. Perhaps it was a feeling of security that kept the two sects and the Bing Zhuine, with their three private armies, from making a move while DM and Nu prepared to take over the National Army before their eyes. For in those months of July and August 1954, the honeymoon with the new regime was already over, and the army loomed as the bulwark between the Ngodins and the people. It was to the army that the people turned. Like all crises, the mounting one in Saigon started with countless conversations, carefully sheltered behind the conditional. If we were to do this, was the preface until that step was passed and we must do this opened a new phase. DM had appointed himself Minister of the Interior, that is, head of the National Police, and Minister of National Defense, that is, controller of the army. Tran Van Du, the uncle of Madame Nu, was Minister of Foreign Affairs. Tran Van Kiwong was Minister of State, but his role in the unsavory Trangtron Kim government of 1945 under the Japanese had not been forgotten. Brother Nu stayed out of the picture, preferring to operate as counselor to the president, with his 180,000 regimented labor union members acting as a sort of iron guard for a personal fascism of the left. Cochin China's six million southerners had not a minister in the government as the showdown approached between DM and young General Nguyen Van Hin, the chief of staff of the army. Hin's father, Nguyen Van Tam, had been premier two years before, and he passed the laws guaranteeing the rights of labor unions which, in the summer of 1954, enabled Nu to use his union to outdistance the leaders who had bona fide political backing. As a consequence Nguyen Van Tam was the first to have his property confiscated and be driven from the country. DM's brother, Thuk, the priest of the family, was Bishop of Vinlong to the south, so Cochin China, without representation at the time in the cabinet, became his personal fief. The northern area, it must be remembered, was turned over to the iron-fisted brother Can. Brother Luine was packed off to Europe as ambassador at large. Wherever one looked there were only Ngodins and Tran Vans, save for the incumbents of two unimportant posts, agriculture and public health, both held by non-entities. Lieutenant General Lion Michael Daniel, head of America's military aid advisory group was an all-out partisan of the Ngodins. From the moment of DM's arrival he forgot the main purpose of his mission. Strengthening Vietnam against the communist power to the north was the least of O'Daniel's worries. Eventually he left the army and returned to America as DM's heavy artillery in the greatest public relations campaign ever launched to sell America a liability. More will be said later of General O'Daniel and Colonel Edward Lansdale, the political officer who was dispatched to help DM strangle his opposition. Also there was Professor Wesley Fischel. DM's old friend from Michigan State University, who for seven years turned the press and political science section of an American Hall of Learning into indoctrination organs to sell Vietnam's outside imposed despot and his policies. On the side, Fischl served as consultant to the U.S. Operations Mission, the group supplying money to keep DM in the saddle. Fischl also worked from the inside as a member of Ambassador J. Lawton Collins' staff. It was the practice of this American team, as Southern discontent mounted, to divert the storm from DM's head by running a local popularity contest against the French by resurrecting old grudges and directing popular anger against the late colonialists. In Vietnam it met with limited success, in America, far from the scene, there was no voice to contradict them. An important adjunct to this team was the International Rescue Committee, IRC, as it was called, of New York, which worked on the American front. This organization, into which no investigative spotlight ever probed, had both the finances and, apparently, a reason for sending a mission to South Vietnam. Whom did they send? The Austrian socialist leader and naturalized American, 
Joseph Buttinger. By September 1954 something had to give. D.M. knew that the Southerners were stirring, but slow methods in negotiations were not his way. He proposed to break them. By that time, however, the army was in revolt and wholeheartedly in sympathy with the opposition. The account given by General Hinn's father, the former Premier Nguyen Van Tam, of the start of this affair, which American press agencies and newspapers presented as an example of our brilliant diplomacy and DM's miracle working is here for the record. For all his courteous, old school air, Nguyen Van Tam is a fighter. One of his sons was killed by the Viet Minh, and when he took over his premiership on Dabao Dai in June 1952, it was with the blunt declaration of policy, we are going to fight communists. Naturally Hin turned to his father when he was faced with the political decision. We might add that HMH and his young generals also thought that ex-premier Tam would have better luck with French General Ely. I was up in Dalat when it started, former premier Tam told the author. My son telegraphed me to come down. I flew to Saigon and they his son and the other military leaders, told me they were going to oust DM. The people didn't want DM, and Bao Dai was behind my son, so they were going to throw him out if he refused to obey Bao Dai's order to step down. I said, it is all right with me, but don't forget, the French have charge of the gasoline and ammunition. You can't do anything without them. So they sent me to see the French. The first officers I talked to said, it is all right with us, on our level, but you will have to see General Ely. I went to General Ely and told him what we were going to do. And General Ely replied that he would not give us either gasoline or ammunition. He said, there are a thousand reasons for supporting DM, chief of which is America will cut off all aid if you don't. Ely wouldn't give us anything, so we were lost. Such was the stand taken by the French general charged with preserving order. The propaganda given America then or since never mentioned this. Rather, it charged Dealey with openly agitating and oacking a revolt. He is accused of encouraging the whole plot as a means of restoring colonialism. It was reported that he withheld ammunition from DM, but at no time is he given credit for trying to preserve peace by keeping both sides from fighting much less pleading DM's case with Hin's father. Hin was 38 and with no political experience or ambition, when he was confronted with the job of ousting DM or seeing DM and Nu take over the army, the only protective shield between the Ngodans and the people. He had graduated from the École Super EU Rodelaire and was a veteran of the Italian and German campaigns. He had 13 decorations, including the Legion of Honor the Croix de Guerre and the American Air Medal. During the war against the Viet Minh he had commanded a squadron, and in 1951 he left the French Air Force with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel to enter Vietnam's new National Army as a Brigadier General. In his battle dress covered with ribbons, he incarnated in his person the young Vietnam who, with the 270,000 men available to his command, would, it was hoped, stop the Reds. He was Vietnam's heroic soldier, the only general that would have inspired a Vietnamese boy to join the army. Suspicious of everyone but his brothers and in-laws, DM contemplated from Noradam Palace his dashing chief of staff and did not like what he saw. In fact, DM decided to get rid of him, it was one of the first official acts in the building he renamed Independence Palace. His way of doing it was typical. On Thursday morning, September 9, 1954, a telephone jangled noisily in the Saigon office of Air France. A clerk picked up the receiver. This is Noradam Palace, he was told. General Hin will leave for Paris on the 7 o'clock flight, Sunday morning, September 12th. Very well, replied the clerk. Who is speaking? The party had hung up. The reservation clerk shrugged his shoulders. He knew his Vietnam well enough to know the dividing line between what was his concern and what was not. He obediently filled out a reservation sheet to be scanned by typists, errand boys, clerks and the horde in general infesting all business offices in the Orient. 
news of the impending trip crossed Saigon with the speed of a national calamity. One of the last to hear about it was General Hin, when telephone calls started asking why he was leaving. Hin refused to go. The army was behind him, and around the army a hard core of popular resistance had begun to form. Hitherto Hin had regarded the private armies of the Bing Xuyin and the sects as threats to himself. But DM's dismissing of Hin and the weak dictator manner in which he had delivered it drew the four disparate forces together. Since Hin had refused to take the Sunday morning plane, DM sent him another order, Sunday evening, telling him to leave on Tuesday. Hin replied that he could not. The army was in the process of being transferred from French to Vietnamese command and he could not leave on such short notice. The truth of the matter was that Hin knew the army represented the people in this affair, and both army and people had had enough. It is interesting to read the reflection of Raymond Cartier on the explosion developing. To Cartier, France's great mistake had been the basing of their confidence, not on the Vietnamese masses who were close to the soil, but on a limited, upper middle class who thought they knew how to govern because they had been given a varnish of Western culture. The result permitted a family to grasp all the levers of command without having any real understanding of what should be done. Personal and family interests were placed above the countries. The young intellectuals thought they were making politics, in reality they delved in intrigue. When the country needed a leader with roots in its soil, able to feel its pulsations while keeping an open mind toward Western ideas, it had no such men. There was no lack of them among the Viet Minh. Cartier lamented. It was a strange situation. Even as the storm clouds gathered, out of the American embassy came a torrent of publicity, insulting the intelligence and damaging America in the eyes of Asia. A vast improvement was heralded. To Barmend, the European journalist, wrote of our fervor at the time, as usual, the Americans go about their business in dead earnest. Having decided to transplant their variety of democracy into this forgotten comer of Asia, they rejoice in every gesture of democracy as only a mother could rejoice in the progress of her child. The greater majority of Americans in Vietnam very sincerely believe that in transplanting their institutions they will immunize South Vietnam against communist propaganda. To Bam End, in Esprit, p. 933, Paris. June 1957. Mend was written off as a stupid and embittered colonialist. Papers told the Vietnamese that they had been badly treated but democracy was coming in. Agrarian reforms, the changing of unpopular taxes, and an end of misappropriation had come. New industries would be introduced, reconstruction pushed and the army reorganized. Before it had started the new program was hailed as a success. Right had conquered evil. And no one heard the murmurs that were rising from the villages. The ascetic DM remained isolated in his palace, the doors of which this longed for new order never passed. All DM wanted for the moment was to get his hands on Hin's army. Removal of the causes of dissatisfaction were never given a thought. When Hin arrived at his office on Monday morning, following the final Sunday afternoon orders to leave for Paris, generals and colonels were waiting for him. Telegrams pledging support were flowing in from all over the country. DM, on his part, had sent out a call to his partisans in Hue, where he was bomb, and beyond that was hoping to limit the spread of the opposition by censoring all news dispatches. Hin's empty jeep, escorted by motorcycles, circulated through the streets, but no one knew where Hin was or what he was doing. Instead of commanding, instead of taking over Saigon while the country literally offered it to him on a platter, Hin waited for no one knew what. That night the firing started. Machine guns and hand grenades shook the European quarter. No one knew who was firing, or why, for anyone could have fired and everyone had reason to. It was impossible for the Westerner, who had never lived such dramas, to understand this situation, it was the Orient, with its plots of warlords, its cupidity, its double dealings, all to the accompaniment of high-sounding speeches that carried a noble and patriotic ring when read the next day in the New York papers. 
DM ordered Hin to hand over his command. Hin refused and told DM to resign instead, whereupon DM named General Nguyen Van V commander of the Saigon Colon area, to replace Hin. V went for a talk with Hin and promptly joined him. The whole insubordination, American newspaper readers were told, is due to the hold still exercised by the departing French over a small group of venal officers. The French are determined to impede democracy. While carefully sown rumors, under the table dickering, and plots and counterplots flourished, DM stalled for time, to give his American protectors time to save him. He resurrected a white haired general named Nguyen Van Xuan, the last head of the government of Cochin China before it became part of a greater Vietnam. Xuan had been one of the founders of the Vietnamese army, a fact with which, along with his age, made him a venerable figure. Though two years before he had been an implacable enemy of the Ngodins, DM brought him back politically, and Fi no one knows what price talked him into accepting the post of Minister of National Defense, over Hin. And Hin, with his years of training as a soldier, was too bound by the habits of discipline to refuse to recognize the appointment. He wired Bao Dai for advice. When DM heard of the telegram he branded Hin a rebel. It was Bao Dai's last chance to become a leader. A week before he had been hated and detested for remaining in Kand while the dismemberment of the country was going on. The day Hin turned to him for instructions, all that was forgotten. Had he risen to the occasion at that moment he could have saved his throne. Everything depended on Bao Dai's speaking with a clear voice and issuing a command. Overnight the country forgot its past complaints and looked to him again waiting for his word. Despite the desertion of officers and soldiers who were frightened by threats from the American embassy that they would receive no more pay if they stayed with Hin, it was clear that Hin held the situation in his hands. All he was waiting for was a wire from Bao Dai to make his orders legal. Without that wire he lacked initiative to do anything on his own. Everything was confusion as Hin awaited a reply but, once and for all, whatever happened, a great heave of the country seemed about to throw off the fanatic and his family. The Minister of Health disappeared. In a matter of hours nine other ministers handed in their resignations. The governmental palace was guarded only by a few green berried gendarmes, DM's family, and the few outsiders he had rushed in from Hugh. Levanvan, the Bingzuin leader, had flown to Cannes to make a report to Bao Dai before the crisis started. There he and the Emperor learned of the new turn of events together. At the height of the confrontation Levanvin returned with instructions from Bao Dai that Hin stand his ground. Some 400,000 Vietnamese, the people of the swampy delta where the Mekong River fans out to the sea, were ready to follow Levanvin. His private army of some 11,000 armed and 25,000 unarmed men possessed the best morale in the country and they were loyal to Bao Dai, which in this case included Hin. The Ho Hao sect, numbering approximately a million and a half and having an army of between 5,000 and 10,000 under old General Tran Van Sio I, pledged its support. So did the Pope of the Ki Dai sect with his two million adepts and over 20,000 men under arms. At that moment the reply to Hin's telegram came. What pressure had been applied to Bao Dai? and by whom, we shall probably never know, for it was never Bao Dai's way to seek an out from his mistakes by making explanations. Suffice to say, the agents of the greatest power on earth, America, were given free hand to see that DM triumphed. Still, all that was lacking was a word. And Bao Dai chose that moment to assure Hin of his esteem and tell him he was thinking the matter over. As George Chafford points out in his book Indochina, Dick's Arts de l'Independence, Bao Dai was aware that his margin for maneuvering had been greatly reduced. Edgar Fourier had succeeded Mendes France as Premier of France. Though Fourier's estimation of DM was very low indeed, his desire was to wash his hands of Vietnam completely. There were favors he wished of the Americans elsewhere, and he was not going to strain Franco-American relations by opposing anything the Americans wanted to do in Southeast Asia, even though they were wrong.
with the French disassociating themselves, Baudai was at the mercy of an American team which made no attempt to conceal the fact that they would be happy to have a pretext for running him out. The anti-French campaign was to pave the way for a demand that France withdraw all troops and get out of the country completely, this leaving DM and his American advisers and their scurrying progressives from Michigan State a free hand. All things considered, it is hard to criticize Baudai for acting as he did. Madame Nu is credited with having conceived the idea of a demonstration in DM's favor at that tense moment, on Tuesday afternoon. September 21, 1954. Who was that to demonstrate for him save his friends and the unhappy Catholic refugees the French Air Force and the American Navy had brought down from the north? Out of their miserable lodgings the refugees were routed and told to assemble on Avenue Pasquia for a march on DM's palace. At their head they carried the national flag, along with banners proclaiming their loyalty to President Godin DM. Most wore crosses on their breasts. There was a burst of fire and the marchers wavered. A few of the group reached the place Pindabihain, where they hung some signs on the grill surrounding the cathedral. The priests took down the signs and begged the marchers to go home. The last thing they wanted was that their refugees be dragged into DM's political game. It was asking for trouble, in the overheated atmosphere. DM, in his seclusion, alternately timid or flaring with rage, was already regarded as a foreign monk dictator, trying to dominate the South from within his cell. The refugees, with every gesture of solidarity with DM, set themselves further apart from the people with whom they were going to have to live. At that moment DM and his family stood alone before the sects, the army and the police. That he survived is the first of the miracles he is credited with performing. Actually there was no miracle about it. While Hin sat in his command post and let time pass with good-natured tolerance, DM's victory was being prepared. Hin, by procrastinating and waiting for Baudai to think things over, was sealing his own fate. Without warning the Kaudai and Ho Hao denounced their allies of the day before and marched over to DM. American dollars and pressure worked the miracle. A Vietnamese named Pham Xu An Tai had been with an American Adventist mission in Indochina for years and claimed to have influence with the Americans. For that reason the Cao Dai Pope, Pham Kong Tak, had taken him on as a political advisor. As the forces against DM mounted, Pham Xu An Tai's importance to the pro-DM team in the American embassy increased. The deal that split this solid front and threw the weight in DM's favor involved several million dollars. The exact sum is not known. Perhaps it was more than the 5 to 10 million estimated, considering the number of leaders it bought. The American taxpayer picked up the tab. Nine years later they were to pay an equal amount to have their liability deposed. Chapter 6 The Bingzuin and the Kaudai Sect what were these Bingzuin, referred to in one breath as pirates and in the next as policemen, who were to play such an important role in the power struggle in Vietnam until, with our help, DM was able to destroy them? Their story and the story of Bay Ivan, their leader, who came to be known as General of Anvan, surpasses anything Hollywood has ever produced. Interwoven with them is the story of the two religious sects, the Ho Hao and the Cao Dai and corrupt warlords fluctuating between patriotism and piracy until in the end their own cupidity brought about the downfall of their spiritual leaders. When that day arrived, of the three of them it was the leader of the Bingzuin who rose nearest to nobility. Why we should have rendered Hokaim in the immeasurable service of destroying them is something no one can explain, unless it was for the reason that Levanvan, when the cards were on the table, remained loyal to his emperor and it is part of the phenomena of American liberalism that any anti-Western demagogue hard pressed for a victory to hold up to his people has only to attack a king to enjoy American approval and recognition. Nasser's invasion of Yemen is a ready example. In his doctorate in law thesis Pierre de Bézis wrote, Bay Ivan is surely one of the most extraordinary figures of South Vietnam. How did this highway robber? hunted by the authorities through the swamps of Soi Rap ten years ago, raise himself in such a short time to the position he has reached. 
Pingzui means toward the peace. It was the name applied to a village in the heart of the swamps that no outside enemy could attack without signaling his presence so long in advance an ambush would be waiting for him on the way. So the village of Pingzuin, hidden in the impenetrable marshes to the south of Kolon, was the home base of Bay Ivan, and the band which took the village's name. In the beginning they lived by piracy and ransom. In all fairness one must add that the region offered little opportunity to live otherwise, and their incursions were supported by the colonial economy as a form of risk natural to Asia. The Bingzuin were in no sense a sect, and at first they had no interest in politics. For years some hundred small bands had operated independently out of the swamps. They would make sporadic raids and disappear, without higher organization. Ex-convicts, escapees from justice, men who for one infraction or a hundred had been banned from Saigon, made up most of these gangs. The best known was led by Dong Ba Duong and his brother. During the Japanese occupation the swamp pirates became a sort of Robin Hood band. Their daring and the genius with which they exploited their geographical position, and the troubles caused by the occupying Japanese, inspired admiration for the Bingzuin among the masses. Gradually they emerged as nationalists. When the Japanese withdrew, the communists came, and in the eyes of the people, if not legally, the rehabilitation of the pirates was complete. During the brief period of communist legality Bay Ivan edged his men into the police's auxiliaries and acquired an amnesty for everyone as well as a complete education in communist methods. Ba Duong remained the big chief however, followed more or less obediently by smaller leaders such as Mu Oitri and Bay Ivan. The agent sent by the communists to be overlord of the area was none other than the ferocious Nguyen Bin, the most brutal of Ho Chi Minh's lieutenants, the man who, as head of the Nambo, the Communist Revolutionary Council for Cochin China, was mastermind of South Vietnamese terrorism and subversion. Through all that happened in this period runs the name of Nguyen Bin, the merciless, twisted killer who, without ever becoming a Communist Party member, M. His maniacal zeal became their robot, destroying his country, his countrymen, and, in the end, himself. Nguyen Bin trusted no one, and he was particularly suspicious of the independent nationalists of the swamps. Clashes became more frequent, and M. February 1946 Ba Duong was killed in a combat. Theoretically, the command was to pass to his brother, Duong Van Ha. At that moment Bay Ivan emerged from the shadows to start his meteoric rise. And in observing this pirate who was to come within a hair's breadth of establishing himself as military leader of his country at war, it is his qualities of leadership we are appraising, not his morals. For are we fighting communism in South Vietnam, or are we out to establish blue laws? If the moralist says that our aim is both. Would it not have been still better to let the two forces in question destroy themselves against each other? The men composing the loosely knit bands infesting the Bingzuin swamps were without any common direction when Ba Juong died. They were undisciplined outlaws, and the chief who rose to lead them won the loyalty of this army and subjected it to his own iron discipline. He had come up through a proving ground few generals could survive. The period of Bay Ivan's rise was also, as we have mentioned, the period of Ho Chi Minh's respectability, a shocking period for America. In late 1945 and early 1946 Newsweek's Harold R. Isaacs enthusiastically compared Uncle Ho to George Washington, and in 1945 American General Philip E. Gallagher made broadcasts over Ho's radio. American officers flew in and out of Hanoi promising arms, money and political support to Ho Chi Minh, the communist, and turned in reports to Washington that Harold Isaacs might have dictated. From Ho's Tongbo committee in the north to Nguyen Bin's Nambo in the south flowed a constant stream of promises, directives and encouragement. Bay Ivan, with his men installed as police auxiliaries, became the tax collector for his fief, but Nguyen Bin was distrustful of him. Bay Ivan was jealous of his freedom. 
He was still the man of the marshes who had never been subjected to anyone, so Bin decided to break him. At first he tried to disperse Bay Ivan's units. Then he tried to infiltrate them. In October 1946 Bay Ivan made contact with the French, trying to ensure his rear in the struggle that he knew was shaping with Nguyen Bin, but he was coolly received. In 1947 Hein Fu So, the mad monk who founded and led the Ho Hao sect, see chapter 7, was lured into a trap and killed by Nguyen Bin, Mu Oi Tri, Bay Ivan's companion of a hundred raids was sentenced to death at the time for trying to save the Ho Hao leader. In the end Mu Oi Tri was not executed, but Bin's brutality drove Bay Ivan to take his distance. Several times Bin's agents tried to kill Bay Ivan, but each time he outwitted them. Then Bin decided on a variation of the ruse that permitted him to kill the Ho Hao leader the year before. On May 19, 1948, Using Ho Kaiman's birthday as a pretext, Nguyen Bin set his trap for Bay Ivan. He invited Bay Ivan to come to his headquarters in the Plain of Junks for a party. For days Bin's troops had been on the move, quietly closing in, on the excuse that the French were planning an offensive. But there was nothing that Bay Ivan did not know. He accepted the invitation and took two hundred of his fiercest bodyguards with him with orders to surge to his rescue and kill Bin if Bay Ivan gave the signal. The Plain of Junks is a vast area. As far as the eye can see, no distinguishing point marks the place where low islands of reed-covered land end and reed-covered marsh begins. Junks appear to be floating on a field of reeds and from this appearance the plain derives its name. On one of the islands of this treacherous no man's land Nguyen Bin had his headquarters. Bay Ivan walked into his tent. Bin said, You have been betraying us but I pardon you, and proceeded to put his arms around Bay Ivan and give him an accolade. At that moment the killers burst into the tent. Bay Ivan cried, To me. And the fight was on. Vin and his guards fought their way out, and all the way back to the village in the heart of the swamp from which they had come. Back to Bin Xuyin, the lair that gave them their name. Over a thousand of their band had had their throats cut by Bin's raiders while Bay Ivan was at the party. Many were disarmed in the first onslaught and offered a chance to rally to the Reds, and were then cut down in cold blood when they refused to desert their chief, Vin. Bay Ivan's reaction was swift and decisive. He sent the lieutenant who wrote letters for him, a young man named Lei I Hu Utai, dignified with the rank of private secretary to present his compliments to the French commander and to offer, if given arms and ammunition, to clear the Viet Minh out of his zone and maintain order. Furthermore, he agreed to support the French central government and accept the French Union. On his own, and without waiting for the French reply, the reprisals started. Not only did the attack on himself demand an accounting, but there was that matter of a thousand loyal friends with their throats cut. The reprisals were terrible, for the bank contact, the intelligence cells which were the eyes and ears and the executioners of Bay Ivan, spread like a net throughout the area occupied by the Viet Minh. Bay Ivan's intelligence cells were intact, and in one night they liquidated the entire network Nguyen Bin had so patiently erected. Each morning for weeks afterward the canals and arroyos around Saigon were cluttered with drifting bodies. No questions were asked by the French authorities. From that day, May 19, 1948, Bay Ivan was to remain an implacable foe of the communists. Picture him, for years he had been a thorn in the side of the French. Any Vietnamese arrested for nationalist activity who had no money for defense, sent a letter to Bay Ivan from hand to hand through the underground as soon as he entered prison. If money and a lawyer could not obtain his release, Bay Ivan, the pirate, the first-hand authority on prison deliveries, got him out. With every outwitting of the French his reputation had increased as a native Robin Hood. Now this same candid ex-pirate became the central pillar of the anti-communist fight in the Saigon area. On June 13, 1948, his adherence to the government was formally announced, 
and within two months over 800 guerrillas deserted the Viet Minh to join him. It was the beginning of the nationalist armed forces of the Binh Xuan, with a discipline and an esprit de corps such as has never been equaled since by any anti-communist force in Vietnam. The possibilities of this underground, forged and linked by the memories of so many years of danger together, surpassed the strictly military. A world of faceless agents, hideouts, arms caches, friends and associates that no one knew or suspected, infiltrators with their own lines running through every level and business, in sum, spies, collectors and executioners with their secret signs and passwords came with the Bing Xuan. It was the age-old secret society of Asia, with all the attributes of a modem arm and political party under a born leader. The leader of such a secret society can do anything. Lost in the immense ocean of Asian humanity, he enriches whom he pleases and kills those with whom he is at war. Bay Ivan was at war with the Viet Minh, and he conducted it more efficiently than they did, as his survival attests. Into the French fold, after Bay Ivan, came the Ho Hao and the Cao Dai in turn, the two sects Nguyen Binh had irrevocably alienated by killing the leader of the former and trying to subjugate the latter. Saigon, for all its French veneer, was a sprawling, dirty, oriental agglomeration of humans. When this anthill was turned over to Bay Ivan and his auxiliary police it followed that he would tax its inhabitants in his fashion. He would naturally know what the dishonest citizens were up to and whether or not the honest ones were threatened. All this was accepted with oriental fatalism. Those living in steaming rabbit warren alleyways or passing their lives on junks had never known anything else, and under the Viet Minh it had been infinitely worse. Since the money Bay Ivan collected was used to support the army that outfought, outschemed and outmassacred the communists, that army was really self-supporting, the only one the American taxpayer was not required to keep in luxury. Two years after Bay Ivan's turning against the Nambo, which is to say in 1950, the Grand Mund, the great gambling center in Kolon, the Chinese city, became his monopoly, but hereafter the name Bay Ivan was to disappear. Bay Ivan passed with the outlaw, to be replaced by Le Van Van, the respectable general, who cultivated the friendship of the Emperor Bao Dai after Bao Dai's return. In April 1954 Lei Hu Sang, brother of the private secretary whom Van had sent as negotiator to the French, was named chief of the Shuit, so successfully did the Bing Xuan operate their anti-red cleanup, and overnight from auxiliaries the Bing Xuan became the police. Le Van Van's forces were not over 3,000 men at the time, but they were devoted to him. And though Vin's loyalty to Bao Dai was probably based on self-interest when their strange friendship started, no one can deny that in the crucial test it was sincere. Such was the series of events that brought Le Van Vin, after 1953, to leadership of a coalition including the Ho Hao and the Cao Dai, and his emergence as a political power. All this was made possible by the acquisition of the Grand Mund, for who ruled the Grand Mund, ruled Saigon and Kolon. 500,000 piastres a day came out of the Grand Mund's neon-lit gambling halls and taxi dance floors for the French tax collectors alone, to say nothing of unofficial graft that would carry the figure into millions. The economic power of the man who ruled the Grand Mund and with it colon and its some 600,000 Chinese, holding in their hands the distribution system of Vietnam, was considerable. It all accrued to Le Van Van, the square-headed, powerful chief with fierce eyes, protruding jaw, and muscles that reminded one of a panther, the man who loved animals, kept pet crocodiles and tigers, yet ordered Nguyen Bin's local committee wiped out with the calmness of a chess player moving a pawn. Chinese merchants paid Le Van Van for every truck they sent out of Saigon, but the money went to pay his personal troops who patrolled the long road all the way to Cape Street Jacques over which their merchandise travelled. Gradually Le Van Van's business interests expanded. With the capital at his disposal he developed the lumber industry in forest regions he had cleared of the reds. Charcoal producing plants were set up as a by-product. He built slaughterhouses, ran fleets of fishing and transport junks with one hand and opened markets for the fishermen with the other. 
Soon he had his own bus lines fanning out, and no one attacked them. He became a principal negotiator for the Bank of Indochina. The flood of piastres permitted him to recruit more troops and improve the living conditions of the followers on whom his power was built. Leadership of the famous Popular Front, with the Ho Hao and Cao Dai sects which we have mentioned, provided a party to serve as a political arm. Through it he was to become a national leader, moving into distant provinces, forming branches, absorbing older groups and, with the same genius for administration he had shown as an illiterate leader of ruffians in the swamp, forming a political military organization capable of stabilizing Cochin China. And this is the country to which America sent Colonel Edward Lansdale to teach guerrilla warfare. First communist reaction to Bay Ivan's rallying to the French and transition from outlaw to public servant as General of Anvan, was a peremptory summons from the Tongbo, the dread committee surrounding Ho Chi Minh, for General Nguyen Bin to present himself. As for the Cao Dai, it was French General Leitoua who approved bringing into the war against Ho Chi Minh the private army of the Cao Dai Pope. The Viet Minh were like water, they were everywhere and nowhere. The country was their sponge, and Leitoua decided to wrest a cleared space from the fluid enemy. Leitoua had informers by the thousands. The intelligence service of the French army spent piastres by the millions. Information was exchanged and traded on a regular market, but most of it was false. The truth was too dangerous. Leaks invariably led to the honest informers getting his throat cut. So in 1948 the same Cao Dai forces that had in 1945 embarked on a massacre of the French at the behest of the Japanese, were brought into the fight as allies against the Viet Minh. In 1945 the Japanese had armed the Cao Dai and moved their flying columns into Saigon when defeat became inevitable. Cao Dai leaders never doubted for a minute that if all the foreigners in Cochin China had their throats cut, the country would fall to them. The screams that punctuated that frightful night in the spring of 1945, in Saigon will never be forgotten by the Europeans who survived it. Yet the Cao Dai Pope seemed such a gentle little man when one sipped tepid champagne with him at ten in the morning. He was known as His Holiness, Pope Pham Kongta. Beside him, in immense dignity with his flowing beard, sat the Bao Dao, defender of the faith. The last time the author visited them in their place of exile in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Incredible as it may seem, within thirty years the religion that started with experiments in spiritualism by a bored civil servant named Ngavanch, whiling away his time with table wrapping in an isolated island post in the Gulf of Siam became a national force. The world of the little Vietnamese is inhabited by strange spirits. Everywhere about him is a sense of mystery and before the mystery his impulse is to band together with other Vietnamese to form a brotherhood bound by inner secrets expressed in obscure symbols. Because the all-seeing eye became one of the symbols of the Cao Dai sect, students of occult societies have attempted to link Vietnam's powerful sect with older orders and offshoots of the Illuminati. Actually, to do so is to accord it a genealogy it does not have. The men who sat around Ngavanch's table in 1919 while he communicated with the spirits by means of the Korblebeck, a primitive, beak-shaped gadget holding a pencil which in the hands of the adept communicated the daily message, were minor functionaries with at least rudimentary French educations. Victor Hugo was the literary giant of their class, so it was only natural that he should communicate with them. The symbol of the all-seeing eye was familiar to them. They had read of the Grand Orient Lodge of the Freemasonry in their French history. Long before the master with whom they were in contact identified himself on Christmas Eve of 1925 as Cao Dai, the pure August One, the oldest of the Buddhas, Sakyamuni and Jesus Christ, which had plundered the Grand Orient of its symbol, without any deep knowledge of that secret lodge or any other. Wench got back to Saigon his first important convert was a hard drinking, wildly gambling reprobate named Levantrung, who overnight threw himself into Kaudaism with such fervor that he seized its direction from Ch. Trung became the sect's first pope. Till his death, or disincarnation in Kaudai phraseology, in 1934, the sect never ceased to expand. 
Then came Pham Kong Tak, the former customs official. Asia was in a state of flux. The Nake, the toiling little man of Asia's human ant hills, was rejecting many of his old superstitions. And Pope Pham Kong Tak was a genius at administration. His discipline and leadership hardened the organization. Disjointed bands had protected the sect against incursions by Viet Minh guerrillas and the French. Pham Kong Tak welded them into an army, the only army outside the Viet Minh that possessed all the elements necessary for a crusade, a mysticism, an ideal, a large following, a cohesive organization and courageous fighters. In sum, an instrument of domination. And Khao Dai ambitions were boundless. To push ahead, to gain more strength, to possess more followers, to control more ground, to acquire more wealth, by duplicity, treachery, brutality or religion, was their aim. Political organizations were suppressed by the French police, but police were powerless against a religion. Under Pope Pham Kong Tak the Khao Dai followers bled the Japanese for money as a special auxiliary force. Prince Konda, a cousin of Bao Dai, was brought back from Japan to serve as a puppet, and the Khao Dai were hired to acclaim him. Without a qualm they swung over to Kongdu as long as the money lasted. From the Japanese they swung to the Viet Minh, till the Viet Minh threatened the Khao Dai Pope, then they became the allies of the French, and their holy see of Tain In, with its great Ki Dai temple, became a pillar in the anti-Viet Minh struggle. Delirious bands, impervious to danger and fighting as though under a hypnotic spell, outfought the Chidoys, sectors, of the Viet Minh wherever they found them. Soldiers of the Pope were suicides from the moment they started. They killed, and died as they killed, as though life were of no importance. If the French suffered an ambush, word was sent to the Khao Dai Pope and a flying brigade cleared the area. What they did with their prisoners the French never knew. Some were herded back in columns, closely guarded lest the Viet Minh try to liberate them. At the end of each column marched security officers. Between vehicles moved the shock troops. In the center came mortar bearers, accompanied by their ammunition coolies. Pushed on by bayonets were the prisoners, assassination squads of the Viet Minh. The villages they had terrorized henceforth belonged to the Khao Dai. On either side of the route of march, phantoms moved through the brush, scouts by the hundreds armed only with a hand grenade to protect the flanks and alert the column in the event of attack. Along the road an efficient alarm system operated. It was mass mysticism, moving with modern arms. When a French general could not find the enemy he had only to call on the Khao Dai Pope. A flying brigade would be dispatched, and in three months they would have a fort, the Viet Minh would be gone, wiped out to a man. The Nax, the country people, converted to Khao Daism, would be working as spies or toiling as Khao Dai slaves to feed and serve the new organization. Each time a Viet Minh drive threatened a pacified area, France's general later had only to give the Khao Dai a bit more money, a few more machine guns and Viet Minh implantation was succeeded by that of the Khao Dai. In the end the general realized that in areas where the Viet Minh had been, a new problem presented itself. Every youngster playing beside a road, every workman in a field, the woman selling produce or weaving a basket, the decrepit beggar lying beside a tree, every human being, no matter how young or old, how weak or humble was a link not only in the elaborate Khao Dai warning system against the Viet Minh but also against the French. When the general staff realized this, the delicate game of balance and counterbalance started. It was not by accident of geography that the Viet Minh claimed and were able to obtain the northern half of Vietnam while the southern half remained free. Had Ho Chi Minh succeeded in establishing communist power in the south as effectively as he had in the north, he could have claimed the whole country. That he failed was due as much to the three forces, Bing Xuyin, Khao Dai, and Ho Hao, we destroyed as it was to the French. Ho Hao guerrillas were the terror of the communists in western Cochin China and throughout the whole Mekong Delta and its waterways fanning out to the sea. Where the Ho Hao did not operate and where the French expeditionary force itself refrained from venturing in Cochin China 
the cow dissect ensured security. And in the labyrinth of Saigon's putrid quarters, as Raymond Cartier put it, the Bing Zhuin waged a ceaseless, bloody, ferocious war, killing the Viet Minh like a terrier exterminating rats, while DM left his dear country at the first sound of a cannon and prepared to return with the superb dogmatism and understanding of political human realities acquired in exile. There is no doubt that Le Van Van desired to rise above his past and acquire respectability. Had he and his Bing Zhuin not turned against the Viet Minh, Cartier reflected, no one dares think of what we would have done to maintain order in Saigon. There were those who did dare pose that question, and the alternative they saw was a Saigon terrorized by Nguyen Bin. Chapter 7 Nguyen Bin and the Ho Hao? Nguyen Bin was not his real name. It is doubtful that anyone knows what it was. He first attracted attention as a young incorrigible, distinguishing himself by lawlessness and assuming, before the countless police who had caused to arrest him, the name of the village in Upper Tonkin where he was born. And as Nguyen Bin he conducted his war against society. In his teens he worked as a laundryman on a messageries maritimes boat. At twenty he was sent to Palokindor prison for revolutionary activity, and this prison, the Alcatraz of Indochina, contained the most cunning, ruthless communists Russia ever trained to spread revolution. The Bin learned the technique of what was to become his life work. In 1934, on his release, he contacted the underground cell leaders for whom the hardened veterans on the inside had given him messages. The underground dispatched him to a chief in Canton who in turn passed him on to comrades training military and political leaders in the Wampo school of the Kuomintang. When the Kuomintang ceased to please him, Bin moved to Moscow and there, through World War H, he worked with the Russians. A point to bear in mind as one studies everything the cyan willed murderer did thereafter is that in Bin we find the perfect example of the tool of the Russians, able to say in all honesty that he was never a communist. Von Guayan Bin, to the end, never belonged to the party. It was always as a nationalist, that shining, overworked word, that he worked. When the time was ripe, Moscow dispatched him on a mission to Ho Chi Minh in Indochina, back to the country of his birth. It was in 1945, and Ho Chi Minh sent him south to a post near the river Bin had last sailed down as a laundry man, with full powers to organize and direct a war. The murderous guerrilla killings in forests and dry paddies that took their toll on France for the next nine years until Pierre Mendes France ceded the honor of protecting Indochina to the Americans, was the work of Nguyen Bin and the machine he perfected. The real communist overlords were in the north with Uncle Ho, the idol of Newsweek's Harold Isaacs and the long line of OSS majors proudly bearing Uncle Ho's autographed gold cigarette cases, but Ho and General Jayap with their Tongbo Council and their commissars, were far off, names to those in the south. Nguyen Bin, with his sun helmet, his dark glasses and a Colt revolver in a holster on his hip, was the nationalist designated to be communism's warlord in Cochin China. Between 1945 and 1948, when he set his trap for Bay Ivan and committed the unpardonable sin, he set up a trap and failed, Bin murdered more people, with more brutality, than any oriental since Genghis Khan and did it as America's protégé as well as Ho Chi Minh's and the Russians. His base, from the start, was a constantly moving one, in the same plane of junks where he tried to kill Bay Ivan, at the very gates of Saigon. Fanatic, cruel, generous when he wanted to be and pitiless when there was no political reason to be otherwise, Bin drove himself as mercilessly as his men. His first move in Cochin China was to form an elite guard. Armed with the best automatic weapons Ho Chi Minh had received from the Americans in the first days of our anti colonialist crusade. Radio communications equipment was forthcoming from the same source. And around him formed the inevitable nucleus of communist government, the Nambo, which was the southern equivalent of the Tongbo surrounding Ho. Under Nguyen Bin, until his work was accomplished and the Tongbo ready to liquidate him, 
the Nambo exercised almost complete autonomy from the Red Council in the north. Yet only once, at the beginning of his career under Ho, did Bin ever protest a Red Order. It was in 1944, at Hanoi, while Bin was being groomed for the Southern Command. He and Jayap were systematically massacring the old anti-French terrorists who had inspired Bin in his youth, men of the Yen Bay Uprising in 1930 and all the battles of the period of Bin's apprenticeship in what the Ruzi versions were to dignify as nationalism. Listen, General Jayap said to him, you are an intelligent nationalist. You must stand with us, even though we liquidate the comrades of your youth. We have to do this because they are potential traitors. You knew these men when they were heroes. Now they are nothing, they have been outpaced by history. Yet, because they accomplished something years ago, they want power. They are not worth it. So to get power there is only one thing they can do, they will collaborate, either with the Kuomintang or the French. They have to go. Once Bin was brought to accept this reasoning he was fit for anything. His capital in the plain of junks became an invisible city. Everything was mobile, his camp, printing presses, arsenals for making crude rifles, bombs and grenades. Bamboo built equipment for whole crafts and industries could be dismantled, piled in junks and transported through a labyrinth of canals and drainage passages to another reed hidden mound of earth at a moment's notice. A constant stream of messengers, spies, assassins, Political commissars and tax collectors scurried between Saigon and wherever Bin's headquarters happened to be. In Bin's eyes, as with all revolutionaries basing their power on terror whether in Algeria or Cochin China, no man had a right to be neutral. If he is neutral, kill him. Suspicion, whether or not supported by a shred of proof, led to execution. Each day Bin's underground transmitter voice of the Nambo spread hate and terror in Saigon by reading the list of names of those marked for assassination. His posters, pamphlets, sheets and whole newspapers circulated through Saigon at night. His administrative organization divided Cochin China into three parts, in the eastern section were the rubber plantations, the jute plantations and grape producing domains in the forest. Nothing that would or could produce tax money was destroyed. In the West he milked the rice producers. In the center of his world lay Saigon, Colon, and the Plain of Junks, and here Bin's Ministry of Finance, headed by himself, with a bookkeeping system as meticulous as any banks, collected taxes and operated on the open market, providing the bulk of revenue necessary to keep Helkaiman happy in the north and support six regular regiments in the Saigon area. When one considers the grip of Bin's organization in the very heart of what was French Indochina, then the dumping of the whole problem of trying to cope with this force into the lap of Levanvin and his ex-pirates becomes understandable. And in spite of the murders, the pitiless shakedowns and the brutalities, the little people admired Nguyen Bin, for the Oriental worships strength even when it expresses itself in the form of cruelty and its victim may be himself. The early months of 1947 were Bin's high spot. But in spite of his authoritarianism three groups escaped control, the Ho Hao waged war on him, while the Cao Dai sect and the Bin Xuyin, though cooperating as tax collectors, refused to yield an inch of their independence. The idea of insubordination and the possibility of treason became an obsession with Bin. In this fanaticism he cut down the best of his lieutenants because of thoughts he fancied they were hiding in their minds. This was when he decided to break the Ho Hao by assassinating their leader, Hein Fu So. A massive mountain range rears itself in Lower Cochin China, where for years convicts, rebels, hermits, philosophers and anyone wishing safety or seclusion fled for refuge. This is called the Seven Mountains area and the superstitious accord it a mystic power. In the early twenties Hein Fu So, the son of a village notable, went there to cure himself of epileptic fits. Living in a cave with a hermit he spent his days in meditation, prayer and repentance. In 1926 the hermit died and Hein Fu So, or Hein, as we shall call him, went down from the mountain, 
cured of his epilepsy but completely mad. He was emaciated and his unkempt hair hung to his shoulders. Wandering from village to village he preached to the Naks, as Indochina's teeming millions are called. Within the depths of the Naks, with their superstitions and their macabre dreams of a continual dance of death, he struck a chord. In his trances he preached of a renovated Buddhism but talked of a devastating war in which the European would be defeated. Whether or not he was in the pay of the Japanese at this time is uncertain. Later they were to advance him and use him. One night in 1939 he came out of one of the fitful trances that inspired wonder and admiration in the ignorant Nax who watched him, and proclaimed that a revelation had come to him, he was die living God. Through Chor Duke, Cantho and the Long Zuine areas his preachings spread. Peasants, small landowners and tradespeople prostrated themselves before him. Soon his power spread to Rachchia and Mitho and his followers numbered a million as he wandered, performing miracles and healing the sick. What they did not know was that the Japanese were giving him the quinine he put in potions to reduce their fevers. As his reputation grew his messages became more terrible. In his wake trailed a stream of monks he was training to spread his word. As the Japanese star descended he began acquiring arms for his followers and a new note appeared. The faithful must wipe out their enemies. Anyone who killed ten Frenchmen would go straight to heaven, but the Viet Minh, being infidels, were enemies also. In the frenzy of their death cult, Heinz converts ambushed French convoys to get more arms so that they could kill Frenchmen on one hand and communists on the other. The Viet Minh held the villages in the Ho Hao the rice paddies, and between them blood flowed like water. In Cantho, the great rice market on the Mekong River, Nguyen Binh's tribunal sent thousands of Ho Hao to death with a bullet in the back of the head. Thousands more were thrown into the river with their arms bound behind them. Through it all, Hein escaped in seemingly miraculous ways, which supported his claim to being immortal. Any faithful who killed ten Viet Minh, he proclaimed, would mount directly to a paradise superior to that reserved for killers of Frenchmen. Alienation of the Ho Hao was the first of Bin's great mistakes. For two years this butchery went on, then Bin decided to rectify his error in the only way that was natural to him. In April 1947 he sent the living God a message of friendship, saying, Come to me in the plain of junks. Let us embrace and stop this fratricidal struggle and unite against the French. With the message was a safe conduct. Hein saw opening before him a golden opportunity to convert the Viet Minh. Some say that he was cut in two by a burst of machine gun fire as he entered Bin's camp. Others claim Bin dragged out his victory, then lopped off Hein's head with a scimitar, the military symbol of his sect. In the months that followed there was no attempt to avenge Hein's death, for his followers were convinced that he was immortal. His generals under the redoubtable Tran Van Sio I, were embarrassed. They knew there had been an ambush, but they were at a loss as to how to deal with the religious side of the affair. It was at that time that the French took stock of the situation. The Ho Hao were capable of savagery, but in the manner of children. Their ferocity was an uncomplicated, natural thing. Better to treat them as naive children and forgive the past. After all, as guerrilla warriors they were second to none. What if their religion had degenerated into an anarchy of schisms and their military forces into feudal armies under generals who regarded them as personal prerogatives? The blunt fact remained that Tran Van Sio I had cleared the Viet Minh from western Cochin China. A French officer named Campody took his life in his hands and walked into the Ho Hao camp to open negotiations. Overnight they became respectable and insatiable as French allies, financed, equipped and heaped with honors. One of their fiercest leaders was a frail consumptive named Bacut, who had hacked off his index finger in front of his troops to show how he would cut off the heads of Frenchmen. Back in Hanoi the Tongbo was dissatisfied with the senseless alienation of such warriors. From that moment Nguyen Bin was on thin ice. Perhaps it was to redeem himself that he attempted the same ruse against Bayavan a year later, but this time he went too far.
for along with the error of driving an enemy of the French into forming an alliance with them, he made the unforgivable mistake of failing. A committee was sent south by the Tongbo to judge Bin in his own camp. With the frightful coldness of Marxist reasoning and precision they charged him with failing to analyze the situation correctly, with giving in to egotism and by his own self-intoxication, risking the ultimate victory of the people. Bin went through the painful process of auto-criticism. He admitted his errors and begged forgiveness. And since his work was not yet finished they spared him, but the next three years of his life were a nightmare. He was as inextricably caught in the merciless machine as the humblest Nakay in his ranks. One by one his comrades were weeded out, liquidated, to be replaced by a new man sent by the Tongbo. Always it was to improve the efficiency of the machine, and the executioner was always Nguyen Bing. At last, in 1951 the time came when he could no longer satisfy his masters. They summoned him to appear in Hanoi before the Tongbo. For weeks he stalled. At last he started, only to be killed by the French along the way. There were those in the expeditionary corps who suspected that the tip-off which reached their hands was sent by Ho and Jayap themselves. Having been intercepted by a French column was a more satisfactory method of execution, for the man was still an idol to many in the south. He had spilled so much French blood there, and this, to the Vietman of Cochin China, was the measure of his greatness. Chapter 8 The Government America Supported October 10, 1954, was the date set for French withdrawal from Hanoi, capital of North Vietnam. It brought a horde of refugees to the south. First there were the Catholics, herded in a mass exodus by their priests, then the Buddhists and after them in the ever-increasing flood went hundreds more who for one reason or another dreaded to face life under the Reds. The American Navy transported thousands to their new homes in the south, and the French Air Force plied back and forth in a shuttle service, evacuating thousands more. Eight years later a French commandant who supported his friends and was charged with refusing to abandon Muslims who had served with them in Algeria, was still seared by the memory of what he had seen in Indochina. As our boat pulled away, taking us out to the ship in the harbor, he testified, I watched Vietnamese women wade after us, hold their babies up to soldiers in the boats and then, deliberately, slide under the water and drown, and I swore that I would never take part in such betrayal again. By January of 1955 this human wave was at its height, a trek of misery which, Though they had nothing to do with it, the remote men in Independence Palace and his family were to exploit propaganda-wise in America, and politically at home, for years to come. Either because his unstable temper happened to be lashing out at the French at the time, or because his American apologists needed a whipping boy to blame for the growing opposition against him, D.M. chose the moment when the plight of the fleeing refugees was most desperate to go into one of his tirades and demand that the French Air Force halt its airlift. Discontent was rife, but again American agents on the spot interpreted each new warning sign of impending trouble in a way that would support what they were out to sell. Freedom was what the Vietnamese wanted, but instead of freedom increasing with independence, each passing week made the old days look better. Yet the American team had a ready answer, it fanned the hate campaign against the departing colonialists. And said everything would be all right as soon as the standard of living was raised and the colonialists were gone. This meant more American aid wrung out of patient Americans for a people who were hitherto satisfied with what they had, since they had never known anything better but who were soon destined to become bitter complainers at the sight of a favored few becoming rich while they remained poor. From the first, each estimate given us of cause and effect was false, but the evil geniuses responsible seemed to thrive on errors. Under President Truman two empires outside of but paralleling the Department of State became firmly rooted. They were out Central Intelligence Agency and a burdensome Foreign Aid Administration. Then came Eisenhower, who added the United States Information Agency. Each administration felt itself duty-bound to make government more top-heavy by adding another empire. Under Kennedy it was the Peace Corps, 
touted as volunteers to teach backward peoples to plant trees and thatch roofs, but by August 1964, openly advertising itself in Reader's Digest as spreaders of the modern revolution. In Vietnam each of the parallel organizations we installed soon equaled, man for man, the personnel in our overswollen embassy. And every eager beaver in the ponderous, overlapping services was out to play kingmaker on one hand and on the other to assure America that things were going well. For the South Vietnamese things were not going well at all. For one thing, after taking over the army DM and Nu tightened their grip too suddenly. Already the Cao Dai Pope and the leaders of the Ho Hao regretted their venality and wished they could backtrack to the days of General Hin. But it was too late. In February 1955, one of the military pillars on which they depended, General Trinh Minh the of the Cao Dai, was enticed, with some two million dollars for bait, to move into DM's camp with 2,500 of his personal followers. By mid-March the night arrests and rumors of kidnappings and assassinations could no longer be ignored. To the nation clamoring for freedom, while we promised better living standards and proceeded to enrich those who were important as yes men, a truth became evident, under a tyrant who uses an army as a political force, only armed opposition is possible. So the Vietnamese turned back once more to the old national front of the Binh Xuyên and the sects, the same coalition that could have saved them seven months before when they had the army with them, had the sects not sold out for American money. Time magazine's account of this second crisis in its famous DM biography number of April 4, 1955, should be held up to irate America when the grim reckoning comes. It is typical of the managed news which magazine buyers were given when the nation cried for information. The Bing Zuin, erroneously described as a sect, and its two allies were denounced as nothing more than an exotic consortium of religious fanatics, feudal warlords, uniformed hoodlums and racket bosses bound loosely behind an ambitious general who keeps pet crocodiles. Time told Americans that these groups, deprived of the subsidies and prerogatives accorded them by the French colonials, had become dangerous. It was that simple. Time evoked indignation by adding that such a bunch had dared deliver an ultimatum to the man we were backing. Reorganize your government within five days. Replace it with one that is suitable, they had said. An honest reporter would have told what sort of government the Vietnamese were rejecting, and a thinking public would have asked. Let us turn a spotlight on the rubber stamp ministers DM and his brother brought together to form what CBS correspondent Peter Callisa in his Collier's Magazine article of July 6, 1956, called DM's Broad National Revolutionary Movement. At the top of the pyramid, as Premier and Minister of the Interior, National Police, sat DM himself. He impressed no one as a man of destiny, Peter Callissa said of him. As a matter of fact he wasn't, but a chimpanzee with a million and a half American dollars a day behind him could not fail to survive. Brother Nu held no official post. He and his wife exerted influence in their own ways from the wings on the unstable ascetic who posted a sign saying women keep out on his office door. A psychiatrist once attributed DM's misogynism to impotency. Whatever the reason, he was uneasy in the presence of all women save the iron-willed sister-in-law who alternately terrorized him with her tempers and cajoled him as a mother would a small boy, patting his face and straightening his tie. The cabinet fanned out below the family was heavily weighted with men of undeniable communist sympathies and connections. The ministers who did not have pro-communist backgrounds were generally inept non-entities. There were two ministers of state. The posts were lucrative without carrying any power. Tran Van Sio I, the old Ho Hao general with the fierce moustache, and Ngu Ain Than Fuong, the Cao Dai general who had been bought off with him were still enjoying the honor of being addressed as Excellency. When the ultimatum was delivered, when DM had no further need for them they were arrested and stripped of what they had amassed by playing ball. There was a difference, however, the money received when they betrayed their fellow nationalists had been paid by America, when it was confiscated, it was returned to Ngo Din Nu. The Minister of Foreign Affairs was Tran Van Du, Madame Kiwong's brother-in-law 
but he resigned during the crisis and was replaced by Vu Van Moore, a northerner and former supporter of the Viet Minh who returned from abroad to accept a post in the cabinet. Two meaningless posts of Secretary of State for the Interior were created for Hein Van Hem, representing the Ho Hao, and Ngu Ain Gok Kak, representing the Khao Dai. Both were unknowns and a year later were under arrest. The Minister of National Defense, Mr. Ho Thong Min, who was soon to flee to Paris, was a former army supplier for Ho Chi Minh. Mr. Tran Trung Dung, the son-in-law of DM's sister, occupied the defense ministry as the April 1955 crisis approached. Dung's sister followed Madame Nu's example and made a good thing out of selling export licenses and purchasing properties from Europeans whom she had frightened into selling, at a fraction of the value of their property, by having her brother sign an army requisition order for their homes. When his sister had closed a deal, Dung released the property. The Minister of National Economy was replaced in mid-1956 by Ngu Ain Gokthou, whom Ngu Ain Van Tam had arrested on October 25, 1945, as a communist. Tho was ambassador to Japan until DM arbitrarily made him both vice president of the country and minister of economy. His son, menacing students as leader of the Viet Minh Students Association in Paris, was in constant communication with his father. As Minister of Economy, Tho had hanging over him the problem of getting ready cash for a government that leaked like a sieve, and his solution for doing this is generally conceded to have emanated from the sharp brain of Madame Nu. Putting the ideas of Nu and his wife into practice was what ministers were for. Tho signed an order requiring a heavy deposit from all firms applying for import-export permits. Such permits went through the hands of Nu and his wife. The amount demanded forced all but the biggest firms out of business. When DM's 1956 nationalization decrees, forcing the Chinese to become Vietnamese citizens or lose their property, paralyzed the economy, the importers in turn were forced to the wall and demanded their deposits back. Those deposits had already gone into somebody's account. Not a cent was repaid and a wave of suicides followed. The Saigon newspaper Dan Chung reported in February 1958 that a cloth merchant, unable to meet his bills because of Tho's old decree, had poured gasoline over himself and applied a match, burning himself alive in a place known as La Pointe des Blaggers, point of the jokesters. No American paper reported it, the bankrupt Chinese had no press. Imports piled up in customs sheds. Merchants were unable to bail it out, and business ground to a standstill. Rumors of exchange speculation and wholesale graft in the government's exchange of new banknotes for the old currency undermined confidence in the piastre. When the Chinese were barred from rice distribution, rice prices soared. Asia's economy is based on the rice standard, and a leader's popularity is based on the price of rice. With mixed emotions, Sympathy for Tho bred of the main in the streets hatred of the president's brother, and contempt for Tho for remaining in such a government, Saigon citizens repeated stories concerning his treatment by DM's family. Gnu was said to have slapped Tho's face for refusing to sign an export permit at less than the customary kickback. In any government the Minister of Public Works disposes of the first requisite for acquiring a political following, that is, he disposes of jobs. And if his patronage provides his entourage with a living, it also permits him to know how much each henchman, down to the lowest pick and shovel worker, is making and, accordingly, how much he can be made to kick in. The money for public works in South Vietnam, it goes without saying, came from American aid, through the hands of an American aid administrator named Vu Van Thai a high communist lieutenant until the Geneva Accord of 1954. The public works minister was Mr. Tran Le King, a former Ho Chi Minh collaborator who had served as president of the Association of Viet Minh Students in France. King replaced Tran Van Bach when Bach became implicated in the rice scandal. 
General Levanvin's intelligence service reported that the smooth functioning of Keng's works program was due to a hokaim in order that there be no trouble lest attention be drawn to the whole setup and a scrutiny launched which might reveal that a red cell was being supported by US aid. Those unable to get in on public works graft, or resentful over its being run by a former hokaim in lieutenant, were afraid to talk, for reasons which we will make clear. The American aid administrator working hand in hand with Ken was, as we have mentioned, Mr. Vu Van Tai. Tai accompanied DM to America in early 1957. In mid-1957 he made franc exchange available to pay for a printing job in Paris handled by Mintan Press, a communist printing plant at 7 Rue Gonigord. Mintan Press was run by Vu Van Tai's old comrade in arms. Nguyen Gokpik, the communist engineer who sabotaged bridges in Cochin China for Ho Kaiman during the war against the French. Vu Van Tai flew to America on October 3, 1958, to talk to high State Department and foreign aid officials in Washington. Other talks followed at Michigan State University concerning assistance, propaganda and advisors, being furnished Vietnam by that institution. May name of the mission however, was more money, in lump sums. No mention of this trip was made in the American press. Officials controlling such information were well acquainted with Ver Van Tai's record, in 1960 Tai became Harvard's authority on Vietnam and Vietnamese observer at UN, where he remained until supplanted by Madame Kiwong, when Madame Kiwong was edged out of Saigon by her daughter. The credit office chief in the American aid section of the National Bank was immediately above Vu Van Tai in Vietnam's hierarchical structure, for all that Tai was the minister. The credit office chief was Albert Pham Gok Thao, whose unsavory record was second only to that of DM's Minister of Information. Before the Geneva Accord of 1954, Thao was Ho Chi Minh's intelligence chief in Cochin, China. In 1949 he married a militant communist sister of the well-known Viet Minh professor, Pham Th. Thao's father openly headed the Viet Minh League in Paris while Thao's brother, Gaston, worked as Ho Chi Minh's right-hand man in Hanoi. It was through Thao and his brother Gaston that DM's brother Nu maintained contact with the Viet Minh through the years of America's great delusion from 1954 to 1964. Along with his credit office job, Thao also headed Nu's secret police a position for which his years with Ho Chi Minh eminently fitted him. Every business office, every ministry, every group, and practically every household had within it somewhere a new agent, informing on his neighbors, his superiors and his fellow workmen. No man dared make a move or breathe a word that might be distorted by an informer seeking to gain face and advancement. Nationalists claimed that Thou, with his 1946 to 1954 communist intelligence experience and contacts to draw on, was able to track down, imprison and ruin any non-communist opposition to DM. At the same time he frustrated their attempts to rally deserters from the Red Camp. Those wishing to quit Ho Chi Minh and go home were discouraged from doing so by the spectacle of their friends being arrested by Thao and other former communists in DM's government the minute they returned for acts they had committed while under the orders of those same men. Through 1961 Joe Allsop was to eulogize Albert Pham Gok Thao in his columns. See for example Allsop's columns in the European edition of the New York Herald Tribune for April 11th, 12th. 14th and 18th of 1961. Not until the eve of Nu's assassination did all Sop ever admit that the brothers Ngotin were in contact with Ho Chi Minh, and then too was with the explanation that Nu had changed, that bad treatment by the Americans and knowledge that we were about to dump him forced him in desperation to try to negotiate with the Reds behind our backs. It should now be clear why no Vietnamese dared express disapproval of the Minister of Public Works. The post of Secretary of State for the Presidency was filled by Nhu Anh Dinh Thu, a northerner friend of DM's nephew, after Nguyen Hu Chau was forced to flee to Deville, France, for trying to divorce Madame Nhu's sister on grounds of adultery, 
a matter on which Madame knew forestalled repetition in the future by outlawing divorce as soon as she gained admittance to the National Assembly. All that anyone knew of Lamalatrin, the new Minister of the Interior, whom D. M. named to take pressure off himself was that as a magistrate he had been in trouble for misappropriating funds. Tranchanthan, the Minister of Propaganda and Information who replaced Famgzu Antai, the Kao Dai, had administered justice for the Viet Minh in 18 provinces before 1954, and had done it so brutally that his name was still used to frighten children. Than's wife was up to her neck in business deals with Madame Nu. The Minister of Education, then Hugh there, confided that he would like to get out but was afraid to because of Ngo Din Nu. There was no particular grievance against Ha Van Vuong, the Minister of Finance, except that he was an unknown northerner holding a post which the southerners regarded as rightly theirs. Vuong succeeded an earlier, unpopular appointee named Tran Hu Huong. On the other hand, the Agriculture and Agrarian Reform Ministry was occupied by Le Van Dong, who was a southerner with no qualifications for the job and who had a scandalous private life against him. The Minister of Reconstruction and Planning came from central Vietnam and was a shining example of the cabinet time defended. He was Hung Hung, a former Vietman who had studied to be an architect. Ngu Ayn Van Tam told this author that, when he was Director General of National Security, he once raided Hung's home and found the cellar used for a Viet Minh arms cache. After loading a truck with guns and communist tracts, Tam decided to investigate the house next door, which Hung had built on his property and rented to a friend. The friend turned out to be Le Van Lam, a leading Saigon terrorist for the Viet Minh. Revolvers cartridges and knives were found in the wall. On opening a closet which was filled with communist pamphlets, Tam heard a faint trapping. Behind a secret door in the back of the closet they found a rich Chinese drug manufacturer, owner of the Nithian Zhuang, Second Paradise, pharmacy, who was being held for ransom. So much for Hung Hung's qualifications as a planner. He replaced Ngu Ayn Van Tho I, the brother-in-law of DM's sister. If the reader's head is swimming as he peruses the descriptions of these ministers of government with their strange names, let him pause for a moment before he puts the whole confusing business out of his mind as not worth the effort. For that is just what the men to whom American conservatives looked for information did for nine long years, while South Vietnam rotted. One of the most respected columnists in Washington refused to look into the Vietnam picture. America isn't interested in what is happening out there, he protested. It was not true. America was devouring an ocean of newsprint on South Vietnam, tribe put out by the United States Information Service, the State Department, and the most despicable high-pressure public relations campaign ever put over on a civilized nation. But the men and publishers to whom thinking Americans looked for sound information would not make the mental effort to familiarize themselves with the area and its leaders so they could do an intelligent report. A host of questions present themselves as we note the indignation of time, April 4, 1955, that anyone should dare deliver an ultimatum to D.M., demanding he throw out his cabinet for we have scrutinized the cabinet DM's countrymen refuse to accept. The first question that rises, would time have cleared U.S. communist leader Eugene Dennis and the Rosenberg Atom spies for comparable posts in America? Then why did time campaign for DM's crew in South Vietnam? Why did time and the rest of our press hold up DM's supposed piety and honesty as a sheet to cover the thoroughly unhealthy structure beneath him? as though the claims to two virtues were sufficient arguments to accord the worst of associates a blanket acceptance. Chapter 9 The Beleaguered Man The Beleaguered Man sat in Freedom Palace, the time issue of April 4, 1955, glibly told a public longing desperately for assurance that somewhere we were winning. Pointedly Times Far East correspondent noted that a wooden crucifix, a picture of the Virgin, a slide projector, a gaudy spittoon, books entitled Social Justice and Thoughts of Gandhi were among the possessions about him. On the desk lay the ultimatum from the sects and the Bingzuin. 
An odd procession passed in and out of the palace doors for hours on end to deal with the crisis, three of the man's brothers, one in the cloth of a Roman Catholic bishop, his beautiful, politics-minded sister-in-law, U. S. Diplomats and U. S. Military officers in mufti, eye-rubbing ministers of state summoned from their sleep for emergency consultations. From the first, in a paragraph stacked to assure DM the sympathy of devout Catholics, all shades of liberals and lovers of the underdog, the reader was bound, tired and delivered. But analyze it, these three brothers and the politics-minded sister-in-law, there was the rub. One had to be in Saigon, or a conservative in Washington under the reign of the Kennedys, to appreciate the extent to which Vietnam was a family affair. The eye-rubbing ministers of state were window dressing, told to get out of bed and come and nod before the Americans. Accompanying the time report was a photograph showing presidential envoy Lawton Collins, assistant secretary of state Walter Robertson, Foster Dulles and DM, grinning from ear to ear. Time said that leaders were hard to find. Of course they were, with news secret police driving them into hiding. The French, striving to maintain by fair means and by sly means a remnant of influence and profit in the land they had exploited for seven decades, obstruct him, DM, with the wily rearguard maneuvers of colonialism, continued the time story. Such lines, popular as they were in America are likely to cost us dearly before our turn at the receiving end in South Vietnam is done. Time went on, a quick survey of the hinterlands showed that DM's nationalist regime could count on the electoral support of no more than a fourth of the villages. The rest leaned for communism, or at least leaned against the unknown, unproved regime in Saigon. If the Saigon regime was unknown, why go on with the pretext that anyone but the new social revolution liberals in Washington had foisted it on the country? And in that case why call it nationalist? Anything, it seemed, was justified by intimating that a portion of the two-thirds of the country admittedly against our man were communists. This made our abrogation of the right of self-determination democratic. Two pages later Times writer expressed Tran Van Du's resentment that the Vietnamese, whom DM had told not to fight the communists, were not consulted when the French made peace the previous year. Back in Saigon, DM found that he could not depend on a single Vietnamese battalion, he had nothing in the treasury, he could not make contact with about 85% of his villages, the paragraph continued. His advisers, including those from the U. S. cautioned him to go slowly. You are too weak to fight now, they counseled. Invite negotiations, play for time. The advice was accepted. While soldiers and tanks moved through the tense streets of Saigon, the Weanling government of the Weanling state of South Vietnam dickered and maneuvered to whittle down the warlords and the sects. Let us examine these recommendations for which you S. Advisors received praise. Put into plain language, what our men were saying was, with 85% of the country against you, you are too weak to fight. Take it easy, stall for time, promise reforms, tell your people anything that will lull them into believing you are going to give them representation, then knock them off one at a time. Such advice was unnecessary. DM had used ruses all his life. It was America's advising treachery, and approving of it, that time readers never considered, i.e. Van Van was given the soft soap treatment and told to forget the past, as though all were forgiven. D. M. Biasly proclaimed, in the same time report, clever maneuvers only betray, demoralize and divide the people. But he did as his American advisors suggested. No honest, factual article has been published to date on those Americans time lauded, and of their use of the unlimited bribing power of the American treasury to buy off the lieutenants of leaders who represented a majority of the nation and who could have strangled the Viet Minh in their areas had we permitted them. Time said, an Asian tradition has it that if one saves a man's life, one is henceforth responsible for his destiny. The U. S., in a sense, is lumping these two missions into one simultaneous undertaking in South Vietnam.
In addition to its millions and its prestige, Washington invested the talents of 1,000 Americans in the country, with the ex-Army Chief of Staff, General J. Lawton Collins, as the top U.S. emissary. Among them, for land reform, Wolf Ladajinsky, the celebrated agricultural department expert who did the land reform job in post-war Japan, for maneuvering against the communists, Colonel Edward Lansdale, the officer who played such a helpful role in the rise of Philippines President Ramon Magsays that Filipinos gave him a post-election title of General Landslide. Time neglected to mention that Russian-born Wolf Ladajinsky was booted out of his U.S. agricultural attaché job in Tokyo in 1954. He bought stock in a company the success of which was assured by American aid. As for Colonel Lansdale, the indignant snort talk sense is long overdue. By August 4, 1961, time had made Lansdale the Pentagon's guerrilla warfare expert who helped Magsays crush the Hux in the Philippines and advised Ngodin D.M. in his battle against the Bingzuine gang. Joe Alsop, in his memo for Otto Passman, September 24, 1962, called Lansdale one of the unsung heroes of the Cold War. What does he mean, unsung? Glowing writers by the score had boasted that Colonel Lansdale elected Magsays. What could be more insulting to a free people than to infer that their president would never have been elected without the aid of an American intruder? And certainly Magsays was in a bad way if he could not defeat the Hux without Ed Lansdale. Raymond Cartier wrote in the May 28, 1955, issue of Paris Match that the success of any new tri-party cooperation in South Vietnam would depend on DM's desire for cooperation. It demands also, Cartier continued, the dropping of the anti-French commando unit installed in the American embassy. The men that compose it have been drawn by the ardor of their game into excesses capable of cleaving a breach in Franco-American relations that will pass beyond the framework of Indochina. Here, in Saigon, they have provoked in their, French, expeditionary corps and civilian population resentment that is all the more significant since it follows the period of harmony that marked the mission of Ambassador Donald Heath. By anti-French commando unit installed in the American Embassy, Cartier was referring to Colonel Lansdale and General O'Daniel, and he added, the American team has set itself the task of building Vietnamese in a solidarity by cultivating nationalism and exciting all the animosities created by a century of unequal coexistence. On his return to America Lansdale was photographed with Alan Dulles, receiving the Distinguished Service Medal. For what? For doing for Russia in two years what millions of dollars and a decade of propaganda had failed to accomplish, making a hundred thousand bitterly anti communist French soldiers anti American? Jean Lartaguy, author of The Centurions, blasted Lansdale in Paris much as late as September 14, 1963, as one of those kingmakers of the American secret services. Cambodia credited its anti American sentiment to Edward Lansdale, who, for his services in Asia, was duly made Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense. Then a New Dealer naval officer named William Allederer and a liberal professor named Eugene Burdick wrote a book called The Ugly American, which got New Dealer Allederer advisory jobs with the Peace Corps and Reader's Digest. Mr. Allederer was asked if, as a naval officer, he was not afraid to write such a book. Not at all, he replied. We had clearance from the Pentagon. And why shouldn't he, since a good portion of the book was dedicated to the praise of Colonel Edward Lansdale, transparently disguised as Colonel Edwin Hillingsdale. In a short time Lansdale was made a Brigadier General, and the ugly American went through several editions. It was translated into foreign languages, distributed abroad by the U.S. Information Service and displayed in Moscow as part of an American cultural exposition. Americans should go back and reread The Ugly American, with their minds as well as their eyes. They were told that of all America's officers in the East only one had the courage and initiative to launch and win a one-man campaign to show the Filipinos that Americans are not all rich and snobs. Hillingsdale did it.
in full uniform as an American colonel and wearing his ribbons, he rode into a Philippine village on a motorcycle bearing a sign saying the ragtime kid, then played a harmonica in the gutter for a crowd of mouth-breathing loafers from whom he proceeded to bum the price of a meal. Mr. Lederer insulted America's intelligence. In the face conscious East, where respect is inextricably associated with dignity, the moment Colonel Hillingsdale descended to Cooley level he ceased to build up friendship or esteem for America. On the contrary he carried America down with him. From the Philippines Mr. Lederer's hero went to Southeast Asia, where he memorized files on politicians and even princes, and then astounded them by pretending to read the lines of their hands. All doors were opened to him, and a king asked to meet him. America's Edwin Hillingsdale single-handedly could have put over all the pet projects of our inepts who were using Southeast Asia as their playground had he not been thwarted by a jealous ambassador. Stop and think it over. What Lederer is saying in this book, in which the insult is compounded by our translating it into the dupe's own languages, is that Southeast Asians are a bunch of superstitious oafs whom Ed Hillingsdale made fools of and would have continued to play for suckers indefinitely if, to the disapproval of Messrs. Lederer and Burdick, our ambassador had not stopped him. Such were the actors in DM's camp and ours as the battle that was South Vietnam's last chance to shake off the unwanted family took shape. Americans were dependent on picture magazines for news as the clouds gathered. Life magazine's editorial of March 14, 1955, was headed Dulles in SE Asia and everything was fine. At that moment, if the truth had only been known, DM's friend, Nguyen Phuoc Dang, was flying to Bangkok on a personal mission to Thailand's strongman, P. Bil Songram, to arrange refuge and free passage for DM's family, if things went wrong. And Nu had started shipping out cases of money. What were you doing at this time? The writer asked General Levanvan. Did you know the clash was coming? We should have, Vin answered. After Hin was broken things were quiet for three months, while D. M. and Nu moved their henchmen into commands in the army, down to non-com level. He continued, toward the end of December, 1954, General O'Daniel started coming to see me. He begged me for a week to desert the sects and let DM wipe them out separately. I told him to be patient. A civil war would kill off men who were needed against the communists. Demilitarize the sects gradually, if you want to, I told him, but don't drive them into a civil war. Red carders are lying dormant in all the villages, and if you eliminate the sects you will have no one to contain them. Worse. You will drive the remnants of the Ho Ha and the Cow Die underground, where they will have to accommodate themselves with the Reds to survive. If you disband them, overnight, without giving them fair incorporation in the regular army, they will take to the hills and become bandits to make a living. Furthermore, you will alienate their provinces, where the people know that the sects alone stand between them and Ho Kai Ming. But you couldn't tea tell O Daniel anything, Le Van Van lamented with a palm up gesture of the hands. He was stubborn, and less intelligent than DM. I think DM would have been patient and followed the course I advised if O'Daniel had not pushed him. I had four talks with DM and more meetings with O'Daniel before the end of 1954. Each time I urged O'Daniel to dissuade DM from doing anything foolish, that it would only aid the communists. At the same time I knew O'Daniel was going to the Ho-How and Cowdai generals, trying to line them up against me. Above all, I begged him to restrain DM from taking the field against Bakut, the Ho-How general. Bakut was in revolt because DM wanted to disband his forces without making any provision for them. His demands were not unreasonable. He could have been brought back. I went up to Dalat to do some hunting in January 1955, and General O'Daniel asked General Ely, commander of the French troops in Vietnam, to send a plane for me. He wanted to see me. I had had enough of him and did not go. There was no point in trying to talk to a man who would not listen. At the same time I was under pressure from everyone around me to take steps to protect them against DM. 
I led the coalition and everyone kept telling me that only it could prevent DM from suppressing all opposition. At last I went to General Ely to ask his advice and he told me my fears were unfounded. He said he was responsible for preserving order and he would see that there was no civil war. That is how we happened to be caught off guard. Yet there was no lack of storm signals. The February 1955 defection of General Trinmini and his 2,500 personal Kaudai followers left his spiritual leader, Pope Pham Kongtak, dependent on General Nguyen Tham Phuong and his 25,000 troops. True, Trinmini had never been reliable. He was a sadistic butcher when the Kaudai were fighting the French, but as the first of the coalition generals to be bought out by DM's American team his defection was an indication of what was ahead. Trin Min there, according to Raymond Cartier, was paid two million dollars, more money than he had ever hoped for in his wildest dreams. Even with the bribing of Trin, which the American press heralded as a rallying, the scattered opposition leaders could not bring themselves to unite under one man. With the sword hanging over them, they continued to intrigue and undercut each other. Each wanted to be a leader and every man with enough friends to fill a cafe formed a party. By the end of February 1955, 37 opposition political parties were struggling for supremacy among themselves, instead of forming a solid front. Methodically, cunningly, DM picked out the strongest of the political parties and proceeded to cut it to pieces first. In the provinces, government troops swooped down on villages in a series of lightning raids against the Dai Viet Party. There were two immediate results from this, the Dai Viet moved closer to Le Van Vans United Nationalist Front for Protection. While on the visa US Ambassador Donald Heath had given him, Dr Nguyen Tun Hoan, the leader of the Dai Viet, traveled to Washington to tell his story. Hone left his wife and children in Saigon and took off, naively believing that all he had to do was explain the situation and our officials would rectify their mistakes. A strange, honest, hard-working idealist, was this Nguyen Tun Hone. He was a Catholic, though Bermintain in, the seat of the Kaudai sect, on May 1, 1917. The Japanese arrested him for a time in 1943. The following year they were after him again and he took shelter in the brush, in Cambodia. In 1946 came the attempted coup d'etat against Ho Chi Minh mentioned in a previous chapter, and Hon's flight to China. Back in Saigon in 1949 he founded the anti-communist league known as the Kwok Jai Lien Hip and as Minister of Youth Affairs from 1949 to 1951 he organized what he called disintoxication centers to educate communist youth. Hone had been told that Jeff Parsons was the architect of America's policy in Southeast Asia, but that Kenneth Todd Young, in the State Department, was the man to see, all of which was true as far as it went. What Hone did not know was that Young's job was to open doors for pro-DM emissaries and see that Vietnamese who arrived with disturbing reports on our man were given a runaround. Hone was sent to Joseph Buttinger, the Austrian socialist who was in New York, and from Buttinger to Milton Sachs, of Brandeis University, in some, from one DM propagandist to another, until, fed up with getting nowhere, he packed up and went to France. Later, as the fight to shield senators and congressmen from the truth became more desperate, no member of the DM opposition could get a visa to America and inability to obtain a visa was then presented as indisputable proof of the man's unimportance. All Hone got out of Kenneth Young was an admission that Bu Hoi, a cousin of Bao Dai who had dropped his title of prince, was being pushed as a possible DM successor. And in fact Bu Hoi undoubtedly had an inside track in his close relationship with American author S. Miss Ellen Hammer whose anti-DM writings on South Vietnam never failed to plug the man whose rise to power might make Miss Hammer South Vietnam's first lady. The struggle for Indochina continues and Geneva to Bandoing are among her books. She was published by Princeton Press and the Pacific Spectator of Stanford University, it might be added also that Bu Hoi was Mendes France's man. 
from those in Washington who were advancing socialism or trying to acquire personal power by dabbling in foreign intrigue, the best Hone got was assurance that if he could raise $50,000 they would get him some publicity. Even then he never completely realized the number of wheels within wheels at work in America to keep our policy on the beam from which he, one friendless Vietnamese, was trying to sway it. While his followers back in Saigon were being stripped of their finances, arrested or hounded into flight or clandestineness, Hone rode back and forth on buses from one American Southeast Asia authority to another. Every word he said was passed on to the Vietnamese embassy in Washington, CIA, USIA and the American Aid Administration, for transmission back to DM and NU. When he had finished, Hone dared not return to Saigon. France was the only country open to him, so to Paris he went. Thereafter anything he said was discredited by DM propagandists in the United States as griping from a puppet of the embittered colonialists. His wife and children were retained in Saigon as hostages. Thus civilian opposition to DM in the purely political sense was led to dissipate itself, in puerile splinterings at home while in America it beat its head against a news blackout and the stone wall of officialdom. In the end, salvation, if it were to come, could come only from the three armed bands, one of which had already partially defected. The remaining leaders went through the proper motions and made the usual speeches. Of Solidarity On March 3, 1955, the same United National Front that American money had shattered the previous September was reformed. But this time to everyone's surprise the Native Socialist Party joined the lineup. The most respected socialist in South Vietnam was Ho Hu Chuong, a novelist lexicographer and political leader who had fought the French for 25 years. Before Chuang clashed with the Godins he was referred to in America as a great nationalist, which he never was. Chuang was an internationalist, and an important array of Americans were behind him. But to give him his just due it must be admitted that he was an enemy of the Viet Minh on grounds that they were Stalinist. A photographer took a picture of the new alliance. Pope Pham Kong Tak in the center, old General Tran Van Sio I of the fierce Galvary moustache at his right, Le Van Van at his left. For over two weeks internal wrangling went on among them, with no one knows what deals to ensure each leader's jealously guarded prerogatives. Then on March 21, 1955, the ultimatum that time resented was served. A week passed a week in which each side watched the other like two wary wrestlers, with General Ely assuring Le Van Van there would be no fighting and DM's intermediaries dangling bribes of two and three million dollars, as though it were ice cream soda money, before the generals protecting Le Van Van's flanks. While the bickering continued, DM's tanks and troops moved into position. Two other groups joined the United Front, the Vietnam Quoc Dan Dung, outcome of a party formed by the Chinese nationalists in the Red River Valley after VJ Day, and a group from Central Vietnam calling itself the Movement for the Protection of Popular Security. One needed no Gallup poll to see at a glance that a majority of the country wanted nothing to do with America's man and were out to oust him. By that time the ultimatum that DM dissolve his cabinet was a dead issue. Fourteen of the ministers threatened had already resigned. Only the guardian of the seal remained on the job, and he from a sense of duty. An imperative wire from Baudai summoned DM to appear before him in Cannes, on May 9, pending which General Nguyen Van V, who had gone to Dalat for safety after the Hin affair, was named commander of the army. All that remained to DM was the radio station, the censor's office and his two Americans, General O'Daniel and Colonel Lansdale, the lot supported by four battalions of personal troops which DM had brought down from the Natrang region. Then the storm broke. At midnight on Thursday, March 28, DM's 81 meters. M. Mortars started belching fire. DM directed his end of the battle from within the Independence Palace. Le Van Van's home and command post were in a villa at the exit of the Y Bridge, which crossed the stagnant arroyo separating Saigon from the Chinese city. But overnight Van's position had become precarious, 
if not hopeless. General Fu Wong, in return for $3.6 million, plus monthly payments for his troops and a sinecure command for himself, as John Osborne was to admit in life of May 13, 1957, had gone over to DM with his 25,000 followers, bag and baggage. His spiritual leader, the Cao Dai Pope, was already weakened by the bribing of Trinh Minh there, and Fu Wong's sellout left him high and dry. Tran Van Sio I, the Ho Hao general, was offered a million dollars for himself and another million for his troops, but his brief period as an excellency after he betrayed General Hin had taught him his lesson. Ferocious old Sio I refused to see DM's advisors again. Later he told General Hin's father that an agreement could have been reached if any kind of an honorable proposition had been made. The account he gave of events leading up to the fighting was as follows. General O'Daniel came to me and demanded angrily, I hear you are against DM. I said no, we ho how are not against DM but he is making demands that we cannot accept. Then you are against him, he shouted. I said no, we are not exactly against him, but we cannot accept all his conditions. Then you are against him, repeated General O'Daniel, and if you don't support him you won't be able to live we will cut off all your American aid. That won't make any difference to us ho how, I told him, because DM has never let us have any of it. General O'Daniel was angry and said, if you don't support DM we will smash your faces. The words used by Nguyen Van Tam in describing O'Daniel's threat were on Vakasala figure, Tran Van Sio I said, all right, then, if that is the way it is going to be, or words to that effect. General O'Daniel sent for me three times after that, he added, but I never saw him again. If I had enjoyed seeing him I would have gone, but he blustered and shouted too much, and I didn't like it. But cut, the wild ho how consumptive with hair hanging to his shoulders, stuck with Sio I and Levanvan, but Bacut and Sio I were not in on the fighting that night of April 28, 1955. The object of DM's surprise attack was to destroy his enemies piecemeal. Until 4 o'clock a.m. The heavy mortars rocked. Saigon and staccato bursts of machine gun fire could be heard from the terraces on Boulevard Galini. When the lull came 26 dead and 152 wounded were amid the debris of the shattered streets but DM's battalions with their superior firepower and American backing held the city. Chapter 10. The Battle of Saigon. All evidence suggests that DM and his American advisors waited until the occasion was ripe, then exploited the element of surprise. The Bing's Yuan, however, were blamed for opening hostilities. Certainly no judge sifting the facts would take this claim seriously, for as long as things were going well and victory seemed to justify the means, DM's Americans themselves bragged of their complicity in urging DM to open hostilities. Congressman Walter H. Judd of Minnesota wrote approvingly in a booklet put out by DM's American lobby in September 1956 called a Symposium on America's Stake in South Vietnam, that while General Ely and General Collins were home, wringing their hands over the impending demise of the country, fortunately DM went in and cleaned things up. Since they were gone they could not stop him, Congressman Judd observed, adding, General O'Daniel legged DM on, as I understand, all the way. General O'Daniel must have approved of this statement, since he was chairman of the organization that printed the booklet. General Ely was still in Saigon as High Commissioner of the French Republic on March 28, 1955. His phone rang. On the other end of the line he heard DM's voice in a high pitch of emotion. A shell had fallen, one man had been killed and several others wounded. The government, DM announced, was about to order the National Army into action against the Bing's Yuan. Ely begged for patience, pleaded with DM not to throw the country into a civil war and promised that an investigation would be opened immediately. There was no answer. DM had hung up. General Lawton Collins, as Congressman Judd said, was in Washington, and every man in Godin DM's entourage was convinced that the trip was to advise Foster Dulles to dump DM and all his camp, 
and do it quickly. Whether true or not, everything that transpired in the next three weeks could be called a comedy of errors had the results not been so tragic. Never was there a better example of the truth of Axel Oxen's time's reflection that his son would be surprised to learn with what little intelligence countries are governed. Let us turn from the battle raging in Saigon, which was renewed shortly after dawn on Friday morning, April 29, 1955. DM and the circle of friends whose heads would fall if his did sized up the situation coldly and realistically. Back and forth between Independence Palace and the American Embassy, where Mr. Randolph Kidder had taken over as charged affair, went the trusted go-betweens. The political picture seen from Saigon looked grim. Tran Van Kiwong in the Vietnamese Embassy in Washington had ceased to answer telegrams. If Kiwong were taking his distance it could only mean that, from where he was sitting, DM looked about to fall. Somehow the ground had to be cut from beneath Lawton Collins' feet. The post of ambassador at large for Europe was unnecessary, since its office at 47 bis Avenue Kleber in Paris duplicated, when it was not pulling against, the ambassador to France. However, it will be recalled that it was created for DMS youngest brother, Luine. Luine was in Saigon for a family council when the tension began to mount. So while General Collins winged his way toward Washington, Luine was sent racing to Cannes to try to wheedle a new statement of confidence out of BM Dai before Collins and Bao Dai's dismissal of DM could reach the State Department together. The gates to Chateau Thorin were closed. Bao Dai refused to see him. Luine then took off for Paris. Throughout Wednesday, April 20th, he scurried back and forth between talks with the French socialists, his French advisor in the American embassy. On Wednesday night he decided on a move that was to become classic. He would send a deputy to Washington the deputy ambassador would slip into town, contact DM's supporters in the State Department and the senators regarded as in DM's pocket. When he had obtained a promise that they would stick with their man, and if possible a promise that General Lawton Collins would be recalled, then the deputy ambassador would descend on the Vietnamese embassy and bulldoze Tran Van Kuong back into line. Luan looked around his office. The only employee he trusted sufficiently to dub deputy ambassador, even for a week, was a chunky, square-faced artist named Vo Lang, in his late thirties, whose brother, Vo Hai, was close to DM. Vo Lang spoke no English and his judgment was open to question but his integrity was never in doubt. He readily admitted that his own cousin, Vu Van Tai, DM's Minister of Public Works, was a communist and in his opinion ought to be not thrown out but shot. On Thursday, April 21, Vu Lang presented himself at the visa office of the American Embassy on Avenue Gabriel. Trouble. Miss Dorothy Barker was polite but firm. Vu had no diplomatic passport so, officially, he was no diplomat. And she could not issue a visa at once, even a transient one, to an unknown Vietnamese. A day was lost while Luine pulled strings through William Gibson in the American Embassy. For, suppose Luine had requested a diplomatic visa for Vaux, which only Pham Duicum, the ambassador and high commissioner to France, could issue. Kim would wire Madame Kuong in Saigon. Madame Kiwong would wire her husband in Washington, and Vo Lang would be undercut instead of Kiwong. On Friday, April 22, all obstacles miraculously rolled away. Vo got his visa. He was informed that Monsieur Paul Devinat would fly from Tokyo and meet him in Washington at the French Embassy with further instructions and advice. There was a last meeting with a socialist councillor of the French Union at a comma table in La Coupole in Montparnasse. More advice and instructions. Then, with the mysteriousness and secretiveness characteristic of his race, Vaux slipped off without a word to the aide who was being sent along to translate and if necessary say what Vaux was supposed to say. This author, incidentally, was the aide and the conversations related were conversations in which the author served as interpreter. Vo's disappearance, it developed later, was to meet a black market exchange dealer who sold him a thousand dollar banknote and two five hundred dollar bills, 
so he would have some American money to give the taxi driver when he reached New York. At 11.30 that night Vo and his aide took off from Morley. The interesting part of these preparatory shenanigans is that at that moment, as the Time article of April 4 discloses, the bitter anti-French campaign being run by the American press and the DM government was at its height. All of DM's troubles were laid to the wily, rearguard maneuvers of colonialism, meaning France. Yet, French socialists were backing DM, advising his deputy ambassador, and flying a man to Washington to help save DM. Obviously the loyalty of France's socialists was to a Vietnamese francophobe halfway around the world, never to their country. This is part of the phenomena of the modern international left. Vo Lang's first preoccupation on reaching New York on Saturday noon, April 23, 1955, was to telephone Dr. Wesley Fischel, of Michigan State University, in Lansing, Michigan, which introduced a new actor in the plot. Nothing had been said about Dr. Fischel in Paris. It was not the first example, nor was it to be the last of the genius of the participants in this web of intrigue for not letting the left hand know what the right hand was doing. On Sunday, April 24, Vo's plane for Washington departed while he was in an airport shop, adding a telescopic lens for his camera to his expense account. At last, late that afternoon, he was to arrive at Washington's DuPont Plaza Hotel. How does an inexperienced young man, picked at random? sent to a country where he has never been before and where he does not speak the language, go about saving a government. For the honest senators and private citizens who would like to know the answer to this question and will never obtain it through any congressional investigation their government is likely to hold, it was really very simple. But first bear in mind that, for all his frankness later, Vo Lang never divulged the details of why he was instructed to call Regent 75600, extension 5287, in Washington, and ask for KY, as soon as senatorial support for DM was assured for just a little longer. Or of his half-hour conversation over the telephone with Wesley Fischel. All we know is that on Monday morning, April 25th, Instructions called for his seeing first Senator Mike Mansfield and then Senator Hubert Humphrey. After talking with them, he was to give a bipartisan appearance to the drive for DM support by calling on Senator Munt of South Dakota and Senator Noland of California. Vo had no trouble with Mansfield. He was in DM's corner. And to Vo Lang's credit be it admitted that, on a mission for Luine though he was, Vo told the senator that DM must be made to broaden the base of his government, that southern demands for a voice in their affairs must be given a hearing. Mike Mansfield, the liberal history professor from Montana, elected by the Mine Workers Union and his state's unionized farmers, shifted Vo over to Frank Velio, secretary of the Senate's Foreign Relations Committee. Through Velio what Vo Lang had to say would be passed on to the committee. Velio in pidgin French, conducted his own interrogation. And every question he posed was loaded, it's same all but concealed in a rambling you think we ought to do this, don't you? Preamble which, if though understood at all, oriental politeness demanded that he answer in the affirmative. Had an intelligent freshman in political science been sitting in the office of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations that April afternoon while America's prestige and Southeast Asia's future were at stake, he would have been appalled to see how the secretary interpreter on whom our lawmakers depended operated. How many fact-finding missions to South Vietnam saw situations through the warped vision of Velio's interpreting and came home to approve policies described thereafter as American. Americas they never were. They were the policies of men who knew where they were going, and who, by their monopoly on key positions, were able to impose their interpreter on senators who might otherwise prove troublesome. Vo Lang was never expected to change their minds. He was the deputy ambassador sent to provide statements justifying what they already intended to do. Vo was to say yes when yes was the answer his interrogator wanted. Each sentence to which he gave approval, impressed by marble surroundings and his obligation as a favor demanding guest, 
was accredited in its entirety to him, with recommendations that his observations be accepted. Whatever happened later, Velio cannot say that Volang did not warn him. Again, as in Mansfield's office, Vo pleaded that America stay behind DM just a little longer, but that after the crisis he be made to widen the base of his government. How can we make him? Velio asked. Make him? replied Vo, and he leaned back in his chair. How would one sum up those senators with whom Vo Lang talked that Monday of April 25, 1955? while the crisis mounted in Saigon and the entire American press unleashed itself in a blind torrent of rage against Bao Dai, the Bing Zuin, the Cao Dai and Ho Hao sects and last but not least the French. Mansfield was the most dangerous, for each gesture, each observation he made with with an air of false kindliness that beguiled the listener into believing that this was a friend of humanity. Actually, behind the benign front lay the professional progressive, applying to each decision a single yardstick, is this the liberal thing to do question mark and feeling that no action which brought about the liberal solution was too brutal. The bloodshed, if there is bloodshed, be on their hands, the enemies of liberalism, for if they had not resisted, bloodshed could have been avoided, seemed to be Mike Mansfield's reasoning. Hubert Humphrey must be regarded as a demagogue with a mind second to none by those who compare his private conversations with his public pronouncements. His conversation with Vo Lang was short. Every question he asked was intelligent, direct to the core of the problem. The man was concentrating, not shooting off hot air. Once he had satisfied himself on a point and mentally filed it away he went on to the next point. One could see him putting the pieces together m his mind. When Volang launched into his diatribe against the French, Humphrey silenced him with a gesture. You have your independence now, quit fighting the French. That is over. The only conclusion one can reach is that Humphrey is intelligent, that every sacrifice of America's interests is made knowingly, to court the mob, to stay in office. Whether he weighs the sacrifices and feels that America can stand the setback as a price she must pay for Hubert Humphrey, or whether he is acting with the long-range eye of a socialist out to make collapse of the existing system inevitable, is something American voters and historians must decide for themselves. Humphrey pledged his support to DM. For nine years it was always just a little longer. Senator Carl Munt, the Republican from South Dakota, moved slowly, thought slowly, but left no doubt that he was doing what he thought would be honorable and best. He listened to Vo Lang's request, then reached for his telephone to call Nixon's office, that Vo might put his message before the vice president. Nixon was out, but never mind, Munt would throw his support behind Mansfield and Humphrey on matters pertaining to Ngod and DM. It was the story of our role in Southeast Asia in a nutshell. The liberal establishment could not lose, for in honest DM, the anti-colonialist who had studied to be a priest, and in his brother who had been a labor leader, American progressives had a team behind which all the shades of the political spectrum could be herded under threat of being called un-American if they balked. In a state of elation Vo Lang left Senator Munt's office and headed for Senator Noland's. Noland was an important figure on the Foreign Relations Committee. Enlisting his support would tip the scale, and Nolan joined the bipartisan front for DM wholeheartedly. From that moment Vo Lang felt that he alone had saved the Ngodin DM regime, little realizing that he had only provided the quotes. It was a strange interview that Vo Lang had with Noland. Of all the senators in that marble floored building Nolan portrayed best in his person the Roman idea of the lawmaker. He was impressive. He looked intelligent and forceful, but he did not ask a question on the background of the crisis, there. Prospects for the future, how the people really felt in South Vietnam. Instead, he told Vo Lang. The socialist counselor of the French Union, in his last briefing at the Montparnasse Café before Vo Lang boarded the plane for America, had said, tell the senators, in Washington, not to worry about Le Van Van. All he wants is money. We can buy him off. Vo dutifully passed the observation on to Noland, 
who replied, quite admirably, the United States will never pay ransom to a river pirate. In retrospect a disturbing thought remains, surely the counselor of the French Union knew when he made his statement that Van was the terror of the communists, and was incorruptible. The logical explanation then is that this was a final ruse to clinch Nolan's support by making him adamant against DM's enemy, Van, to whose former allies millions had already been paid in bribes. From the Senate office building Vo took a taxi to the embassy of the nation being axed by both the Vietnamese press and the American as villain of the peace, to meet Monsieur Paul Devinat, the official who had flown all the way from Tokyo to help put his mission across. It was a day of triumph for Vo, triumph political and social, beyond anything he had dreamed of during those lonely months in Hong Kong when, as an exile, he made a living drawing pictures of Chinese in the street. From the French embassy he doubled back to the home of a woman prominent in Republican circles, on Jefferson Place, for a cocktail. Here he made the acquaintance of Joseph Ballantyne, a retired Foreign Service official who had spent years in the Orient. Ballantyne's understanding of the East, his judgment and personal acquaintance with leaders in South China, impressed Vo. Here was a man to whom, in a pinch, one could refer a senator with complete confidence in the authorities' integrity. For the moment everything ran according to plan. Tran Van Kiwong, still ignoring DM's telegrams in his embassy, was apparently still unaware that he was about to be whipped into line. The last thing Vo did before going to bed the night of his first day in Washington was call Wesley Fischel of Michigan State University for further orders. The next day, Tuesday the 26th, was hectic. The headlines were bigger, the cartoons denigrating Bao Dai Wilder. U. S. News and World Report sent a man to interview Vo in the Dupont Plaza. There was a long meeting in the Cambodian embassy, the only development of which was a request by Vo Lang that his aide call a number in Alexandria, hang up if. A man answered, but if it was a woman's voice say, this is a friend of Jacques in the Cambodian embassy. Can you come to the Dupont Plaza at once? At 5.30 that afternoon Vo had an appointment with Kenneth Young in the State Department, to which he went alone. What transpired between then and midnight, when Vo returned to his hotel, is not known. Vo called Wesley Fischel again as soon as he got to his room, then an airline to make a reservation for a quick round trip to Michigan, departing in the morning. Not until 1961, when Vo's hair had turned white and he was again shabbily dressed, painting pictures for a living in the apartment he had bought near the Foley's Bigger in his brief period of access to the American aid till, did he divulge any part of the long conversation he had with the behind-the-scenes Southeast Asia ace of the State Department, Kenneth Todd Young. Vo confided, he told me that they had been intercepting Kiwong's messages to Bao Dai for months and they were fed up with him. If I wanted to cooperate, Young said they would make me ambassador to Washington. Do you think they were able to decipher the code Kiwong used with Bao Dai, or was someone in Bao Dai's household leaking the message to Bill Gibson in Paris? I don't know, the disillusioned Vo Lang replied. The day after Vo's late return from Lansing, Michigan, political science professor Wesley Fischel himself arrived in Washington to take a hand. Short, swarthy, well-built and with the cat-like tread of a boxer, Fischel had all the worst characteristics of the genus liberal currently gripping American education. Where he came from, who he was, no one seemed to know. Under his direction a Vietnam project had been instituted in Michigan State and it was evident from Fischl's steamroller tactics that any student not in agreement with Michigan State's indoctrination on behalf of Ngodin DM would cause no serious trouble to the crusade, the reason being that he would not get a diploma, without which ratification of knowledge no job of any importance would be open to him. New Leader magazine of December 7, 1959, carried a biographical sketch on Fischl, accompanying an article in which communist subversion is pictured as fighting for its life in South Vietnam before the advances made by land reform, run by Fischl's friend, Wolf Fladerjinsky, political education, police state fashion, rural credit, restricted to DM's particular friends, 
and community development. Social pressure was usually sufficient to ensure the presence of the able bodied citizens, wrote apologist Fischel of the forced labor aspect of the community development. The biography given was as follows Wesley R. Fischel, birthplace and source of his education unstated, has traveled, studied, and taught extensively in the Far East for the past 20 years. That would put Mr. Fischel in the Far East around 1939. It would be interesting to know where he traveled and studied at that time, how he happened to go to the Far East, who sent him. In 1953 he directed a classified research project in Korea and Japan for the Operations Research Office of Johns Hopkins University, Milton Eisenhower's University. Not reassuring. How does it happen that no conservative is ever selected for such jobs? The following year, new leader continued. He served in Indochina as consultant in governmental reorganization for the U.S. operations mission and as staff member for General J. Lawton Collins, special presidential representative. Interesting, this. The year 1954 was the period when American leftists swarming over Indochina as operations missions agents and in other capacities, worked to sabotage Washington's aid to the French, then fighting Ho Chi Minh. The Michigan State Professor's loyalty to his chief, General Lawton Collins, on whose staff he was, could not have been great, since one year later Mr. Fischel was in Washington to help Volan get General Collins fired from his job. But now we are getting somewhere, in 1956-58 he headed a Michigan State Advisory Group on Public Administration in Vietnam, says the vague biography. Among other things. Michigan State was at that time training the South Vietnamese police that ran Hitler's Gestapo at close second, all this as part of public administration. New leader terminated the only official biography we have at hand with the statement that he is the author of The End of Extraterritoriality in China and of many scholarly articles. Readers will recall his article Vietnam's Democratic One Man Rule, which ran in our November 2, 1959, issue. A treatise on the psychology of wishful thinking among American conservatives could be derived from the reaction of the American public during the up period and down period of our DM intoxication. When the American left, of which New Leader and Wesley Fischel are examples, turned against DM in 1961 to get out from under their responsibility for him, America's solid middle of the road as rose in arms in DM's defense. They knew nothing of the reasons for the left's disavowal. They never reasoned that our militant left, having accumulated an explosive force, might be putting itself on record as being against it before it blew up. The fact that the New York Times began cooling off toward DM was sufficient to make conservative citizens feel that he must be good. When the same leftist journals and professors were on positive rather than a negative line, our tranquility seeking public swallowed it without a murmur, though the soft soap was transparently false. Then they were happy to leave South Vietnam to the new leader and men like Wesley Fischel. Fischel's arrival in Washington that hot April 28, coinciding as it did with DM's decision to launch hostilities in Saigon, added further complications. Vo and his aide interpreter appeared together on visits to congressmen, but said aide knew nothing of what went on in the side trips Vo made with Professor Fischel or the six hour talks when Vo was presumably with Kenneth Young. In fact, from the moment of Fischel's arrival, a promise of support having been extracted from the four important senators on the Foreign Relations Committee. The aide's duties consisted mainly of accompanying Vo Lang to Ka's hobby shop for the purpose of buying a $400 model airplane with a six-foot wing spread and a gasoline motor, or to cocktail parties or on searches for more photographic equipment, for which the American taxpayer, without a say in the matter, was Santa Claus. An appointment was set up for a courtesy call on Senator Joseph R. McCarthy at 10.30 a.m. on Friday, April 29, the idea being that Vo should meet as many of the senators on the Foreign Relations Committee as possible, so that he would know them in the event of another mission. At 9.45 a phone call came for Vo in his room. I have to go down to the lobby to see Mr. Fischel, 
he explained. I'll be right back. Literally, he was kidnapped, simply put in a car and taken away. He returned that afternoon at 4.30, with no explanation as to where he had been or why he had walked out on the McCarthy appointment without the courtesy of making a cancellation or an apology. One possible explanation is that certain Americans pulling strings in Vietnamese affairs did not want a naive and sometimes too honest Vo Lang wandering into Joe McCarthy's office and waxing loquacious. That night a speech by Congressman William Jennings Bryan Dawn of South Carolina went over the air, demanding the recall of Ambassador J. Lawton Collins. An hour later Vo Lang descended on the Vietnamese embassy for the battle that was to last till midnight. He was in a state of high elation. When he returned to the DuPont Plaza shortly after 12.30, and Ambassador Kuong was once more pro-DM, Vo Lang's political future seemed assured. Before going to bed he dispatched a telegram to Saigon and Code, naming the congressman whose support he had obtained. Four copies of statements those congressmen had made, eulogizing DM before Vo had ever seen them were clipped from the Washington Post and telegraphed to the four top figures in Saigon, verbatim and at full rate, signed by Vo Lang's hapless aide. The telegraph bill was slightly over $400. When those telegrams arrived an immense cloud of black smoke covered the sky to the east of Saigon. On April 29 the battle recommenced, shortly after dawn. By nightfall the north branch of the Y bridge had been blown up and the fight had moved beyond the river, into Colon, where it was raging around Le Vanvin's great gambling center, Le Grand Mont. Thousands of huts had gone up in smoke, part of Saigon was a shambles, but the test of strength which the opinionated Mandarin in Independence Palace had wanted, and precipitated, was won, at least as far as the city was concerned. Outside Saigon it was another matter. Le Vanvin, aided by the Ho Hao, still held the rice fields and the waterways leading into the city. Trucks bearing loudspeakers roamed the streets, blaming all the misery on the French and the Bing Zuin, despite the fact that French General Jack Watt's mobile detachments were blocking off as much of Saigon as they could to save it from the fighting and provide a haven for thousands of homeless refugees pouring in from the devastated parts of Saigon and Colon. The family in Independence Palace was determined to inflame the population. It was the most fearful incitement to mob violence and anti-colonialist trouble rousing the city had seen. Mimeograph tracts appeared, giving official sanction, as it were, to an anti-French riot. Raymond Cartier reported in Paris match of May 14, 1955, no Frenchman in Indochina doubts that these tracts exciting the civilian population to massacre them were drawn up in the office of Colonel Lansdale and the anglicisms they contain, such as spit in la face of the French rather than cracker de la figure, which anyone familiar with the French language would have used, do not contradict that conviction. The theme behind the violent anti-French campaign, covered in full by American correspondents on the spot, was that France was backing and inflaming the sects for the dual per pose of obstructing formation of a strong government and installing a French grip on the country in spite of the independence which she had recognized. It was a policy which we might have been tempted to play, which we did not, said Cartier. If the DM campaign had succeeded and a strong popularly supported government had resulted it would have had the cynical justification of success. But it did not, as the resultant state of South Vietnam was to attest. All that resulted was the cruelty, the injustice and the distrust of France, and grim forebodings of what might be expected under similar circumstances in the future. Of General O'Daniel and the Colonel who, having elected Magsace in the Philippines, was about to win new king-making laurels in Vietnam, Cartier observed, without taking into account past history or present problems, America, in Indochina dreamed only of ousting the French with a brusque shove of the shoulder, to pursue a path that could but lead to a labyrinth. The blood poured out, the sacrifices borne, the civilization sown in Indochina meant nothing before the brutal and summary men who, beneath their masks of officialdom, displayed the profiles of adventurers.
Here was the start of the rancor which America's later support of the Algerian rebellion was to increase and harden. If the splitting of NATO, the driving of a wedge between America and the armed forces of the country that provides NATO's base, was the intention of those sowing Franco-American animosity in Indochina, their plan succeeded. To say that confusion reigned in Independence Palace as the last days of April approached would be putting it mildly. A message had come from Baudai, as we stated, ordering DM to present himself in Can on May 9. A parallel order from Baudai named General Nguyen Van V Commander-in-Chief of the Army, and since the country had no elected assembly or sovereignty other than Baudai, the orders were legal. To dispute their legality would, in fact, put in question the legality of DM's own appointment as Premier. But dispute them DM did. Whether he was egged on by General O'Daniel, as Congressman Judd put it, or whether he acted on his own, in the fanatical conviction that his appointment came from God and not from Baudai, we shall never know. The consequences were the same. His harangues followed the line of all revolutionaries, he orated on the suffering of the people and worked himself into rages over conditions which he himself had created. Every opposition paper had been suppressed and French publications were barred from the country, but DM talked about the new liberties which had accrued with independence. Over a thousand known anti-communists had disappeared into the night between the police officers of DM and NU. There were no trials. Executions had taken place, but no one knew for certain who was in prison or who had been executed, and intimidation, the threat of disappearing, silenced all questioners. The Americans who knew of these events could not have cared less. General Nguyen Van V was up in Dalat when promotion to command of the National Army descended on him. It was safer there. Nevertheless, he boarded a plane for Saigon, where he arrived late in the afternoon of April 29. About the time news reached Independence Palace that Nguyen Van V was on his way, it became known that General Hin was also flying home on a mission for Baudai. General V moved into General Hin's villa on the outskirts of town, while Trinmin there, the ambitious Kaudai general whom DM had purchased along with his 2,500 personal troops for some $2 million, of Nmakanade money, the previous February, prepared to resist V's appointment. Rumors and counter-rumors crossed the capital like wildfire, and in the end no one knew who was in command. Ambassador Kiwong in Washington was still not answering telegrams, from DM at least, the results of Vo Lang's secondary intrigues in Washington under the wing of Professor Fischel had not yet reached Saigon. Matters stood in this uncertain state when April 30 broke over a sweltering capital and its two million inhabitants, securely in DM's hands but with his power extending no farther. For ten years this writer has tried to fix the exact role of American initiative and money in the tangled developments of the next 48 hours. At this date it is unlikely that the true story will ever be unraveled, so many of the actors are now where they cannot talk. Only those Vietnamese who remained loyal to DM to the end in order to retain their place on the gravy train are still alive, and they are singularly reserved on the subject of those events. General V set off to brave the lion in his den, accompanied by General D, then in name at least his chief of staff. The two generals got in a jeep that Saturday morning and with a motorcycle escort preceding them roared through the streets of Saigon where 2,500 more northern refugees unloaded from the American ship Daniel Webster had just joined the horde of humanity, men, women and children, and jumbled belongings already littering the city. At Independence Palace they ascended the marble stairway leading to DM's office. Before they had time to state their business they found themselves facing Trin Minnie and a circle of pistols. T had one of his epaulettes torn off and might have suffered worse if at that moment DM had not appeared to tell them they were under arrest. With the trigger happy lieutenants brandishing guns under their noses, V and T heard DM order them to sign a paper swearing loyalty to him and repudiation of Baudai. Let us leave the two generals where they are for a minute. DM had already started throwing together what he called a National Revolutionary Committee. 
the members were appointed by the General Assembly of Revolutionary Forces of the Nation, a puppet assembly which D. Emmons knew had named and then summoned to a meeting in the City Hall that Saturday afternoon. Thirty-three names were signed to the manifesto that resulted. These thirty-three men claimed to represent sixteen parties. In all, about two hundred D.M. henchmen attended the meeting, the purpose of which was not long in doubt. A large portrait of Bao Dai hung on the wall. It was torn down and trampled on, and Ngodin D.M. was charged with the formation of a provisional government of the Republic of Vietnam. Lieutenants were dispatched in all directions to mobilize students, tear down Bao Dai's portraits, burn him in effigy, and by their exuberance impress the American embassy and the American press with the strength of the National Revolutionary Committee. It is interesting to look back on this farce and wonder why it was taken seriously, but taken seriously and passed on to the American public as an advance of democracy, it was. Nguyen Bao Tone, the fiery orator whose speech whipped the assembly into tearing down Bao Dai's portrait, was made chairman of the representative committee. A man named Ho Han Sun, who formerly commanded Ho Chi Minh's dreaded 7th zone, was vice chairman. Nilang, whose picture may be found in Life magazine of April 18, 1955, was number three of the group, in recognition of his services in holding a gun over Nguyen Van V that morning. Supporting them with the considerable weight and experience at his command was the famous Dr. Tran, who not long before had been president of the administrative committee of the Nambo, Ho Chi Minh's government in the south. Had any of these men possessed the power of clairvoyance? Had there been a brief lifting of the shutter, here is what they would have seen, less than a year later Nguyen Bao Tone was to find himself in flight. Fortunately he had a considerable fortune by that time, provided indirectly by the American taxpayer, and when last heard of he was living comfortably in America. Ho Han Sun was to disappear in January 1956. Nu and his police made no attempt to look for him. Thirteen months later Sun's skeleton was found. Nilang was soon to flee to Cambodia. The others were for the most part broken one by one, or if alive, are now not talking. Randolph Kidder, then serving as America's charge d'affaires and running the embassy during General Lawton Collins' absence, is also unlikely to divulge any pertinent information. Reports to the French government accused him of encouraging rather than trying to restrain the efforts of General O'Daniel, Colonel Lansdale and the increasingly powerful United States Information Service helping to inflame the civilian population against the French. This did not prevent the State Department from assigning the handsome Mr. Kidder to the Paris Embassy in 1959. On the fateful Saturday of April 30, 1955, another development occurred to pose potentially embarrassing questions at our Saigon Embassy. A French plane bearing navigation certificate S. O. A. D. N. Type M. Number 3681 and owned by the French High Commissioner to Vietnam, the very official accused of helping DM's enemies, made three passes over Le Van Van's command post. It appeared to be photographing the Nationalist Front's positions and directing the mortar fire that was becoming increasingly accurate. On its fourth pass it dropped a firebomb and peeled off toward the earth within range of light weapons. The body of an American named Dixie Reese was found in the wreckage of the plane. Newspaper reports said he was a press photographer, killed while reporting the battle. Papers on his person identified him as head of the photo laboratory of the American embassy. A Vietnamese Catholic priest named Father Qua was sent on the dangerous mission of trying to locate Mr. Reese before it was known that both Reese and the pilot were dead. Five years later, after DM had sent Father Qua to prison on a trumped up charge of receiving stolen goods, Following the priest's indiscreet political pronouncements, the American embassy in Paris refused him a visa on grounds that he was an ex-convict. But let us leave our embassy and the problems of Mr. Kidder, who was destined to play a greater role in our experiment in Vietnam than perhaps historians will accord him. Back with the motorcycle escort outside Independence Palace the parachutist Colonel Calvantry 
whom DM had just promoted, was beginning to wonder why his two generals who had gone into the august palace five hours before did not come out. Tri telephoned and was told they were under arrest. Tri informed the palace that his two chiefs had gone there in good faith and that if they were not released he would be back with troops to free them. They were freed immediately. Meanwhile Trin Min there, who arrested the generals in the first place, on May 4th, had been sent back to his troops. He started marching at the head of his men across a bridge and fell, shot in the back. Anyone might have done it, for he was a man of ferocious cruelty. One of his own soldiers, resentful of Trin's betrayal of their spiritual leader, may have chosen that moment to administer divine retribution as he saw it, or it may have been an agent of Levanvan. Reasons for shooting Trin Min there were so many no one tried to sort them out. Besides, in the wider picture he was unimportant. Papers in America were rolling off the press by the time, bearing big headlines of Bao Dai's ouster by the Revolutionary Committee. As we have said, no questions were asked about said committee, the Saigon riots, the trampling of Bao Dai's portrait underfoot, and his burning in effigy were represented to newspaper readers avidly buying extras as the mass uprising of a nation marching toward democracy. Yet, for a brief spell on Sunday morning in far away Saigon, General V had his moment of glory. Ninety percent of the army's generals had made known their willingness to follow him. General Levante, his chief of staff, insisted on going back to the palace around midday and announcing their decision to DM's revolutionary committee, just to do the thing correctly. V permitted two generals to go along as an escort. For the information of senators who might someday be interested in peering into the careers of Vietnamese generals to ascertain whether they were the recipients of favors by or subsequent generals and ambassadors, the name of one of them was Min and the other was Don. Around 3 p.m., General Don returned, alone, with the stupefying news that Levante, unconditionally loyal to V three hours before, had moved back into DM's camp and that Min had gone with him. Trin Min there, Ngu Ain Than Fuong with his 25,000 Khao Dai troops, and now Levanti and Min had, one after another, crossed the field in this strange game of sellout and double cross. No one appears to have considered that the leaders on whom we were staking our big experiment were considerably less than stable. In America our man's triumph was hailed as a victory that he was hated, and the victory paid for by the American taxpayer, was never mentioned. Time magazine of August 9, 1963, called it DM's finest hour. In America the wild exultation over Vietnam's spontaneous rejection of the monarchy lasted just one day, then, as suddenly as it appeared, splashed across front pages, it abruptly ended with a lame statement to the effect that a constitutional monarchy was foreseen in South Vietnam. Nothing more was said. Professor Fischel burst into Vo Lang's room in the DuPont Plaza Hotel in a towering rage. Throwing a crumpled newspaper to the floor, he exclaimed, those imbeciles, they are afraid of their shadows. I know who is behind this. It's that bunch in the embassy in Saigon. The paper contained not a line about the new republic. The students' demonstrations had miraculously disappeared from print. Someone, somewhere, had said, enough. Take it easy, and the whole telecommanded performance was halted. Who, using America's prestige and funds, decided to abolish the throne in South Vietnam and make America's man a president while General Lawton Collins was out of the country, and out to stay if they had any say in the matter. That is a question the American public has a right to ask. Sunday papers across America carried an international news service story under a Washington dateline of April 30th signed by Don Dixon. Three senators have thrown their support behind the State Department's backing of South Vietnam's controversial Premier Ngo Dinh Diem. Diem has become the target of strong French criticism, wrote Mr. Dixon. Note, the criticism was always French. Vietnamese were pictured as solidly behind their Premier, then note the order in which senatorial support is listed. Senate GOP leader Noland, California, 
expressed hope the French would stop pulling the rug out from under Premier Diem and give him a chance to succeed, began the opening four-inch paragraph that made Nolan Diem's guarantor. Nolan added that if the French make any attempt to restore colonialism to that area they will fail. He said. The age of colonialism in Asia is dead. Next came Senator Humphrey's statement of position, summed up in one inch of eight point type. DM, said Humphrey. Is the best hope we have in South Vietnam and any comments about the leadership in the war torn country should be aimed at Bao Dai, the chief of state now living on the French Riviera. DM and Bao Dai, as Vo Lang had discovered, were the only Vietnamese names Senator Humphrey knew. Mike Mansfield's plug for DM ran to an inch and three quarters, but, coming at the end of the column as it did, the reader might suspect that Mansfield was going along in support of Nolan's and Humphrey's boy. Senator Mansfield, D. Monday, demanded that the U.S. cut off all aid to South Vietnam, wrote Mr. Dixon, if the racketeers revolt waged by the rebel Bing Xuyen forces overthrows the DM government. It was an old refrain. Never did American aid to Vietnam bolster the country against the communist enemy to the north, always it strengthened the grip of a family against their countrymen. And each year when foreign aid appropriations came up in the American Congress, opponents of the throwaway program inexorably ruining America, economically and in the eyes of the world, were told that to cut the aid appropriation would hinder American foreign policy. Chapter 11 new actors on the stage. After the 3rd of May, 1955, there was no threat, in Saigon at least, to the government the United Nationalist Front had rejected. True, as one moved from the capital the central government's authority diminished, trailed off and gradually ceased to exist. But firm censorship in Saigon and the news blackout in America could prevent the American public from hearing about this. The rest of the world did not matter. Levanvin could hold out indefinitely in his swamps. Tran Van Sio I and his embarrassing associate, Bacut, the wild man of the Ho Hao, were more vulnerable in their stronghold to the west, so it was the Ho Hao that DM prepared to wipe out first. In the meantime the reasons for the radio and press violence against the French, and attempts to blame them for the crisis which destroyed part of Saigon were becoming clear. The Treaty of Independence accorded France the right to maintain troops in South Vietnam as protection for the European population and to protect the country against the Viet Minh. DM and the Americans around him wanted those troops out. No one considered for a moment that a time might come when Americans would wish with all their hearts to have European help back there again. The Los Angeles Times of Wednesday, May 11, 1955, Headed its European Bureau report, Dulles tells for your support DM the brutal, ultimatum like headlines gave many Americans a burst of pride, a feeling of that's telling them. Edgar Foyer, Premier of France at the time, feared that weeks of radio incitement and Colonel Lansdale's mimeographed sheet, reports of which were in his desk, might touch off a massacre of French civilians in South Vietnam. This Los Angeles Times account of the exchange of notes between Washington and Paris continued, Secretary of State Dulles last night issued a virtual ultimatum to France that she support the native South Vietnamese government of Premier Ngo Dinh Diem and if necessary withdraw all or part of her 90,000 French expeditionary force. Dulles used stern language shorn of diplomatic euphemisms to enlist France's earnest support of DM as the West's only visible hope of saving Indochina from communist envelopment. Monsieur Foyer knew that Ho Chi Minh had no army left after the Pyrrhic victory of Dien Bien Phu, that in reality the French government had done nothing to oppose DM save protest against his anti-French radio diatribes which made Goebbels' pre-war blasts seem weak by comparison. The next sentence made him shake his head, he, Dulles, also warned that the new Vietnam native army is still so far from being ready for combat after 18 months of training by the United States Army that it could not defend the country if France does withdraw her forces. Why then, Foyer asked himself, do they tell us to get out? 
for your indicated France might accept DM if he broadens his government and agrees to Emperor Baudai's continuance as titular chief of state and if Ngodin DM obeys his militant anti-French attitude. For your asked Dulles who would protect French lives and property in Vietnam against DM's anti-French crusade if the French expeditionary forces withdrawn. Dulles replied the United States would in any case use her full influence to ensure respect for French lives and property. He said public opinion in the United States has reached the state where it would be excessively difficult for the United States to participate in DM's removal from power. The Premier leaned back and reflected. The men who produced the inflammatory sheets in his file would use their full influence to ensure respect for French lives and property, he was told. That was not good enough. And nothing could be done about DM because the organized press campaign had whipped the public into a state where nothing but the policies of the faceless clique doing the inciting would be acceptable. Why did you give me this particular paper? Premier Foyer asked his aide. Reports from the European Bureau of the Los Angeles Times go into a special file, he was told. The bureau chief is a rear admiral in the United States Navy Reserve. Consequently they are considered semi-official. All of these seemingly unimportant details, overlooked by a preoccupied public, are taken into consideration in the modem, airplane-spanning world of diplomacy. One American overseas press bureau out of three is on a list in the recesses of interior ministries as a branch post of central intelligence. Each dispatch is thereafter studied for indications of biases that will affect policy. At a time when American newspaper readers were aghast at the refusal of the French Air Force to accept American command in event of war, not one reader in a million took notice of the coincidence that the columns of Marguerite Higgins were sermons of praise for the Algerian rebels, or that before the Algerian revolt they had been anti-French in Vietnam. The French Air Ministry watching the sinuous twistings of Egyptian, Russian and Chinese plots and counterplots in the Algerian revolt noticed it, and in the minds of officers assigned to study and tabulate the daily press, was the conviction, true or false, that Marguerite Higgins' husband, in his third floor office of the Pentagon, had read and presumably approved her column the day before. Certainly Franco-American relations were not helped by the Los Angeles Times as DM purged his army of officers suspected of being pro-French and heaped honors on the friends and relatives promoted to command as he prepared his offensive, against the ho how in the West. The battle was to last from May 25 until the end of July 1955. While DM's 50 battalions were locked with the 20 battalions of regulars, plus an unknown number of guerrillas. Under Tran Van Sio I and Bacut, Le Van Van Zbingzuin crept back to the gates of Saigon and from ten miles outside of town threatened to cut the National Army's supply lines. While this battle was at its height a special Vietnam number of the new leader, published by the American Labor Conference on International Affairs, appeared in America, dated June 27, 1955, written in its entirely by Mr. Joseph Buttinger. It is unlikely that any American conservative deigned to read the political journal of American labor, but the American left read it. Labor unionists read it. Reprints were sold by the thousands at 15J each or 100 copies for $9.50. And some thinking American, somewhere in our vast country, should have torn himself away from a television set long enough to read every word in this 16-page magazine. If it is not someday spread out on a table and thoroughly dissected by a congressional committee delving into the whys and wherefores of our policy in South Vietnam, it will be because Senator Mansfield and Hubert Humphrey brought the weight of the Democratic Party and wall to rail those unions into play to prevent it. What do we conclude from a study of this special number of new leader headed Are We Saving South Vietnam? In which the answer was inferred to be yes but was actually no. First, that American labor was meddling in foreign policy and that its weight was behind Ngodin DM. The next question is, who is Joseph Buttinger? What was his interest in Vietnam? New leader described him as vice chairman of the International Rescue Committee and added that the International Rescue Committee sent him on a mission to South Vietnam in the fall of 1954.
after which he became one of the leading American champions of the Free Vietnamese. He is an Austrian socialist, naturalized American, and from 1935 to 1938 he was chairman of the Central Committee of the Socialist Underground Movement in Vienna in other words, a socialist revolutionary. When Hitler marched into Austria, Mr. Buttinger went to America, and sometime within his first few years that became active in the International Rescue Committee, which sent him back to Europe as its European director in 1946 and 1947. This was the period when American Labour delegate Irving Brown also was abroad, organizing the American financed unions that were to serve politically as striking fists for native socialist parties. African revolutionary leaders, and eventually Europe's pro-communist United Socialist Fronts. New Leader ended its biographical notes with, since his IRC mission to South Vietnam, he has begun to work on that nation. After one visit. What else can we learn about this Mr. Buttinger who interpreted South Vietnam politics for America's 13.5 million unionized workmen and X number of white-collar socialists? The best way to find out is by analyzing his report. Somewhere it should express his credo. For 13 pages Mr. Buttinger ambled through specious explanations of how DM came to power, attacks on the sects, the Bingsuin, the French, and Graham Greene for questioning America's wisdom. General Collins was praised for defending DM during the General Hint crisis but charged with turning against him in March. 1955. It is hard to fix the exact date when Buttinger himself turned against DM, but turn against him he did in the end, just before the blow up came, when to stay on the bandwagon any longer threatened to become embarrassing. All the arguments of socialist dialectics are to be found in this new leader propaganda peacemaking anti-colonialism a key note and interference in Vietnam's internal politics the official foreign policy of American labor. On page 13, however, we find the colonel we are seeking. Anti-colonials among the left parties in France, wrote Mr. Buttinger, of French socialists and communists without actually naming them, have always supported the originally correct solution of giving independence to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Headed by Ho Chi Minh, after its establishment in 1945. Although the government of Ho Chi Minh, was dominated by communists, this regime had a good chance of developing along democratic lines if French colonial policies had not driven the people of Vietnam into the communists' arms. What new leader and Joseph Buttinger are saying is that in 1945 we should have supported the man we were to fight in 1964, Ho Chi Minh the Moscow-trained revolutionary whose aim was the communization of all Asia. Buttinger, the Austrian socialist, had seen government after government in which communists were a minority succumb to communist domination in Central Europe, yet here he has the effrontery to write, and new leader the effrontery to print, the statement that, although the 1945 government of Vietnam was headed by an admitted lifetime communist terrorist and dominated by communists, it had a good chance of developing along democratic lines. What an insult to our intelligence! So Ho Chi Minh domination is what anti-colonialists among the left parties in France always wanted, and French colonial policies are responsible for everything that went wrong? states the man who headed the International Rescue Committee mission to South Vietnam. Nothing more need be said of Joseph Buttinger. The above statement of principles should be borne in mind through the developments that follow. But what of the International Rescue Committee, of which he is vice chairman? The American public, even the segment that is suspicious of anything remotely connected with Ford Foundation, the Council on Foreign Relations and other groups used as political bulldozers and transmission belts for the international left, has never shown any curiosity about the IRC. That it was presented as an organization helping refugees escape from communism was enough, and on that favorable facet of IRC the publicity spotlight was constantly focused. Whether international meant that the rescue committee was part of an international chain, or an American committee operating in the 16 capitals listed in its letterhead, 
was never clearly stated. All that was immediately discernible when Joseph Buttinger drew attention to the IRC by his pro-DM activity in 1955 was that said committee was founded in 1936. Angie Biddle Duke was its president at the time of the Buttinger mission and Leo Chern, executive director of the Research Institute of America, served as chairman. Mrs. Kermit Roosevelt was listed as secretary and Eric M. Warburg as treasurer. There were the usual joiners whose names are found on the rolls of liberal organizations in America. Christopher Emmett was there, but with Emmett and the crowd of Americans automatically associated with the Americans for democratic action were the inevitable conservatives, roped in on the belief that they were fighting communism, not just engaging in a family power struggle between communists and socialists. Monsignor B. Lavarga the Hungarian priest who headed Hungary's last free government, was listed as a member of the board of directors. What can you tell us about this man Buttinger? Monsignor Varga was asked by this author. He alone was responsible for breaking the anti-communist front in Hungary, was the answer. Then, Monsignor Varga, what are you doing on that rescue committee? The answer was a cryptic smile. Sometime in 1951, while the British were struggling to suppress the more more terrorists of the Kika tribe in Kenya, whose bloody orgies and revolting oath-taking are described by Robert Rock in his book Uru, a Kika named Mungain Jiroj arrived in New York. An unnamed pen pal in Rye, New York, had contacted Njiroj concerning a scholarship. The International Rescue Committee saw that the kicker got through Stanford University Medical School and in 1958 sent him home with supplies and operating funds equaling $30,000 per year, plus a promise of $100,000 to build a hospital and set up village clinics. The more mouths were badly mauled and were in dire need of doctors at the time Giroud was brought to America. The possibility definitely exists that correspondence between a pen pal in Rye, New York, and a member of the tribe perpetrating the horrible atrocities in Kenya, was not accidental. And a deep suspicion that the IRC's education of Dr. Mungain Jiroj was part of a wider plan might seem lunatic fringe if the private anti-colonialist war of the IRC did not somehow, invariably, come to light in every area of the world where America's allies were faced with revolts. The refugees for whom Angie Biddle Duke and Joseph Buttinger begged donations and American visas could be bona fide refugees from communism, or they could be murderers being sought by the French in Algeria, the Portuguese in Angola, or our allies faced with the communist-backed rebellion any place in the world. In 1965 Njiroj was the pro-Red Defense Minister of Kenya. It is with the feeling that a corner of a curtain has been lifted that a researcher must contemplate the importance of Joseph Buttinger's article in New Leader against the background of the profession of faith to be found in Buttinger's eulogizing of Ho Chi Minh. Thinking Americans at the time ignored the propaganda front's existence as they read papers filled with accounts of DM's victories. In Western Cochin China the fight against the Cao Dai and the Ho Hao continued. Trin Min there's 2,500 men, who had been bought off in the spring before the showdown in Saigon, promptly deserted and were thereafter, until late 1963, referred to as communists. The one group from whom no one expected anything, then or ever, was the Buddhists. Numerically the biggest body in the country, they drifted. Buddhism had slowly founded into a mire of oriental somnolence. To its followers it offered inertia and called it wisdom. Buddhism did nothing, and graced it with such adorning words as reflection and tolerance. Its branches were countless, but whether it was family-type Buddhism or the ascetic with precious names such as the perfumed lotus of the jade fountain, Buddhism presented no threat of force to come as DM set out to break the Ho Hao and the Kao Dai. On July 27, 1955, Government troops in the West abandoned the campaign, with nothing settled, and moved back to break Levan Van's encirclement of Saigon. While the troop movements were taking place, Joseph Buttinger was busy composing a letter to DM in his sumptuous apartment at 336 Central Park West in New York.
This letter must remain one of the most interesting epistles ever written by a private, naturalized American citizen to the head of a foreign state, typewritten, it runs to nine pages and it ranges from desultory rambling to unctuousness. Its perusal is well worth the effort. The first paragraph congratulated D.M. on his victory over the sects and expressed Mr. Buttinger's conviction that, from the first, neither the French nor the sects would be able to overthrow D.M.'s government. Always there is the assumption on the part of Buttinger that the French were out to destroy his man. Your ambassador in Washington, Mr. Kiwong, has probably kept you informed about the activities that have developed around my efforts to work up support for your policies and your government in the United States, continued this foreign-born socialist, whose judgment and aims were already open to question by his support of Ho Chi Minh. Questions continually come to mind as one studies this letter. It was not Buttinger's business to promise the head of a country to which he had made one visit that he would keep American support behind him. Could it be that Buttinger, more anti-colonialist than anti-communist, had been playing a political game in South Vietnam before DM went back there, to the point of perhaps having a hand in the rise to power which has never been satisfactorily explained? In sum, is the rescue committee out and out political? You may have seen or heard of the last piece I wrote entitled An Analysis of the Conflict Between the United States and French Policies in Vietnam, Buttinger continued. This piece marks the end of a period in my work for Vietnam. From now on one will have to work in a different manner, emphasis hours. Your decision to start a public relations program in the United States is one reason for this. Much of what I have been doing in the way of propaganda and information will now be done by Mr. Oram and his associates. I will continue to support these efforts and advise and help Mr. Oram in every possible way, but my main efforts will go into the project of writing an understandable book on Vietnam for the American public. Thus it was that the American public, as taxpayers, paid for the ponderous tome of socialist propaganda published by Breger in 1958, which said public would never have bought over the counter. One or both of two American agencies must have underwritten the publication of Buttinger's book, The Smaller Dragon, for no publishing house would have touched it on a free enterprise basis. And it might be added that conservative books are rarely found in Breger's catalogues. There was other evidence of the one big happy family in the paragraph dealing with Mr. Buttinger's switch from direct to indirect propaganda methods. In 1951, when the IRC was taking up the kicker from Kenya, a former young communist leaguer named Marvin Liebman was public relations man writing letters and newspaper articles that men who were set up to front for the committee would sign. New York Times of March 12, 1962 states that Liebman left the Communist Party in 1945. Ten years later, when the lucrative South Vietnam public relations account could have been his for the taking, Liebman was running the Committee of One Million, which opposes admission of Red China to UN. So the Vietnam account was thrown to Liebman's friend and former associate, Harold Oram, whose lack of knowledge of Vietnam was, if anything, an asset. After giving D.M. a glimpse of what his friend Mr. Buttinger would do for him in the future, there is a sudden change of tack to the letter we are studying. Before I retire to the study, however, D.M.'s gratuitous, or was the taxpayer paying him also, propagandist went on, I should like to express myself in a personal and confidential manner on how I see a few aspects of the Vietnamese problem in the context of American foreign policy and how I regard the chances of American public support for this policy when the inevitable international crisis over Vietnam will be upon us next year. From the eight pages that followed an alert public could have formed a blueprint of how said public was being worked. Korea is an almost frozen issue, but in Jirot. It also cannot be handled outside the United Nations. And Formosa was static. But unless a drastic change were brought about, Buttinger warned DM, American leaders would come in for little criticism if they diminished the danger of war at the expense of Vietnam. A vast propaganda campaign in which American taxpayers would pay for the drive to condition themselves for more aid, 
until eternity if necessary, was the answer. There was an almost absurd childishness in Buttinger's efforts to ingratiate himself in this rambling letter. The French are now very active in the United States, he told D.M. They even take the trouble to follow my activities, trying to influence or silence me. The French ambassador and his information service have both been after me for several weeks. They have tried to get the International Rescue Committee to disavow my activities publicly. They know of course that they cannot influence me, but they try hard enough and sometimes succeed in preventing me from influencing others. All of the anti-colonialist dialectics with which socialists insulate revolutionaries newly arrived to power are in this letter. D.M. is particularly urged to give thought to what the British might say in America, for the democratic world has a sentimental attachment to the mere word election, says Buttinger, adding that the British are regarded as the possessors of great wisdom in the international affairs. After each step forward in the Buttinger letter there is a pause, an offering of profuse apologies for appearing to be telling D.M. what to do. At the same time, before DM's eyes is a constant reminder of what Buttinger has done for him, that Buttinger is being persecuted by the French for his loyalty to DM but, barring any false step on DM's part, that loyalty will continue. Surprise, and an amused, cynical smile were the only reactions of French Ambassador Bonnet, on being shown the letter by this author. Buttinger next warned D.M. that American ignorance and French intrigues were not his only problems in America. He said, increasingly we have to contend with other opponents, namely personalities and political groups of South Vietnam. Who are dissatisfied with your course? What follows is nothing more nor less than an admission of dishonesty by the man who for the next six years operated behind two front organizations to keep America persuaded that in all Vietnam there was no alternative to DM. Up to now I felt completely justified in disregarding the complaints, criticisms and demands of these circles, wrote Buttinger, whose conscience did not bother him very much since said complaints were never admitted to Teddy Roosevelt's granddaughter, married to a Columbia University professor, nor to the host of other well-meaning women Buttinger was mobilizing to sell America on good in DM. He went on, I had been exposed to much of this while still in Saigon, and although I learned a great deal from some of your critics, all my writings testify to the fact that they had no influence on my positive views of your personality and your political course. Though he had neither swerved in his support of DM, nor told anyone else what he had learned, Buttinger warned that in the future criticisms should not be taken lightly, nor left unanswered. For they would find willing ears, and the people who agitate against you and your government in the international field will achieve at least one thing, they will create doubts as to the character of the regime and the validity of your democratic intentions. Buttinger is smooth. I hesitate to approach this difficult subject. If I express doubts created by information critical to your regime and if I ask you questions which seem to imply criticism on my part, I do it in a spirit of respect and friendship for your person and driven only by my concern for the cause which you represent. After this paving of the way Buttinger led up to the great deal of counter-propaganda which he was receiving. In the world of Marxist reasoning there are no adverse reports no unpleasant facts. These are always counter-propaganda. Various persons and groups with a variety of motives were trying to influence Buttinger against the man to whom he was writing. Buttinger admits to DM, and to him only, that he knows nothing about Vietnamese politics, but, and now read the following carefully. To give you an example. I am now receiving material from Paris containing the complaints the Vietnamese Socialist Party has against your government. Not the French this time, but French socialists acting as intermediaries, which made it another matter, I have received such material from Paris directly and also from the Socialist Bureau in London, which is a central office of the Socialist Parties in the West. Through this. Socialist Bureau All the Socialist Parties in the West have been informed about the complaints of the Vietnamese Socialist Party against your government. Some of the complaints have already found expression in the press of a number of Socialist Parties in Europe. 
As you know, I lived in Paris for a number of years before the war and while there I became acquainted with many of the leading French socialists. I am therefore not surprised that they would try to appeal to me at the urging of their Vietnamese friends. There is a complete absence of any sense of national barriers of loyalties as Mr. Buttingji candidly and bluntly speaks for Vietnamese socialists, French socialists, British socialists and socialists of Western Europe. The reader suddenly finds himself in a world void of national loyalty, where a passport is a thing of convenience to be changed when advantage will accrue to the international brotherhood by a change of flag. The brief glimpse into international ramifications that this paragraph provides, with its veiled threat and good in DM that a world brotherhood was likely to align itself against him if the complaints did not cease, opens a new avenue of conjecture against which to measure developments in Asia, Africa and around the world. In fact, one might add in every area covered by Mr. Buttinger's International Rescue Committee activity. Analyzed with the International Socialist Front in mind, which Buttinger unequivocally held over the head of DM, many of the things that developed later in America's tragic experiment in South Vietnam take on more the appearance of part of a plot than a fact of circumstance. The next two pages of Mr. Buttinger's wordy letter cushion the delicate point to which America's new citizen was leading while promising American support and speaking for an international socialist secret society. During the last few weeks, wrote Mr. Buttinger, I have heard more criticism through an acquaintance I made in the course of my work in defending your government. I have met Mr. Milton Sachs, an old champion, in spite of his youth, of the cause of free Vietnam and a man whom you can justly count among your strongest supporters and admirers in the U.S. Mr. Sachs told me he had known you already in the U.S and saw you last in Paris at the end of 1953. Gradually the pieces fall into place as we reconstruct what may be called the crime of DM's installation in power. Mr. Sachs, as you probably know, has been severely, and I think unjustly, criticized by American officials for his anti-French position during the time when unconditional sup. Port of the French in Indochina was still U.S. Policy said Buttinger in his warming up of DM towards Sachs, before introducing the unpleasant matter at hand. The warming up for each new touchy subject, it will be noticed, was always prefaced by a claim that the writer, or the person he was lauding, had been persecuted by the French for supporting DM. In Political Alignments of Vietnamese Nationalists, published by the Department of State, Office of Intelligence and Research, as report number 3708, in 1949, this Milton Sachs whom Buttinger praises, published an article extolling and whitewashing the Viet Minh, who were then killing Frenchmen and a decade later were murdering post-college Americans in Vietnam while Sachs indoctrinated students in Brandeis University. At last Buttinger reached the point, among the friends of Mr. Sachs was the Vietnamese socialist leader, Ho Hu Chuong to whose extolling he devoted the next page and a half. Mr. Buttinger saw no reason why Ho Hu Chuong should not be free to work for his opinions among the nationalists of South Vietnam. Buttinger admitted that he had also talked to Dr. Nguyen Tun Hon, the Dai Viet party leader, but DM was never left in doubt that the writer's ideas of democratic government would be satisfied if Ho Hu Chuong, the socialist were permitted to come above ground and indulge in politicking in DM's preserve. The suspicion grows that Mr. Buttinger was interested in having a socialist protégé on the spot and with a following when the day came for the Ngodin family's succession, not knowing that in the mind of the Ngodins there was to be no succession. The or else implied in Mr. Buttinger's letter was delicately handled. While making it clear that he was dissatisfied with the way things were being run, he ended with a promise that, no matter what DM's reaction to his criticizing might be, he would continue my efforts to mobilize American support for your policy. Thus, through the efforts of a foreign-born socialist commanding a Marxist audience around the world, and with the buying power of America's almost unlimited aid to South Vietnam at his disposal, U.S. public opinion, 
before which Foster Dulles in his note to Premier four year had claimed to be powerless, was hardened to a point where any policy contrary to that of Joseph Buttinger, Milton Sachs and DM's public relations man was out of the question. Chapter 12 A Victory for Democracy Back in the embassy at large in Paris Brother Luine was not taking it easy while the offensive in western Vietnam was going on. The credit he acquired at home the moment General Collins was recalled was exploited to the utmost. Luine was soon in cloak and dagger work up to his neck, opening offices in Geneva, Rome and Bonn, paying informers to report on anti-DM refugees in Paris and buying cameras small enough to hide in a matchbox and pocket size recorders for tapping telephones. Luine was not the only one to profit by General Collins' recall. With the change of American ambassadors in Saigon our charged affair acquired an advantage also. He had been the through the crisis and was credited with having a direct pipeline to the source of power and information, which there is no denying he had. The Vietnamese are inveterate gossips. Observations, scraps of conversation, every bit of information picked up by a faceless world of servants, knacks and petty functionaries happy to gain face by imparting something someone else has not heard, all these travel by word of mouth with the rapidity of Asia's age-old bamboo wireless. By midsummer of 1955 nowhere in Vietnam was the American Embassy's charged affair referred to other than as Madame News Man in the American Embassy, a privileged position that served Madame Nu more than it did America. Luine, in his maneuvers to extract every advantage he could from his share in the happy turn of events, fixed his sights on His Excellency Femme Duicum, the ambassador to Paris. Briefly, Cum had the handling of the 16 million francs per month allotted for maintaining both his own embassy and Luine's establishments, and Luine wanted to get his hands on that money. As long as Madame Kiwong held the strings in Saigon, Kim was secure, but this did not prevent Luine from probing. Vo Lang, too, was riding high since the mission to Washington, so Luine too sent him, along with advisers including this author, secretaries to give him face, and a French former collaborator claiming high connections in Bonn, to see what he could accomplish in Geneva at the Big Four Conference of July 1955. The reason for the Vietnam mission, aside from an opportunity to put in a padded request for funds, was their report that Harold Stassen was to join Eisenhower at the conference. Stassen was handling America's foreign aid operations at the time, and DM's team was hampered by the American procedure of paying out aid money against bills and vouchers, rather than turning the entire amount over to them at the beginning of the year, to spend as they pleased. Stassen did not show up at the conference, so Luine's complicated paper, showing why more money, allotted for several years in advance, should be handed over in a lump sum for the sake of efficiency, was never used. Luine was ingenious, however, and managed to get things done despite the obstacles presented by American Red Tape. A slick cover propaganda magazine in French, to be published in Paris, was proposed and immediately approved. The moment Luine had an OK on his cost estimate for the first year he had a piece of collateral backed by the U.S. government and was able to borrow enough to buy a small printing shop outright. A couple of issues of the magazine were put out, after which everyone forgot about it and the whole project was swept under the rug, leaving Luine with a printing establishment. When an appropriation was made to produce a propaganda film, Luine and Volang bought the best German movie and sound equipment available, instead of hiring an experienced crew and filming a good documentary. The film that resulted was worthless, but the equipment that remained represented a sizable asset, besides which Volang was making an animated film in his spare time as a hobby. All of the ins and outs of the protracted negotiations that went on between Luine and the Bank of Indochina for the purchase of certain bank property in Saigon will never be known. The essential facts were as follows, Saigon had authorized Luine to buy the property, but 700 million francs was the maximum he was authorized to pay. 
the bank took a look at the violent radio and press incitement against the French and thought it not impossible that the M and New might use whipped up emotions as justification for confiscating the property and paying nothing. Whether the report from Luine's own advisor, a report that Luine stalled until the bank came down to 500 million francs, he then concluded the deal on condition that they give him a receipt for 700 million to present to the American aid office, is true or not, we are never likely to know, and too many things were happening on the Saigon scene for anyone to care. It is not difficult to visualize the reaction of D.M. and New as they waded through Joseph Buttinger's letter in the ugly ochre and white palace in Saigon. Whatever Buttinger hoped his list of complaints and his naming the native socialist leader and the head of the Die Viet Party as sources of information would accomplish, the only thing he really did achieve was to impress on D.M. and New the importance of muzzling their critics. It was the beginning of a program that was self-perpetuating. New already had an estimated 70,000 secret police and informers operating within his personal party, the Kunlaun Han Vi, the Humanist Workers' Revolutionary Party. A parallel network was set up with spies informing on their neighbors, news informers, and each other. Buttinger had, no doubt, wanted reforms, even though his idea of reform was more liberty of action for Vietnam's socialists. D.M. replied with more suppression. His weapon was fear, but as fear of the family at the top spread among the masses, fear of the masses increased, in direct proportion, at the top. Soon concentric rings of informers and security forces, having nothing to do with the approaching struggle against communism, were stretching out in ever-widening circles. Michigan State University, with the Detroit police force to draw upon as instructors, was training police for DM as part of the university's Vietnam project. Soon everyone suspected everyone else, and the veritable hell in which Vietnamese lived, whatever their class or group, contributed more than the unending war in the hinterlands to the weariness that eventually spread over the country. Weariness, cynicism and discontent could be handled by concentration camps and efficient police but continued and blind American support was necessary to the establishment of the concentration camps and police forces. Madame New's man in the American embassy was not to be permitted to entertain doubts. No word of the brewing storm must reach him or his colleagues or successors. Nothing must ever dispel the existing climate wherein any bearer of complaints or bad reports to Americans was immediately turned over to one of DM's or New's countless secret police. With such cooperation at the source, Mr. Buttinger, working in a different manner, as he put it, to continue my efforts to mobilize American support for your policy would take care of the rest. But, as the pressure beneath the Saigon lid increased, Mr. Buttinger's and Mr. Oram's machines, like the concentric rings of police in Vietnam, had to expand also. The lesson an astute political science student could have learned in the years to follow was that the most ruthless of dictators can oppress and imprison, not only with impunity but with liberal support and approval, if he has the foresight to employ a good public relations firm. What he does he must always do as a liberal and he must take the precaution of flattering professors, writers, politicians and journalists with his personal acquaintance. Thus John Osborne's account of what had transpired, Life, May 13, 1957, was in the best style of Renaissance admiration of Caesar Borgia. D.M. in the period from March to September, 1955, moved against his other non-communist enemies, the Kaudai and the Ho Hao, with a masterly combination of force, cajolery and bribery. As a matter of fact, even as D. M. and New acted on the advice of Mr. Buttinger as they interpreted it, a battle was raging in the inundated mangrove forests around Rungset, where the Saigon River pours into the sea. Despite their familiarity with the terrain Le Van Vins six battalions, which could have held out for years as scattered guerrillas and in fact have held out as such ever since, were helpless against the gunboats landing craft and other light naval units DM was able to send up the waterways. The battle lasted from September 20 to October 12, 1955, and when it ended Levanvin's son, Colonel Le Paul, was in DM's hands.
Two years previously it was Le Paul who wrested the route between Saigon and Cape Street Jacques from the Communists. After the Cape Street Jacques route operation he was entrusted with the defense of the strategic point of Phu Mai which he held against a year of communist attacks, though he was only 24 years old in 1953. After October 12 the Bing Zhuin ceased to be a force capable of threatening the government. Le Van Van left for France on November 7, inspiring John Osborne to tell America, Life, May 13, 1957. Since then the sects have disintegrated as political and military factors. The same refrain was repeated in hundreds of other American news dispatches and magazines, though, actually, the exact opposite was true. There was no news of them in American papers, that was all, nor of Levan Van's son. One solution might have been to bring him to trial, but that would only make him a hero. Another would have been to put him on a plane and exile him, with his father, but that was not DM's way, nor news. In the end they stuck La Paul in Fulham prison, in Colon, with some of his men, and amused themselves by making them as miserable as possible. With the Bing's UI broken and the sects dispersed the table was still not swept clean. One other power, theoretically over and above than Godin's, still existed. That was Bao Dai, the emperor, and the machinery was in motion for removing him. Carefully, minutely, the rigged plebiscite was set up. Nothing was left undone. In America the propaganda barrage, which had been interrupted at the time of the Battle of Saigon early in 1955, was resumed in full swing. The choice offered was a republic under DM or a monarchy under Bao Dai. It was from the first a plebiscite without claim to legality, if we agree that legality comes from below. For Bao Dai, whose legitimacy was undisputed, had under pressure appointed DM to be his prime minister. From the DM prepared to move into the presidency by deposing the emperor who appointed him, by not offering the people a choice of any candidate but himself. October 23, 1955, was the date set for the voting, and in America the drums were beating for DM's forthcoming gift of democracy to his people. Considering the public relations machine at work and the amount of American aid diverted back to New York to keep it going, often over tables or under tables in the overseas press club, there are a number of questions that should have interested Senator Fulbright's committee which was supposed to be investigating such practices in mid-1962. For on September 30, 1955, less than a month before the much-publicized referendum, Collier's magazine came out with its David Cern Brunhatchet job on Bao Dai. Paul Smith was editor of Collier's and Diana Hirsch was its foreign editor. Neither replied to the letters this writer sent asking how Cern Brun happened to write and Collier's published such an article at that time, telling the Vietnamese that DM must not only remove Bao Dai, but do it in such a way that he no longer has any usefulness as a symbol of Vietnamese unity. Collier's founded, and America's well-meaning, duped and swindled citizens, being led up a blind alley that went downhill, saw nothing suspicious about the venom with which Cern Brun went after the monarch whom Ho Chi Minh also wanted destroyed. The article that the European correspondent of Columbia Broadcasting System just happened to write was circulated in Vietnam by the Information Ministry, run by Ho Chi Minh's former Administrator of Justice. It proved irrefutably that Bao Dai's ousting was what America wanted. Dangled in front of Vietnamese eyes before every organized march to the polls was the prospect that a resounding vote for what America wanted might make some of that aid money trickle down to the little man's level. Bao Dai was permitted no news space or campaigning. Police made pre-referendum house-to-house -house visits to tell the citizens how to vote. The ballots, which met with Mike Mansfield's approval were green on one end and red on the other. The red half, which is a lucky color, bore a picture of DM. The green half, an unlucky color, was reserved for a picture of Bao Dai. The explanation was that many voters could not read, so all they had to do was tear off the leader they rejected and throw his picture on the ground, after which they would insert the other half of the ballot in a thin envelope provided by the government and a policeman would escort them to the urn. 
few Vietnamese escaped being routed out to swell the majority which public relations man Harold Oram was to exploit for months to come, and still fewer of the cowed public were brave enough to drop transparent envelopes bearing green ballots into urns watched by one of Tran Chan Than's policemen. An old lady had her ears boxed for insisting that she had a right to be loyal to her emperor. Scattered incidents were reported, but it was a victory for democracy all the way. DM received 5,721,735 votes, Bao Dai 63,017, a surprisingly large figure, considering everything. Thereafter, as Raymond Cartier was to observe, the civil war, religious passions, power struggles between groups, the total lack of a national conscience, the corruption and the incompetence, made South Vietnam ungovernable. But these fatal consequences the Americans did not foresee when they evicted Europeans from empires which were much less necessary to their masters than to the subjected. Paris Match, September 5, 1964 what the liberal team directing American policy achieved when they eliminated Bao Dai was a free hand for themselves. Thereafter there was no one who could tell their man to step down. Never for a moment did they stop to think that in a few years they might wish for a way to get the creature they had conjured back in the vase again. Chaos was inevitable. The process of destroying Bao Dai, which Ho Chi Minh had started, America finished with David Cernbrun for a spokesman. With respect for emperor destroyed, respect for parents, law, tradition and everything that made for stability began to crack. D. M. and Nu demonstrated that unlimited wealth accrued to the occupant of Independence Palace. With hereditary rule discredited each Vietnamese saw no reason why the man at the faucet should not be himself. Given money in sufficient quantities, a good public relations man could make anything look all right and a family might remain in power forever. Life magazine's editorial of November 7, 1955, hailed the results of the great referendum as figureheads fall. The same magazine a month later, December 5, spurred America to greater triumphs with the editorial appeal, let's not quit while winning. As D.M. and his family surveyed the ledger at years end from their palace in Saigon, the balance, on the whole, was satisfactory. Only one disappointment marred the record of unbroken victories, and it, unfortunately, was a matter that several million dollars of American aid money could not arrange to their satisfaction. It was the beginning of DM's black file in the Vatican. DM had not failed to notice that the Holy See took three weeks before recognizing DM's victory over Baudai. The next annoyance started during his anti French campaign. As Paris Match reported on August 31, 1963, DM demanded that missionaries sent to South Vietnam take an oath of allegiance to him. They refused, whereupon DM accused them of being pro communist and proceeded to arrest Monsignor Seltz, of the Society of Foreign Missions. The Monsignor faced a prison sentence for threatening the internal security of the state when the Vatican stepped in and saved him. DM's next move was to request the robe of a cardinal for his brother. The importance of Rome's reaction to that request was highlighted by Franz Sawyer of October 26, two day after the rigged plebiscite. The only shadow on the scene for Mr. DM is paradoxically the attitude of the Vatican. The Vatican has just named as Bishop of Saigon, not the candidate of Mr. DM, who is his own brother, Monsignor Thuck, but an unknown priest named Hun. The blow for the president of the council is harder, since Mr. Gunn is considered lukewarm where he is concerned. C. D. M. protested. Monsignor Thuck boarded a plane for Rome. Franz Sawyer of December 29, 1955, told how, pending the outcome of Thuck's direct appeal to the Vatican to annul the Hun appointment, the papal order naming an apostolic vicar of Saigon was held up by DM's postal authorities, its seal broken and the papal order photocopied. The Vatican maintained its decision, wrote Franz Sawyer, and Vietnamese censors suppressed the announcement of Yun's elevation for several weeks, until priests announced the news from their pulpits and Yun himself used the word excommunication in regard to DM. 
The French Weekly, O Ictes, of December 15, 1955, had carried a letter written from Saigon by a French Catholic officer. It is prophetic when read nine years later, to fellow Catholics in France the officer wrote, because he affirms his Catholicism at the top of his voice, he, D.M., is supported by a great part of his French co-religionists who are unaware of the hypocrisy of his motives where they are concerned. His attitude is a characteristic abuse of confidence. If we continue to let ourselves be taken in by our good faith, the consequences will be heavy for us and the awakening brutal. The Catholics whom we wish to support will themselves tomorrow be the victims of either total occupation of their country by the communists, or of an inevitable settling of counts in a double civil war and war of religion. The National Catholic Welfare Conference representative in Saigon as 1955 drew to a close was Father Patrick O'Connor, who showed himself capable of hitting D.M. and his family and hitting them where it hurt, that is, among their Catholic supporters in America. In a radio report dated November 29, and in a press release of December 5, the Irish father O'Connor lashed out at D.M.'s interference with church affairs and the pressure he employed to get his older brother, who was also head of the family, made head of the Saigon Diocese. America, the Chicago Jesuit magazine, editorialized on Father O'Connor's reports in its issue of December 10, 1955, under the heading Church State in Vietnam, with the observation, news that the government of South Vietnam is resorting to press censorship is disturbing enough. That the censorship should be coupled with interference in church administration is downright perplexing, particularly since the free world has been given to understand that prayers, God and DM and democratic government are practically synonymous terms. According to an NC, National Catholic Welfare Conference, report dated November 26, the Vietnamese government has been indulging in some pretty childish antics in Saigon. As NC correspondent Reverend Patrick O'Connor relates, President D.M., for some reason or other, is opposed to the appointment of Bishop-elect Simon Guayn Van Hen as vicar. Apostolic of Saigon. Censoring all news of Monsignor Hun's impending consecration, the government has requested the Holy See to change the appointment. While the authorities are not expected to interfere with the consecration, the whispering campaign against the bishop-elect and the ill will it has caused may continue to ferment trouble. Moreover, Fr. O'Connor sees in the incident a reflection of a growing tendency in Vietnam to interfere in church affairs. Priests' letters are opened in the post office. Rumors abound that the church, bishops, priests and Catholic organizations may be in for government regimentation. The outcome may even be indirect restrictions on preaching and pressure on foreign missionaries to get out of Vietnam. This review has constantly supported Ngod Ndm, not on the ground of his Catholicism, but because he seemed to be the only available political figure capable of unifying Vietnam's variety of political religious factions and ushering in an era of truly representative government. We trust our confidence is not about to be destroyed? Few other American papers reported DM's short struggle with the church at all. In a few weeks it was forgotten and Father O'Connor was once more solidly pro DM. Unfortunately, he never put himself in the place of Vietnam's majority when it was tyrannized by the Ngodins. A prominent Catholic anti communist in Chicago dismissed the America editorial with the remark that America's editor was soft on communists. There was always some reason for avoiding looking any unpleasant report in the face. Father O'Connor's authorship of the original report was ignored, and the mass arrests, tortures and even executions of Vietnamese with no church or personal claims to Father O'Connor's sympathy were treated as of no concern. A former French missionary, Father Jean Renou, who had spent 37 years in the Orient, exclaimed to this author, the man, D.M is mad. He is undoing all we have accomplished in a hundred and fifty years. There was no ill will between Catholics and Buddhists when he came into power. Now unless we can get him out quickly, we Catholics will suffer when he is gone, though we are not to blame for his actions. But his words bore no weight among Americans because he was French.
there was always some reason for discrediting every sincere voice of warning and for believing the New York propagandists who, for an equal amount of money, would have gladly proved the opposite. Chapter 13 The Brainwashing Machine 1956 was a great year for the brainwashers using a fake anti-communist campaign to clear the field for their men. They had a heyday. America was as a nation intoxicated. Never was a free people so mass hypnotized and with such ease. It would not have been possible had the American public not wanted to believe, and believe they did. They swallowed anything, while Life magazine urged them on with THG stirring appeal, let's not quit while winning. It was the period of the bastion of the free world line, and glorification of America's showcase for democracy. Anyone who attempted to tell the truth became a target for vicious, well-directed whisper and letter-writing campaigns, which State Department boys breathlessly composing white paper hui on the guerrilla war in South Vietnam made raids on their passports and smeared them in government files. Long after a Supreme Court decision refused officialdom the right to deny passports to communists, a loyal American writing a true report on conditions in South Vietnam could have his wings clipped with no explanation required. Such an attempt was made in 1959 on this author. How was all this possible? It took a powerful machine, and the money it swallowed was gladly, willingly poured into its more by the hoodwinked victims themselves. The 1962 Fulbright Committee investigating the activity of public relations men in the service of foreign governments and heads of state carefully avoided swinging the spotlight too far into the workings of the Vietnam machine in America. Had they done so they would have found, floating on the body politic of America, a brainwashing organization that, like an iceberg, projected only its smaller part above the surface. The visible part of the DM propaganda machine in America was Harold L. R. Arms office at 8 West 40 Street, New York. This was the part registered with the Department of Justice. Where the DM eventually turned against our arm and snarled dirty type. Over his hapless huckster's inability to keep favorable reports in print and unfavorable reports out when. The tide began to turn is unknown. It may have been that our arm, like many others, saw the writing on the wall and decided to get out from under, for we find in Newsweek of July 30, 1962, the statement that public relations firm Castor, Hilton, Chesley, Crawford and Atherton had picked up the account from our arm in 1961 and was letting it go. The year 1961 is one to remember, for it was then that the scramble to disavow responsibility for DM and his family started. Until then how much the Wheeler dealers made, operating for political reasons or profit, is conjectural. The fee for the Vietnam account was reported by Newsweek to be $100,000. Vietnamese reported that our arms take was $24,000 per month plus expenses. The latter must have been staggering. The first must for a public relations agent campaigning for a foreign president was associate membership in the overseas press club in New York, where name writers gather. Drinks, dinners, bait for recognized writers willing to sign or write articles, these were all legitimate expenses, as were red carpet, expense paid, trips to Saigon so that name writers could be flattered by DM's acquaintance and at the same time say they had been there until the author of each glowing report published during the intoxication years is questioned under oath, we shall never know how many writers enjoyed a junket halfway around the world at the expense of the taxpayer. January 1956 started with Mike Mansfield's reprieve in Vietnam in Harper's Magazine. It contained all the clichés of anti-colonialist dialectics. The French were the villains and the generals bought out by American dollars were described as having rallied to DM. Mike was DM's godfather and the repetitious arguments he used would suggest that someone in Harold or Arms office wrote the piece for the busy, liberal senator to sign. A month later OK Armstrong's biggest little man in East Asia toured the world via the February 1956 Reader's Digest. How Armstrong happened to write it, no one asked. All that mattered was that Armstrong was convinced. 
he had seen one of DM's spontaneous demonstrations at the airport. When on March 4, 1956, the elections were held in which 123 hand-picked members were elected to DM's National Assembly, the American press outdid itself. Time of March 19 insulted its readers' intelligence with the declaration, despite high-handed campaign regulations that hobbled any organized opposition to DM, the election was no mere formality. The American public was never told that only DM approved candidates were allowed to run, or that in spite of DM's precautions a Divy et party member was elected. He disappeared shortly thereafter and was never heard of again. Madam New's election was hailed as a victory for our side, unmentioned was the fact that her constituency was an artificial one, created by grouping together the northern refugees who were being given land, homes and a dole. Even so, out of a possible 25,000 votes she gleaned only some 5,000. Bombarded as Americans were by a constant stream of propaganda from official agencies and a slanted press, the constitution which DM's hand-picked constituent assembly drew up was associated in the American mind with that magic word democracy. To the Vietnamese it brought only disillusionment. Instead of the right to speak freely and at given periods elect a leader of their own choosing, the constitution gave a stamp of legality to the abuses of the family in power. DM's picking of his assembly was glossed over by his apologists with the explanation that bandits would have been elected otherwise. It followed naturally that the constitution drawn up by such an assembly was DM elected. Nguyen Kako An, the Vietnamese attorney faced with a request to help write it or face arrest for opposing it, chose exile. DM's first thought was to assure himself of eleven years in power. Then, by a sort of hocus-pocus, he turned the constituent assembly he had selected into a legislative body. Without more ado the legislative and judicial powers of the country, as well as the executive, were in his hands. He could invite his critics to come into the open and discuss participation in his government, and, without a voice raised in protest from his slave assembly, arrest and sentence them to prison or execution when they came. If they feared to come, he held them up to the American public as proof of their unwillingness to cooperate. Nowhere did any American paper report the crime perpetrated by DMs and news policy on April 14, 1956. Colonel LaPaul, the 27-year-old son of La Van Van, was at that time in Fulham prison and had been since his capture in October 1955. No charges had been filed against him and there had been no talk of a trial. For that matter, prisons and concentration camps were springing up all over South Vietnam, filled with men who were in them for less. On April 14 Le Paul was led out and put in a truck which set off in the direction of Rajkat. He was told that he was being transferred. A short time later his body was lying beside the road for miles from Phu Lam with his arms tied behind his back. The government announced that the military escort had shot him because he tried to escape. This event sent a tremor through the country, there were to be many such cases before the DM myth exploded, but this was the son of a man who had followers, and not communist ones, either. The passing of each month swelled the ranks of those crying for revenge. The American press couldn't have cared less, and it is doubtful if the public would have been greatly concerned had they been told. Anyone against our man deserved anything that happened to him. When the pendulum swung back, seven years later in 1963, righteous citizens who had never heard of La Paul's killing or of the thousands whose blood was on our man's hands rose up in indignation against those who were dumping the Godins. On July 6, 1956, it was Collier's turn once more to beat the drum. Having used the CBS European correspondent to ax in 1955, they called upon the CBS Far East ace, Peter Kalliser, to extol new socialist state. Kalliser obligingly lauded Michigan State University's 30-man team teaching political science, public administration, and helping to reorganize DM's police force, while American officials assisted the DM government with newsreels and documentaries and educational skits which touring Vietnamese actors produced from the backs of trucks. 
all of the hopes and conclusions Kalliser offered were false, but by the time the blow-up came the publisher who printed his article had folded and the team that encouraged Kalliser had swept Vietnam under the rug. What a year 1956 was! On August 1 vital speeches of the day featured a flowery oration by Senator John F. Kennedy praising D.M. On September 15 it was the Saturday Evening Post with D. Marie Bess almost breathless in his pontificating on our man. No letter to D. Marie Bess, pointing out the gaping holes in the report he gave American readers in return for a fat check from Saturday Evening Post, was ever answered. On September 20, 1956, Darrell Berrigan added his contribution to the campaign of deception, in The Reporter. Not a single American appeared to question Berrigan's story on grounds that if the reporter printed it it must be false. People who wanted to be fooled forgot that in 1944-1945 Darrell Berrigan was undermining Chiang Kai-shek in the Saturday Evening Post and that, as editor of the Bangkok World he was part of Arthur Larson's distrusted information service in Bangkok. Reporter editor Phil Horton, when visited by this writer on January 31, 1957, refused even to consider the possibility that he had contributed to diffusion of the big lie. Critical 1961 seems to have been the year when someone on the outside shouted jiggers. And the scramble to get off the DM bandwagon started. As late as November 2, 1959, and December 7, 1959, the new leader was still carrying Wesley Fischel's breathless peans of praise for DM. Wolf Ladajinsky's glowing account of life under DM appeared in the reporter of December 24, 1959. A year later Ladajinsky got another propaganda piece in the new leader. Then the liberals got the word Sol Levitus did a volt face in the new leader and described the South Vietnamese government as an autocratic, corrupt and ineffective regime. Labour's roving delegate, Irving Brown, in a confidential report to the AFL-CIO dated November 27, 1961, advised Labour to drop DM and support Saigon Labour leader Tran Quoc Bu. Stan Carno, who, as a Time Life man in Paris, refused to discuss Vietnam with Dr. Hone in 1956, came out in the reporter of January 19, 1961, with the most brutal indictment of news informers and DM's government that America had seen to date. DM defeats his own best troops, he called it, but this time American conservatives rejected the story in toto on the assumption that if the reporter printed it it could not be true. It was as though fate itself conspired to blind America by first saturating the country with lies which the public swallowed from 1954 to 1961 because they were palatable. Then, when the deceivers rushed to clear themselves of responsibility for the disaster, America rejected the truth because of who was writing it. On November 24, 1956, Frida Utley's dithyrambic ecstasies on DM and his family appeared in National Review, William Buckley's voice of the conservatives. What Miss Utley had done was assemble everything U.S. Information Service and DM's propagandists gave her and called the result the amazing Mr. DM. So loudly was Uses beating the drum for DM in that part of the world. They intoxicated themselves. The wife of the Uses chief in Laos dropped her housework to write a DM biography. Gushed Frieda in her National Review article. Uses was not denigrating DM as the Office of War Information did Chiang. She neglected to observe that the boys who denigrated Chiang in 1944 were the same ones extolling DM in 1956. It has also to be noted on the credit side of American policy that U.S. information service expenditures in Vietnam, amounting to $750,000 a year, are used mainly to build up confidence in President DM's government said Frieda. She called it giving the government of South Vietnam the confidence engendered by having a big strong friend behind it. Vietnamese time biders considered it a serving of notice that DM was there to stay, whether they wanted him or not. Nu saw it as a green light. Frieda told how users helped the government get information to the countryside by means of motion pictures carried and displayed by trucks, 
or of placards and posters which are read out to their neighbors by the literate people in every area. USIS also helps the Vietnamese Ministry of Information, run by the hated former Communist Administrator of Justice. Tran Chan Than, set up information halls in towns and villages, and to maintain boat units operating along the canals. No one appeared to reflect that had a nation with customs totally different from ours sent a team to America to meddle in our internal affairs by forcing on us a president they had selected, we would have been highly indignant. And had their team been as numerous, by percentage of population, as the scurrying propagandists we sent into South Vietnam, it would have mounted to an invasion. The fact that Frieda's thesis found universal acceptance in America should have aroused some doubts, but it did not. Liberals approved it because they were for uses, which was part of the underwater section of the DM machine iceberg. Conservatives swallowed it because it appeared in National Review. So USIS, with conservative blessing, continued to act as a news agency and to issue press releases to the glory of DM. Papers subsidized by USIS proceeded to print these releases on grounds that they were selling America. The egos of natives in countries where such effusions appeared were flattered because Americans, for all their shiny cars and jet airplanes, were obviously fools. The American public was told that everything was going fine, and everyone was happy. Sometime after Joseph Buttinger's International Rescue Committee mission to South Vietnam in 1954, a subsidiary organization called American Friends of Vietnam made its appearance, thereby enabling Mr. Buttinger and Angie Biddle Duke to publish reports under one front and use another to substantiate and quote them. This F of V, as we shall call it, was formed in December 1955, probably the day the men running the International Rescue Committee ordered the new stationery from the printer. At the head of it was Angie Biddle Duke. Joseph Buttinger was vice chairman. In sum, it provided another identity for the men running the IRC. Leo Chern, who was on the IRC letterhead as chairman, was a member of the executive committee of the FV and General John W. Iron Mike. O. Daniel appeared as chairman. The post-war Vietnam American Friendship Association, set up as a front to support Ho Chi Minh, disappeared, as we have mentioned, when American involvement in Korea drove our Viet Minh supporters to cover. But this F of V, which succeeded it in 1955, we find headed by the socialist Buttinger, who openly pronounced himself in favor of Ho Chi Minh in his new leader article of June 27, 1955. Whether Mr. Buttinger's aim within the International Rescue Committee was to help foreign revolutionaries to escape from the police and rise to power, or to help recipients of his sympathy to get into America, is a question we will not go into here. Suffice it to say that wherever communist-backed revolutionaries were in the field against our allies, the IRC was known and kept in mind as the rich American friend who could be counted upon for delivery in a pinch. Time magazine of December 20, 1963, told its readers that Lee Harvey Oswald had written his mother from Russia, asking her to contact the International Rescue Committee about getting him home. What motivated the men who got together in the spring of 1955 and sent a congratulatory telegram to DM and in December organized the front that was to lull America while Southeast Asia crumbled? Buttinger's actions are understandable, he was a socialist. But what was Angie Biddle Duke doing in this galley? Duke had an inherited fortune. He was socially impeccable, all doors were open to him. What led him to become the front for an aggregate of operators directed by and for the international left? In Duke's case there is unanimity of opinion, and the explanation for his action is the least complimentary of the lot. To a man, everyone questioned replies, he is stupid. One of the most prominent women financiers in America defended him, saying, I know him well. He dines at my home, he couldn't do anything wrong. He is too stupid. A well-known estate consultant, with offices at Rockefeller Center, said, I've known him for years, but on anything but there whether I wouldn't take his judgment for a minute. On September 9, 1958, this writer asked DM's public relations agent, Harold Doram, 
In the overseas press club in New York, what's the matter with Duke? He knows better than to write some of that tripe he publishes under his name. The propagandist replied with a gesture of contempt and impatience, use your head. You know those fellows, in the FFV, don't know what the score is, they are only set up there to sign papers. In Time magazine of February 10, 1961, we find Angia Biddle Duke, Kennedy's chief of protocol, whose name is on the invitation list of every hostess in Washington, presiding as honorary chairman at the head table of a testimonial dinner being given by the Committee of 1000 for Congressman Adam Clayton Powell. What a commentary on American society. On June 1, 1956, it was at a Washington banquet given by the American Friends of Vietnam that Duke presided. President Eisenhower was there. So were Assistant Secretary of State Walter D. Robertson and Senator John F. Kennedy. Morning papers in Saigon the next day carried their speeches, promising continued American aid and support for Ngod and DM. It did not appear in any papers, but all over Saigon men were discussing in furtive whispers the arrest of two Dai Viet leaders, Ngu Ain Van Ut and Ngu Ain Tan Nu A, pulled out of their beds in the middle of the night by nose police and not heard of since. Ngu Ain Tan Hoan wasted stamps on letters to Eisenhower, Robertson and Kennedy, but received no reply. Over 250 representatives of government, the armed services, the universities and national civic organizations participated in the series of panel discussions sponsored by the FV that June 1st, in Washington. Senator Kennedy expressed his pride at being a member of the FV. Joseph Buttinger heaped scorn on DM's critics and assured his listeners that the fight was already won. The sect leaders and the French colonels who assisted them in their sabotage, he said, are gone. Fred Bunting Saigon Chief of America's International Cooperation Administration Operations, waxed enthusiastic. Said he, more than two-thirds of the ICAR program funds in Vietnam were expended on internal security. The result, internal security was well on its way to solution. He did not mean the communist threat, he was referring to DM's anti-communist personal enemies. The country has been pacified and security has been established virtually everywhere, he boasted. A national police academy has been established and intensive special training activities are underway. The 110-page booklet on this symposium which the FOV put out in September of 1956 should be read for the light it throws on the depth of America's deception. Milton Sachs' speech is there. So is Leo Churns. General O'Daniel promised victory in the field and showed his listeners a film. Joseph Buttinger, listed as a political scientist and writer, was panel chairman for the discussion of Vietnam's international position, a subject on which he had shown himself an authority as far as international socialist parties were concerned. It should be noted here that the Milton Sachs mentioned is the same Milton Sachs who in 1949 wrote Political Alignments of Vietnamese Nationalists which appeared as report number 3708 of the Department of State Office of Intelligence and Research, and which was nothing more or less than a whitewash of the Viet Minh. The membership list of the American Friends of Vietnam, which Duke and Buttinger had drawn together, is also worth noting. Hein San Thong, in his article in The Nation of February 18, 1961, said of it, the American Friends of Vietnam was turned from the very beginning into a DM propaganda outfit dominated by a relatively small but efficient group of activists on the executive committee. A study of the members that committee dominated provides an insight into the methods employed. The number of editors the committee directing the FV was able to rope in as bad press insurance was unbelievable. Malcolm Muir of Newsweek, Herbert Bayard Swope, White Law Reed of the New York Herald Tribune, Quincy Howe, The News Analyst, Barry Bingham of the Louisville Courier Journal, William Randolph Hearst, Jr. and Max Lerner were all on the roster. So was Socialist Norman Thomas, Representative Adam Clayton Powell, Mrs. Averill Harriman and the joiner of liberal causes, Christopher Emmett. Anyone scrutinizing the membership of this organization, 
separating the activists from the dupes brought in for their names, and studying the methods employed to prevent warning reports from reaching the public, must come to the conclusion that there were men in the FFV who knew their business. How can one reconcile Norman Thomas' name on the front set up to boost DM in 1956, and his equally active membership in 1948 on the front set up to boost Ho Chi Minh? If DM was such a valid anti-communist, what was Norman Thomas, Ho's old partisan, doing on his side unless he was there as a favor to his fellow socialist, Joseph Buttinger? And if Thomas did not want to throw Vietnam to the Reds, what was he doing demonstrating against American military support in Vietnam, on moral and practical grounds, at a student rally in Washington in October, 1963? Why did Norman Thomas help thwart every Vietnamese attempt to get out from under Ngoed and DM when the situation was not desperate, and then beat his breast and tell Washington students that our support of Ngoed and DM's tyrannical and unpopular rule, which he and Buttinger had supported, mocks our interest in freedom and our leadership of nations. American Friends of Vietnam, powerful as it was with its senators and publishers, socialists and prominent citizens, was only a front body for the DM cult. Let us take a look at how the lobby operated. Suppose an honest article on conditions in Vietnam were to get into print, such as Albert Colgrove's or Richard Stan's reports in the Scripps Howard Press. Out of Harold Oram's public relations office would come a flow of instructions to FV members, associates in Saigon, stooges in America. The editor publishing the offending piece would be inundated with letters, many of them pre-written for the mailer to sign. Let the Providence Journal up in Rhode Island publish a letter critical of DM, and in the length of time it would take a plane to reach Saigon and return, an angry retort would come, blasting the French colonialists, whitewashing DM and ending, I am not with any government agency but with a private organization supported by the overseas Chinese to combat communist influence in the Pacific area. Signed, Joan Thompson, or some other name. What overseas Chinese organization? No one ever asked. DM, you will remember had nationalized his country's Chinese, and they hated him accordingly except for Bernie Yong the Chinese employed by DM to assure America that the Chinese loved DM like a father. Formosa's public relations man, Marvin Liebman, in September 1958 described DM's hatred of the Chinese as a bitter pathological thing. It is unbelievable, the efficiency with which a handful of well-financed, well-directed men were able to recruit letter writers, letter signers, and acquiescent editors to undermine anyone who told America the truth. Suppose an unfavorable inquiry arrived at the Vietnamese embassy in Washington, or on the side of Angie Biddle Duke's desk reserved for American Friends of Vietnam correspondence. It would be forwarded to Harold Oram. Oram would be deeply concerned. I cannot believe, madam, that this report is true. You may be assured that I shall look into it immediately. You asked just what is going on in South Vietnam and referred to persistent stories which indicate a criticism of the regime, runs a typical Oram reply. I do believe your use of the term persistent is a vast exaggeration. We read the American and foreign press regularly and, aside from persistently unfriendly French journalists who are fundamentally engaged in licking their wounds, there is no sustained criticism anywhere in the world that would justify your comment. The Oram statement was a lie. At that moment 2,500 Vietnamese exiles were vainly watching the French press for a word of encouragement. After a delay long enough for a letter to reach Saigon and the reply to get back to New York, Mr. Oram's expression of relief would reach the anxious American. Father Raymond de Jager in Saigon had assured him the story was false. Our letter from a priest would usually clinch the discussion. With the copy of Father de Jager's letter Mr. Oram would enclose a report, undated, from the Times of Vietnam, praising President DM for offering a home to Father de Jager when he had to leave Red China. So Father de Jager was whitewashing the man who supported him for just that purpose. Each new name opens another trail for the researcher to investigate. Who was Father de Jager? 
an excellent Belgian priest, comes the answer from his high Catholic sources. An honorable man. He would lay down his life for DM tomorrow. Another priest averred, Father de Jago was not fighting communism. He was playing politics, fighting for the right of his man to lead the anti-communist fight. And he would turn over to news police any Vietnamese who came to him with information critical of his hero, or anyone who warned that a growing number of Vietnamese saw Ho Chi Minh as a liberator from DM and his brother. What about the times of Vietnam, quoted by Harold Oram and used to praise Father de Jaga? The answer, a DM propaganda sheet published by American Jean Gregory and his wife Anne. Gregory went to Saigon in 1955 on a Ford Foundation grant to write a thesis on village life in South Vietnam. Instead, he started publishing Times of Vietnam. The recurrent story that Gregory changed his $10,000 grant from Ford Foundation on the Saigon black market to launch his paper may or may not be true, in either case neither the rumor nor the paper helped America. It is possible that Gregory may be the first American to have enriched himself in Vietnam at the expense of the American taxpayer. A paper flattering the insatiable vanity of DM could not fail financially, with or without Vu Van Thai, the American aid administrator getting a share of the handout. According to Vietnam's 1957 budget debate, Thai's office paid President Ngo Dinh DM and Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge walk in false amiability. Their thoughts are anybody's guess. In 1953 and 1954 DM's labor leader brother, Nu, had eased his men into the International Labor Organization to muster worldwide support for DM's American-imposed rise to power. In the ILO was George Lodge, the ambassador's son. At that time the elder Lodge was American ambassador to the United Nations, close to the ear of John Foster Dulles and Milton Eisenhower. What DM is probably asking himself is, did the Kennedy crowd say to this man, you and your son helped get us into this mess, saddled with this family, now you go out there and get us out. The paper was not a giveaway sheet. It carried heavy advertising, and the only high salaried person on it was Gregory. For DM and knew it provided a quotable English language press, bearing their account of their affairs for users to communicate to Bangkok. Vientiane, Phnom Penh, Washington and elsewhere. Had an infiltrator been directing this operation for the communists, with the objective of making Americans look foolish, or dishonest, or both, he could not have done a better job. As DM's leading English language sycophant in the country, Mr. Gregory's influence was considerable, whether or not Vu Van Tai was his partner, as rumored. Consequently there was every possibility that he might be tempted to influence deals for businessmen negotiating contracts. Eventually Mr. Gregory opened his own import-export business, the Vietnam Development Company, on the side. The only irregularity the International Cooperation Agency was ever induced to admit and investigate in Saigon was the one in which Mr. Gregory was the complainant. Icar Chief Leland Barrows acknowledged receiving a note from Gregory dated August 14, 1958, disclosing the curious, as Mr. Barrows described it, fact that Motorola Communications and Electronics, Inc. was awarded a $47,000 contract for police radios, though its bid was 60% higher than Gregory's. Stepping on the toes of Gene Gregory was a grave tactical error on the part of Motorola, what a mess. Here we had Michigan State University, hired by a car to make a study and draw up specifications for a project on which Motorola was going to make a bid. How did they do it? By copying a Motorola catalog. Naturally Motorola got the contract. But had not DM's own propagandist been the bidder they were freezing out, this deal, like so many others, could have gotten by with murder. As Jim G. Lucas pointed out in his New York World Telegram report of November 16, 1959. How did Michigan State University happen to come into the operations of Gene Gregory, the man Graham Greene is said to have had in mind when he created his central character in The Quiet American? What was Michigan State doing, writing specifications for the International Cooperation Agency in South Vietnam?
it would take volumes to provide the answer. If all the so-called scholarly books published by Michigan State during the honeymoon years with Ngodin DM were spread out before an investigating committee, and their source of the money that produced them probed, it would shake the educational system of Michigan if not all America. The pool of professors acting as propagandists while employed as educators, quoting each other as authorities, according diplomas to students who parroted their theme, which subsequent history has proved to be false, and flunking those who dug for the truth, should be exposed. While Michigan State's Vietnam project was in operation, we find its president John Hanna, acting as advisor to President Eisenhower as chairman of the Civil Rights Commission. Not content with flooding universities with books glorifying a man whom the authors and publishers of those books were later to repudiate, Michigan State in July of 1959 turned out a book for $1.25 on what to read on South Vietnam to recommend works written by the propaganda pool and rule out anything written by anyone else. This book was distributed by the Institute of Pacific Relations. Hein San Thong, at Yale, told this author in 1958 of hearing DM's public relations man, Harold Doram, ask Milton Sachs to do a scholarly report on DM, adding, I'll pay you for it. Early one morning in the winter of 1956, French police swooped down on the Kwai Ophel's apartment of a man named Daniel Garin who was implicated with a communist ring helping the Algerian rebels. Simultaneously they raided Guerin's office in the communist infiltrated France Observateur. In the apartment they found Guerin's friend Milton Sachs. Nguyen Tun Hoon, the exiled Die Viet leader told this author that while he was trying to contact Mr. Sachs in Paris he walked in on the middle of the raid. Certainly the actors chosen by the faceless casting director forming America's South Vietnam troupe were perfect for their roles. Angie Biddle Duke was the star who provided social impeccability and name value at the head of press communiques and letters. Leo Chern, with his frequent appearances on chat in New York radio programs and his research Institute of America Identity and Newsletter, had another following. It was as executive director of the Research Institute of America that Leo Chern advised American businessmen, on February 28, 1958 to plunge into South Vietnam, for DM would back their investments. Labor leaders, the new leader and the socialist left were in Buttinger's pocket. Father de Jäger's word was final in the minds of many Catholics who saw him as a Saigon priest rather than DM's pension running a magazine and press bureau for his patron. The National Catholic Welfare Conference reported on April 8, 1957 that the last Catholic paper in Vietnam had been closed and its editor priest, Father Vu Minh Trac, sent to prison for nine months for defaming the state. He had prayed, editorially, that the Almighty keep the President always in good health and enlightened to regain the confidence of the beginning. This was not printed in America. Bernie Yaw was the stooge to fly back and forth between Washington and Saigon, to Saigon so he could say he had been there then back to America to tell editors, women's clubs and congressmen, don't believe what you hear. I have just come from Vietnam. I have been in the jungles with the guerrillas, killing communists, and we are winning. You are not going to desert Vietnam as you did my country, are you? Psychologically the choosing of a Chinese to touch America's guilty conscience was brilliant. That DM hated the Chinese and they hated him was immaterial. Depending on the gullibility of the listener, he was DM's advisor, a guerrilla expert, a Chinese intelligence officer, and on occasion a Chinese nationalist general. Wesley Fischel and Milton Sachs provided the scholarly articles and letters from professors to refute any unfavorable reports. Wan Tran Van Tung fled from Vietnam and organized an opposition party in exile, the New York Times of August 28, 1955 gave Christopher Emmett more than a column in which to axe him. An introductory paragraph in italics introduced Mr. Emmett as a member of the Executive Committee of the International Rescue Committee, which is assisting intellectuals who have escaped from North to South Vietnam. How were they assisting these intellectuals, by helping them into America to lobby for their man?
And what was Trung if not an intellectual refugee? DM's years of politicking in America were never criticized by Emmett and the interlocking organizations working America, but, with all the guilelessness in the world Emmett observed that Mr. Tung did not explain why his letter in the Times of August 14 emanated from Paris and not from Saigon. The answer was that one did not write such letters from Saigon in 1955 with impunity. There was no level of society or field of endeavor unworked by DM's American lobby. When the word of an authority was needed to impress the person being duped, our letter signed by Lieutenant General John W. O'Daniel appeared in the mail, and a flood of letters would be mobilized if the offending editor did not give it attention. Permit an old soldier and chief of the U.S. military advisory mission in Saigon during 1954 and 1955 to express his appreciation of one of the finest pieces of fiction I have ever run across under the guise of so-called political verity, was the typical opening of an O'Daniel offensive against an honest report. By the time history proved the troublesome writer right and O'Daniel wrong, it was too late. On occasion the propaganda drive took on the form of a swindle. Americans clamored to know what was going on in South Vietnam, so, in October 1956 we find the citizens of Los Angeles and surrounding communities buying tickets to hear an authority deliver a lecture in the Abel Club. The lecturer they were paying to hear was DM's propagandist, General O'Daniel. General Navarre's book, The Agony of Indochina with its lessons and indictment of General O'Daniel's sabotage of the French war effort, should be required reading for Americans. America's risk was limited to materiel, said Navarre, Navarre was doing the fighting. O'Daniel made several trips to Indochina, charged with integrating American aid and French strategic needs. This sufficed to make him the Pentagon's Indochina expert. His ideas on how a war should be fought were limited to what he called the lessons of Korea. Navarre said they were unsound. The train, the form of warfare and the men were different. There was no front in Indochina with its jungles and marshes. In Korea the rear was more or less secure and the entire nation was on a war footing. Vietnam could not be put on a war footing with an American general constantly repeating, do not lift a finger till they give you complete independence. When O'Daniel alone could not impose his views on Navarre, he started inflating the size of his American mission. With its weight behind him he tried to dictate strategy and policy by controlling the use of the American materiel furnished, wrote General Navarre. When hope of victory depended on Navarre's bringing the Vietnamese into their war, O'Daniel continued to play politics in admonishing, do nothing unless they, the French give you complete independence. There is no reason why you should not have the handling of American aid yourselves. The last was particularly attractive. That the South Koreans were never given independent command of their army till after their war was over was never considered. Naval lamented that with each increase of autonomy he gave the Indo-Chinese states to buy their cooperation, O'Daniel raised the price. With each grant of more freedom of command, the military quality which Navarre was trying to raise diminished. Each new liberty of action was used by the people most concerned in the outcome of the struggle to elect to do nothing. In the end Navarre reflected that a firm Franco-American front could have inspired a common offensive. O'Daniel's playing of the Vietnamese against the French prevented him from achieving it. George is Chafford, a recognized authority on Southeast Asia, told in Le Monde, of January 5, 1957, how General O'Daniel presided over training conferences for Vietnamese officers. When his views were opposed as impractical, Iron Mike banged his fist on the table and shouted, Who is paying for this? After a short recess the Vietnamese officers would return to the meeting and announce their submission. June 1958 saw the appearance of General O'Daniel's confidential intelligence report on Vietnam circulated by DM's humming lobby. Its theme, don't believe anything bad you hear against DM, they are communist lies. It is the duty of every patriotic American to encourage private investment in South Vietnam and see that American aid is maintained at the highest possible level. Wherever reports appeared on DM's police state, 
a regimented cascade of letters demanded that General O'Daniel, the Pentagon's authority, be permitted to write a reply. Ready to do anything to get the hornets away from his head, the harassed editor would comply as did the editor of American Mercury. General O'Daniel's refutation, when it came, ignored every offending statement he was supposed to correct and repeated the threadbare litany, false from the start, of DM's pretended miracles, out of post-Geneva chaos he, DM, created public order and political stability. Out of an inherited administrative chaos he created a government functioning smoothly over the whole of South Vietnam. Out of a post Dean Bian Phu military chaos he has created from a strife torn and demoralized military non entity a well trained and well equipped national army. His administration has settled almost a million refugees. His administration shored up a tottering economy, overcame inflation, and removed the vicious forces of racketeering and vice. His administration abolished a moribund and hated monarchy and replaced it with a government that has successfully solved the short-range problems with which the country has been beset. Not a line of the theme was valid when it was written. A surface appearance of public order had been created by terror and secret police. There was no political stability nor smoothly functioning government, as succeeding events were to attest. American dollars created the spit and polish army O'Daniel vaunted, and throughout the despised French colonialist commando school with its jungle warfare instruction. The million refugees were told by their priests to go south, the American Navy and French Air Force transported them, and American aid maintained them in attractive Potemkin villages thereafter for congressional junkets to admire as one of DM's miracles. With the entire Vietnamese economy dependent on American aid, to tell us DM sure it up is to insult our intelligence. As for DM's government and the moribund monarchy it replaced, intelligent Americans will wish with all their hearts someday that they had that moribund monarchy back. Aside from it there was no unifying force or sense of nationality in Vietnam. How did O'Daniel and the rest of them put it over? The answer is simple fear-inspiring police concealed the ferment in Saigon. Suppression of the truth and propagation of the false picture blanketed America. Our State Department cooperated by hounding like a criminal any American who bucked the artificially created tide. Like a heavy curtain, a notion of newsprint from the immense machine headed by a socialite, directed by left-wing socialists, and financed by deceived Americans, shut off every glimmer of what was really happening. Chapter 14. The Showcase for Democracy at Work. While Harold Doram, Angie Biddle Duke, Joseph Buttinger and Michigan State University spread a screen between Vietnam and the American people, a fake front which depicted our new democracy blessed protégés as living in a what garden, things were far from pleasant for those not lucky enough to be at the top. Archbishop Thuck the oldest brother of the Ngodin family and hence by Mandarin custom its chief, recovered from his disappointment at not being given the Saigon diocese and plunged into business with gusto, buying apartment houses, stores, rubber estates and timber concessions. When Thuck set his eyes on a piece of real estate, other bidders prudently dropped out. Importation of school books was in his hands which gave him the rights of a censor, and Michigan State University a market. Soldiers, instead of building defenses, were put to work cutting wood for Brother Thuck to sell. Army trucks and labor were requisitioned to build buildings for him. A Saigon merchant observed, as a brother of DM, his, Thuck's, requests for donations read like tax notices. The Vatican was aware of the harm Thuck was doing and of the trouble that mobilizing Catholic refugees could cause, mobilization that was done on grounds that the Catholics are more trustworthy, more likely to be loyal to the regime. In central Vietnam Brother Ngo Dinh Kinh lived like a feudal warlord, spreading terror with mass arrests and summary executions, shaking down businessmen for his political party and requesting officers, desirous of promotion to hold out monthly donations from their men. When Kin was about to face a firing squad, time of May 1, 1964, described him as a rural Rasputin in high-collar Mandarin robes who wenched and swindled lustily. However, 
During the years when Central Vietnam was groaning and Khan was filling the dungeons and mass graves discovered after his brother's fall, time hewed to the State Department Joe also opined that any complaint was only another venting of the dog in the manger attitude of the French. Fancy slogans and holier-than-thou pronouncements introduced DM's campaign against black marketing, making it a crime punishable by death. One of the most flourishing black markets was rice. Distribution had broken down, war had disrupted the planting, and America was shipping rice to the country that had been Southeast Asia's granary, trying to hold down the price. An overzealous official uncovered a large-scale traffic in rice smuggling into communist North Vietnam. There were arrests and a loud outcry in the press, then an attempt to quash the whole campaign. The smuggling ring was operating under orders of DM's brother Can. The affair could not be hushed up completely, so a court went through the motions of a trial. One man was executed, to satisfy an irate public furious over having been forced to pay high prices for ice when it was the diverting of the supply to the Reds which caused the shortage. The rest of those arrested were given stiff sentences, but Khan was never touched. While Khan sold the opium in Hue that his brother's police confiscated in Saigon, Brother Luine's preserve was in Europe. Remember, a Vietnamese with access to dollars could buy 75 piastres on the black market for one dollar and if he were on the inside he could buy dollars at 35 piastres. Luine went into a huddle with a group of men who had incorporated themselves into a firm called Coframit. Coframit was at 69 Boulevard Houseman, and with Luine as the Vietnamese partner they formed another corporation called Coventer, located at 163 Boulevard Ham Nai, in Saigon. The idea was to use the dormant funds, inside information and exchange facilities Luine had at his disposal and make a clean-up. All of the men in Luine's Coventer office in Saigon were relatives or henchmen of the Ngodins, who had other relatives and henchmen in the National Bank of Vietnam and the Bureau of Exchange. It was a natural. The Coframat crowd in Paris put up 5 million francs as capital. Luine listed his Saigon capitalization at 1 million piastres and made an immediate profit on the exchange. Two Frenchmen named Sauzon and Carsanti were dispatched to Saigon to represent Coframat on the spot, and some of the weirdest financial transactions that ever graced a swindle novel were on their way. William Hunt, an American operator who had made a fortune in China, was digging into the Southeast Asian field at the time and among Hunt's items were banknotes. The British firm of Telaru had previously enjoyed a banknote monopoly in Thailand until Hunt's man, an American named Weber, made the mistake of thinking he could squeeze out a firm of Delarue's importance without reckoning with British intelligence. Weber took the Thai finance minister and governor of the Bank of Thailand, Nair Chotkin Akasem, and the finance minister's secretary, Dr. Suchit, in with him, and the three proceeded to throw out Delarue's banknotes and introduce Hunt's. The inevitable happened, British intelligence carefully gathered evidence and Delarue blew the combine sky high in 1959. There were many arrests, a suicide, and a crisis for the Sarithan Arat cabinet itself. Naturally, the American press was discreet when the Thailand scandal broke. Back in 1955 Weber and Hunt were still going strong in Bangkok when they began eyeing the Saigon market. Weber suggested to Sauzun and Carsanti that if they would let him in on their operation they would all have a foot in Bangkok. The time had come for Vietnam to have new banknotes. And what an operation it was. How many times old notes were exchanged for new ones at a bank window? and then carried out the back door to circle the building and come in the front, the American taxpayer being told all the while he was generating currency, will never be known. A voucher explained the disappearance of one lot of $400 million in local currency with the laconic statement, burned by fire. Weber and Hunt operations followed the customary freeze-out pattern, and the next move was to eliminate the Frenchman. For months a hocus-pocus of bank deposits followed, as Coframat maneuvered to get its 5 million francs back and another deposit in Switzerland. In the end Luine and Weber held the field, 
but all was not rosy for long. Luine, trading on his position as DM's brother, wanted too big a cut. Weber and Hunt figured the lion's share rightfully belonged to them because the money was American, so they proceeded to buy out a man named Lin, whom Luine had set up as governor's director. When Luine began to get tough they leaked the whole deal to Madame Kiwong, Madame Nu's mother. An inter-family struggle was going on between Madame Kuong and Luine at the time. Luine was trying to get his hands on the 16 million francs a month allotted Madame Kuong's friend, Pham Duikam, for maintenance of Luine's embassy in his own in Paris. With the details of his flyer in international corporations in Madame Kuong's hands. Luine knew he was beaten. Madame Nu took over Coventer and Luine had no doubts that his days as ambassador at large were numbered. He scurried to clean up all he could before the axe fell. There were other irons in the fire, and what a buying spree he had. Since he did not trust his office force, orders went out to buy three tape recorders and install them in the office of the ambassador at large on a Saturday, while the office force was away and in such a manner that conversations in every room and on every telephone could be recorded by manipulating a series of controls under Luine's desk. They were not cheap recorders either. Everything purchased was of the best, with an eye to providing the incumbent with as many valuable, convertible assets as possible before he left. Like youngsters enjoying a new gadget, Luine and his trusted lieutenant accumulated a pyramid of tapes bearing every imaginable sort of recorded drivel within a week. Watching the pile of tapes mount, a tolerant confidant philosophized on the way American aid supported embassies are run, with the observation, and so prosperity descended on the little tape shop on Avenue Fruitland, like golden sunset over the turquoise dome of Samarkand's Shizinda. There was no big circulation paper or magazine in America willing to report it, but the divergence of America's interests and DMs had already become evident. The Bing's Yuan and the armies of the two sects that had been driven underground formed a new coalition called the Kaushin Hobin, under General Bayman, Lavanvan's old chief of staff. America was told nothing of this, but instead was led to believe that only communist opposition remained. Washington wanted DM to get on with his job of cleaning out the communists, so that we could cut our aid and bring home our advisors. While this had priority in Washington, the top priority of the Ngodins was survival in power. American advisors were regarded as a necessary evil, to be born in order to get the money that went with them but not necessarily heeded. If the money were cut off there would be no stick to hold over the head of the army. In other words, a communist threat must be fostered, protected and preserved, to keep America in the game, without which D. M. and Nu would be lost. The Ngotins intended to remain in power forever, and this meant a series of moves executed with consummate generalship during the spring and summer of 1956, while the efficient lobby in America spread the Watt Garden picture. In the first place, old General Tran Van Sio I of the Ho How had to be removed. The dickering was long and tedious but in the end he was bought out for a sum reported to run to a couple of million dollars. On the pleading of his wife he was coaxed back to Saigon where DM could watch him, and there he died. That left Bakut the only important ho how gorilla in the field, Bakut whose days were numbered as communists in his rear pushed him inexorably toward the trap DM and Nu were baiting. The incredible thing about this period of consolidation of power is that, Aside from the lack of integrity displayed by our people, not an official of the overstaffed agencies we had operating in Vietnam found fault with DM's methods from the standpoint of common sense. The same can be said of our press. For every move in the crushing process taking place before their eyes left in its wake a swelling reservoir of rancor that sooner or later must inevitably submerge DM and react against us that we not only condoned but approved and encouraged every flaunting of justice in order to break the opposition, is inexcusable. When the Cao Dai Pope, who was in his late seventies but had been charged by DM with having seduced Vestal Maidens of the Cao Dai sect, escaped from house arrest and fled to Phnom Penh, Cambodia, Time Magazine of March 5, 1956, 
sneered at him and his sect and chalked up another victory for our side. As reported by Temps du Paris, May 24, 1956, on March 24 a Frenchman named René Regat was given a prison sentence for expressing opinions touching on the dignity of President Diem. Each Vietnamese who thought as Rogat did, and there were millions, felt the long arm of DM's police and DM's courts. A general named Nguyen Van Phuoc was sentenced to death on August 9 for siding with the Binh Nguyen in April of 1955. Aside from creating more enemies for DM, Phuoc's death sentence provided a moral lesson. Just 24 hours earlier DM's police had raided the home of General Nguyen Than Phuong and his brother. With much hullabaloo, two heavy mortars, 42 machine guns, 10 cases of grenades and 2 tons of ammunition were seized. The UP report in the NY Herald Tribune, European edition, August 9, 1956, was headed Vietnam raid pays off. Phuong, it will be remembered was the Kaudai general who sold out to DM for $3.6 million for himself and some more for his troops in the same month that Nguyen Van Phuoc defected to the Binh Xuyen. Phuong's brother, Dan, had been paid a sizable sum to organize a puppet political party called the Phuc Quoc Hoi, composed of Kaudai defectors enlisted to demonstrate in DM's favor. The raid of August 8 was the first of the moves that dragged Phuong and his brother in the mud until Nu had milked them in fines and outright confiscations of the money they had been paid for saving DM the year before. Vietnamese were to learn that they could not win. These were the minor matters, the big moves had been going on since early spring. Parallel lines of secret police and security forces were multiplying. Police organizations and unlimited dollars could ensure the appearance of submission in Saigon, but the Viet Minh in the north, and Bacut, living off his grassroots supporters in Cantho, required other treatment. Of the two Bacut was the more urgent. DM's ambassador to Japan was Nguyen Gok Tho, the finance minister discussed in an earlier chapter. Tho was happy in Tokyo when left to do his job. Madame Nu had turned her violent tongue on him on one of her visits. Tho took it with bowed head, in front of his embassy staff. He exercised the same self-control when the attractive secretary who shared his meals was banished to the servants' table for the duration of Lanu's visit. He could console himself with the thought that DM, the celibate who feared women, with or without tantrums, was as naggingly henpecked in his own palace, without daring to lift his head either. Tho was called to Saigon for consultation early in 1956. On his way back to Tokyo he received orders in Hong Kong to turn around and return to Saigon for an assignment from the president. Bacut, the dissident Ho Hao, as we have related, had taken to the brush and swore not to cut his hair until his country was reunited and free. To seal his vow he had cut off a finger and ground it into the dust with his heel. Being anti-DM and a seasoned guerrilla, he enjoyed the sympathy if not the open support of millions of Vietnamese. Gradually, however, with communists at his back and DM troops harassing his front, Bacut felt the net closing in. To ease the pressure he agreed to cease attacking the Reds if they would pull their agents out of his territory and leave him alone. Communist-like, they broke the promise. Bacut summarily seized 12 Viet Minh terrorists and executed them. The wrath of the Viet Minh descended on his head. Instead of leaving Bacut in the field as a useful buffer defending the rice paddies, DM and Nu decided to set a trap. Nguyen Gok Tho was selected to handle it. Tho contacted Bacut's uncle, Hein Kern Hone, and offered safe conduct if Bacut would come in to discuss rallying to the government. Bacut proceeded to the village designated and was promptly seized under pretext that the truce had expired. He was hurriedly brought to a rigged trial. An uncle of Madame Nu was the judge, and only one witness dared to appear for the defendant, he was Bacut's uncle, who had acted as go between in arranging the truce, and he disappeared immediately after testifying. It was a farce from beginning to end in which Bacut dominated the court. 
At one point he lifted the black shirt covering his emaciated figure and showed his body, covered with scars received fighting communists, and dared any man present to show as many. When he finished they led him out to a rusty guillotine left behind by the French. A million and a half ho how members vowed revenge. The American press sang DM's praise. DM's New York propagandists and a cooperating press told America that the Ho How sect had been wiped out. Senator Mike Mansfield successfully imposed the same opinion on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In reply to a letter from this author setting forth the situation in Saigon and warning of the future accounting he was helping to make inevitable, Senator Mansfield replied with a condescending brush off. He wrote, I was very much interested in what you had to say relative to the situation in free Vietnam. Personally, I think the only hope lies in the continuation of Mr. Ngoed and DM, and I was pleased to note that on yesterday a constitution has finally been agreed on. I recognize the fact that there are tremendous difficulties still inherent in the Vietnam situation, but when I think of the odds against Mr. DM two years ago, even one year ago, and think of the strides which have been made in the intervening period, I cannot help but be impressed by the progress made by this remarkable man. It is true that he may be stubborn and obdurate, that he may not listen to counsel, but it is a fact that a free Vietnam exists at the present time and that in large part this free entity is the result of the efforts of Mr. DM. In reality, within two weeks of the writing of Mansfield's letter, the Ho Hao Costas and Vietnam millions of dollars. Leagued together in a new nationalist lineup that had lost its feudal character, they were raiding plantations less than 50 miles from Saigon in broad daylight. General Bayman, the former Bing Xuyin chief of staff, reported to his old leader that some of his followers, pursued by DM forces, had been driven into North Vietnam, but that if Le Van Van would return and lead them, all of them would come back bringing ten Viet Minh deserters apiece. Not a day passed but a communal police chief or notable was kidnapped or assassinated. DM's army was constantly under attack. As a reward for his role in the triumph with Bacut, Nguyen Gok Tho was made vice president. There was no nonsense about it, no costly, time-consuming election. DM said, you are vice president, and he was. What chance of victory went up from the American press? As of now President DM is in firm control of his country, wrote Bill Henry in the Los Angeles Times. He has the confidence of the people. He has instituted land reform, currency reform and administrative reform. In his enthusiasm to support DM's principle that stability must come first, democracy can follow, Bill Henry wrote, he, DM smashed the rival armies, jailed the troublemakers and, above all, established the sort of government the Vietnamese understand and appreciate. Bob Considine, in his glowing Indochina payoff, published in the Los Angeles Examiner of October 17, 1956, went Bill Henry won better and polished off the communists and the emperor as well. You never hear of Ho or Bao Dai anymore. Considine ended the column in which he pictured Vietnam as a strong barrier between Red China and Indonesia. Had Considine done his homework his readers would have heard of Bao Dai, for Bao Dai a few weeks earlier had sent a pathetic letter to the pious DM, asking for news of his mother. DM replied that he did not know where she was. At the time Considine wrote his Indochina payoff, every paragraph of which was unsound. The Chinese population of Vietnam was moving toward the Peking camp in a mass movement that was to affect all Southeast Asia, and the Ngodins were trying to strike a deal with Ho Chi Minh behind America's back. GNU was obsessed with the thought that the Americans might cut off their aid someday, or that an opposition leader might gain American support. Openly he admitted that he and his family would see the country go to the Viet Minh before they would ever step down. Privately he determined to ensure the family's tenure of office by making a deal with the North in advance, as even News' most devoted apologist, Joseph Falsop, was to admit in his New York Herald Tribune column of May 15, 1964. Chapter 15 The Blow Falls on South Vietnam's Chinese 
with Bacut gone the only logical whipping boy left was the Chinese. It was still too early to turn on the Americans. At first glance DM's decision in August 1956 to nationalize the 800,000 to 1 million Chinese living in the country seems contradictory to his attempt to come to terms with communist North Vietnam. The clampdown on the Chinese could only drive them into the arms of Peking, which would theoretically stiffen the Reds in North Vietnam. But Western logic does not necessarily apply in Oriental politics. The August 1956 move against the Chinese residing in Vietnam was for an immediate gain. We have quoted the remark of Mr. Liebman, the Formosa public relations agent, that DM's hatred of the Chinese was a pathological thing. For new running the Chinese out of 11 professions could be exceedingly profitable as a license for expropriation. On the other hand the accord with North Vietnam was a long-term project. The greater part of the Americans fishing in Vietnam's troubled waters cared nothing about the anti-Chinese measures and closed their eyes to the fact that Nu was putting out feelers to the Viet Minh. To assume that no one in the CIA, the Saigon Embassy or the State Department knew what was going on is to underrate the enemy. Quite likely Mr. Randolph Kidder accepted and passed on to his superiors Madame Nu's denial of such feelers but those who knew what was afoot and hushed it up must have been dedicated to the principle that every negotiation between communists and non-communists, in an attempt to reach a modus vivendi, was a step forward. As regards the injustice done the Chinese, such people considered only the matter of their loyalty to D.M. Robert Alden, in the New York Times of October 9, 1956, sugared his report by stating that DM had extended citizenship to his Chinese minority. The inference was that he was doing them a favor. By conferring citizenship on the great bulk of the Chinese here, President DM has given them exactly the same status as G Vietnamese. As citizens the Chinese must register and then will be free to carry on their businesses as before, stated Mr. Alton. He erroneously wrote that DM's first steps were directed against the communists, for these had not been inconvenienced. The next move, continued Mr. Alden, was against the religious feudal gangster sects of the Bingzuin, Ho Hao and Cao Dai. Now that these groups have largely been eliminated, President DM, according to those close to him, feels that the existence of a separate Chinese community within the country must be ended. Another way of saying it would have been that the Chinese were the next scapegoats in line, when the communist threat was the one that should have been eliminated before anything else. Instead DM chose to multiply his enemies before tackling the big one. Robert Alden continued, orders have been issued making it illegal for non-citizens to own businesses in 11 important categories. These include transport and many retail trades which until now have been dominated mainly by Chinese nationals. Alden admitted, the new laws, which were issued last month, came as a blow to the Chinese community of approximately 1,000,000 f persons living in South Vietnam. There was a run on the banks as some Chinese withdrew their money. Some Chinese left the country, crossing the border into Cambodia. Industrious Chinese provided the machinery on which the economies of most of the nations of Southeast Asia operated. An estimated 16 million of them were thriving in the Philippines, Burma, Indonesia and Borneo. Copper trade was almost entirely in their hands in the Philippines. In Malaysia they made up half the population and possessed huge holdings in rubber plantations and in mines. 250,000 Chinese were installed in Cambodia before refugees from Vietnam doubled their number, and half the population of Thailand was Chinese. Strong bonds existed between all these Chinese communities, making them potential pillars or cancers in any country where they were implanted. Since DM had no other whipping boy in September of 1956 to divert hate from himself, with a stroke of a pen he started the landslide which made the Chinese communities of all Southeast Asia potential fifth columns for Peking. The Chinese, who had been in Indochina for generations, had long been envied because of their prosperity. 
D. M. and Nu borrowed a page from Hitler and made them the Jews of South Vietnam. David Hotham, soft-spoken correspondent in Saigon for the London Times and The Economist, called the new moves Chinoy Isaias in South Vietnam, in his London Economist report, September 29, 1956. A bolt recently fell out of the blue sky on the Chinese minority in South Vietnam, said Hotham. It was nationalized by President Ngo Dinh Diem, much as President Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. On August 21, 1956, a decree published by the South Vietnamese government declared that all Chinese children born in Vietnam were Vietnamese and must take Vietnamese names. The full import of that edict is hard for the Westerner to appreciate. Many Americans are attached to their names by pride of family, but to the Chinese it struck at the very roots of their ancestor worship. One peculiarity of the decree, apart from the fact that it concerned only the Chinese, was that it was retroactive, so that not only all Chinese children born in Vietnam in the future become Vietnamese, but also all children born there in the past. Since some families have lived in the country for several generations, octogenarian Chinese are finding a new nationality thrust upon them without option in their declining years. The point that Hotham recognized, and which our press overlooked, was that DM had chosen the moment when the Viet Minh were saturating the country by every means at their disposal to hand over to them the community forming the very heart and core of the nation's economy. Hotham wrote. The Chinese were attracted in large numbers from South China to the fertile rice lands of the Mekong Delta, where with commercial acumen for which they are renowned they soon took over the bulk of the rice trade, and indeed many other trades, under their exclusive control. They had their own schools, far-reaching economic rights, and a commercial and administrative autonomy which made them almost a self-sufficing community. This state of affairs was always resented by the Vietnamese. But the situation since Vietnam became independent has been delicate. To dismantle the Chinese commercial structure overnight, on top of the drastic modifications already made to the French trading system, would demolish an already shaky economy. In addition to the law which Vietnamifies all Chinese children never born in Vietnam, a second, more unusual edict prohibits the practice by foreigners of eleven professions. These involve most of the retail trade and almost all the entire intermediary rice trade, both the special province of the Chinese. What Hotham said was true, but he neglected to add that the edict against foreigners hit some half a million Cambodians also, and could not help Boomer hanging against the Vietnamese living in Cambodia. There is, nevertheless, some uneasiness in Saigon about this apparent masterstroke, and not merely among the Chinese, whom it most closely concerns, Mr. Hotham continued. The 300,000 Chinese not born in Vietnam will presumably have to abandon their professions unless some way around the edict, such as operating under the name of a Vietnamese member of the family, can be found. The Chinese who for about 5,000 years have regarded themselves as superior to all the other nations of the earth, consider it a mortal affront to be saddled with the nationality of a state which in the past they have thought of as a dominion of the Chinese empire. Chinese sentiment is not mollified by the official attitude of the Vietnamese government that they are conferring a favor on the Chinese by taking them into the bosom of the body politic. Meanwhile Tpa has registered deep concern at the South Vietnamese action and recalled its Saigon representative for consultation. Peking, which under the communist constitution regards all overseas Chinese as Chinese nationals, has so far remained silent. David Hotham's fears, expressed and unexpressed, were well founded. Rice prices soared on the Saigon market, this commodity is of course Asia's political barometer. Distribution broke down completely. News can Laun Han Vi with its 70,000 or more informers scrambled over the carcass of South Vietnam's trading system, looking for opportunities to make a quick profit by confiscation. It must be remembered that the Chinese being told to take Vietnamese nationality or get out could not take their capital out of the country. 
money being so transported or businesses run by Chinese who had not found a way to circumvent the law were fair game for seizure by the president's brother. True, as Hotham said, Peking was remaining silent as far as shouting from the housetops was concerned, for things were going quite satisfactorily. The first reaction of the Chinese being despoiled was to reason, DM is America's man, and Formosa is America's protege. We'll ask Formosa to request Washington to tell her man to go easy on us. The Chinese of Colon were soon to learn that the world which America leads is not one big family. There are degrees of relationship, and a priority system justified by what the comparatively small group in command considers America's interests. Thus we find Mr. Hamilton Wright Sr.'s $150,000 a year public relations contract with Formosa contingent on obtaining American editorial support for a mainland invasion in Formosa's interest and the world's. Yet the State Department tells Mr. Wright no go, because such an invasion would not be in the best interests of the United States. Testimony before the Fulbright Committee, July 1962 in August 1956 Washington answered Formosa's request for a word in DMZ to go easy on his Chinese, whom Formosa could not absorb, with orders not to rock the boat. Keep out of it, Washington told Formosa. The blow to Formosa's prestige throughout Southeast Asia was fatal. Peking stepped in and said, through its Vietmin underground, now you see who your friends are. Chinese were told to whom to give their money in Saigon. Peking agents would hand it back to them, minus a small fee, in Cambodia, Singapore, Hong Kong, or any place they wanted to go. A clandestine organization called the Patriotic and Democratic Chinese Association of Vietnam grew by leaps and bounds, and one of the Chinese it helped get away from Saigon became financial advisor to the Queen of Cambodia. All along the board it was a political bound ahead for Peking and a setback for Formosa. Tpe began ferrying Chinese to Formosa, but for every one that opted to go to Chiang Kai-shek's free China scores took the road to Peking. On August 5, 1957, 12 Chinese students who had been evacuated with a group of 245 told the Formosa press, in an interview set up by the government, that Chinese had been assassinated in Saigon and others sent to forced labor camps for resisting the nationalization edict. Many, the students said, had elected to take Vietnamese nationality but disappeared nevertheless. The Chinese community believed their fellow countrymen had been assassinated rather than permit them to thwart confiscation of their property by naturalization. Those known to possess liquid assets were denied exit permits which relegated them to a life of terror in Vietnam, unable to do business yet constantly watched lest they try to escape. The 17-year-old Miss Li Xiufong, daughter of a Chinese lumber merchant, told the Formosa press that her fiancé had requested Vietnamese nationality so his family could retain its property. A short time later his body was found in the sea. The boy's father was then driven from his property because no member of the family was Vietnamese. A report was sent to Dr. Marcel Junard, field man for the International Red Cross in Geneva, stating that the use of the river in carrying out assassinations had become a common practice. Chinese claimed that victims were first arrested on fake warrants or without warrants at all, which permitted the police to deny any knowledge of them. Then an injection was administered to induce sleep. The sleeping prisoner was thrown in the water, and a death by drowning report would follow explained as another Chinese suicide over the nationalization decree. The Taiwan press conference inflamed Formosa. UP filed a short dispatch on it, dated August 5, 1957. The Hong Kong Tiger Standard printed it the following day, but no U.S. paper carried the story. An American lady wrote a letter about it, which ended up on Harold Oram's desk. Oram sent the letter to Father de Jager in Saigon, and by September 20 had a soothing reply. The Chinese students repatriated to free China were discontented, because they were repatriated without being allowed any money, except 400 pastors, 
$5 in American money and of course it is impossible to exchange piastres in Taiwan, also at that time there was a lot of discontent between the Chinese and Vietnamese, but I am glad to report that the situation has been improved. It was easy to lull the posers of embarrassing questions in America, but in Formosa, Thailand, and wherever the Chinese of Saigon had cousins the cancer spread. One might assume that in view of DM's tipping of the scales in favor of Peking throughout Southeast Asia's Chinese communities, Formosa's public relations man in America would try to muster some opposition. Not a bit of it. Mr. Liebman's first loyalty was to his Madison Avenue associate. On committee of one million stationery Formosa's own propagandist wrote a California lady who had circulated the Formosa student complaint questioning the motives of anyone who attacked. One of our strongest allies in Asia today. Duped as America was by propaganda labeled as news, D. M. Anu never doubted for a moment that the lid might someday blow sky high. Consequently their feelers went out toward Hanoi. Not until May 15, 1964, in a column headed Humpty Dumpty, did the Ngodin family's most determined apologist, Joe Allsop, admit that New had ever made overtures to the North. By that time New's double dealing could no longer be denied, so Allsop provided an out for himself by saying that New had succumbed to the combined pressures of the unending war and his own egomania. The inference was that New had once been all that Joe claimed him to be but that he had changed. In brief, wrote Allsop, the unbalanced Nu had begun negotiating with the North Vietnamese communists in the last months before his death. These negotiations, strongly promoted by a secret French intrigue, had in turn caused the communists to slacken their military pressure on DM and Nu. No matter how far he had to reach, Allsop was determined to make the French responsible when his hero went sour. In early May of 1956 reports of negotiations between Nu and Ho Chi Minh via Phnom Penh, Cambodia, were so precise and so alarming that on May 4, 1956, Nguyen Tun Hoan tried to get an appointment with Francis Meloy, at the Vietnam desk in the American Embassy in Paris. Meloy, with the pompous arrogance of youth and the then popular conception of DM as America's man, replied that if Hone walked into his office he would not kick him out but he certainly had no desire to see the man. He added, I don't believe we'll be bothered by these fellows, DM's opposition, much longer, they'll soon be running out of money. Meloy knew whereof he spoke, for our services were then cooperating with DM's to separate every opposition leader, no matter how anti-communist, from his source of funds and to expose their contributors to new so that he could confiscate their property. Throughout the hot summer of 1956 Tran Bu Kiam, sometimes called Tran Bu Utem, worked in Saigon with a Viet Minh emissary named Pham Van Bach, trying to smooth out an agreement. American officials must have known these two Hanoi agents were in town. Bach was an old-time Ho Chi Minh political commissar, during the war with the French he had headed Ho's South Vietnam Resistance Committee. Kiam had been Secretary General of the Native Socialist Party, the Dan Chu Dang, which united with the Communists to form the Viet Minh. One of the first straws in the wind was DM's announcement to the press on May 12, 1956, that he was opposed to any foreign bases in South Vietnam, even American. News right-hand man and Joe Allsop's hero, Albert Pham Gok Thau, kept a line open to Ho Chi Minh's ear through his brother, Gaston, who was a Ho Chi Minh official. Parallel negotiations continued in Paris, where Albert Pham Gok Thau's father headed the Viet Minh League and a Ho Chi Minh representative named Ho Dak Di had installed himself in the Hotel St. James as head of a health mission to France. There was no doubt about it, as Premier Nguyen Van Tam remarked, DM and Nu felt that with America so committed behind them, they could negotiate with the Communist North from a position of strength. As a link between French Reds and the Viet Minh an organization called Union Vietnamien Paul Lapex, One Unite, Eight Lamati avec la France was set up at 40 Rue Pascal, where DM's agents and hoes met regularly. Here, on May 13, 1956, 
Ho Dakdi gave a lecture in which he stated that Ho Chi Minh had ordered his followers to hide and bury their arms in South Vietnam in 1954, with the idea of later unearthing them and arming new divisions capable of creating a neutralist climate. Gradual occupation of territory, rather than open attack, was to be the order of the day. Early in this book we made passing mention of a Japanese named Komatsu. General Navar, on page 127 in his book The Agony of Indochina, hazards the conjecture that the francophobia of Mr. D.M. seems to stem above all from his troubles with Admiral Deku who ordered his arrest for collaborating with the Japanese during the war 1940-1945. Komatsu, D.M.'s Japanese friend, hid him when Admiral Deku ordered his arrest and in mid-1956 Komatsu returned to Saigon as a Japanese trade agent. Politically Komatsu described himself as a socialist. In practice he was often farther to the left. After five months in Saigon he proceeded to Hanoi, via Phnom Penh. It was no secret that he was on a personal mission for Ngod and DM. From Hanoi he returned to Saigon. In the months that followed Komatsu was to emerge as the neutral party negotiating between Hanoi, Saigon and Paris. In April 1957 he flew to France. While in Paris Komatsu confided that DM was having increasing trouble controlling his brother and sister-in-law. Back in Phnom Penh a Vietnamese red named Nguyen Man Ha, son-in-law of the French communist deputy, Marin started publishing his tribune at number no. 5 by thy Priang maker van. A British Labour member of parliament and an impressive list of British and French socialists were so closely associated with Nguyen Man Ha that it was never clear who was doing the speaking when Ha's tribune of November 14, 1956, came out with its call for DM to sit down with Ho's representatives and work out a just compromise. Nguyen Man Ha assured DM, this manifesto has been elaborately discussed and edited by men close to you who nourish no personal ambition and have no eye on power. It was both a hint that the Ngodins could stay in power and an admission that infiltrators were in every level of the Saigon government, all the way to the top. Throughout 1956 and 1957 Ha's office in Phnom Penh had been a relay and meeting place for Ngodin news emissaries and Ho Chi Minh's. While they talked, Ho's military political commissar, Le Ju An, maintained an office in the wings from which he dispatched messengers to agents of the Communist Committee for South Vietnam Action, which a Vietnamese named Nguyen Van Thé was running from Din Bang, situated in the area where Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam meet. From Din Bang the network spread to Dr. Pham Gok Thach in the committee's Saigon office and out of this tenuous line grew the efficient chain that wiped out DM's village notables and committee leaders until the countryside accepted what was to be its way of life from 1956 on, rule by DM's government by day and Ho Chi Minh's by night. Lying dormant, scanning every American report for a sign of encouragement, the non-communist opposition to DM in Vietnam awaited America's reaction to the overtures with the North. Time magazine as usual was regarded as the official voice and launcher of trial balloons for the State Department. Consequently, when Time of August 26, 1957, reproached DM for not mentioning the communist threat on his visit to Thailand, there was a surge of hope. The same issue of Time stated that Nu had been won over to an era-style thesis that North and South Vietnam can eventually be unified if Red China can be talked into accepting the concept of neutral buffer states in Southeast Asia. Time told its readers of the existence of a Saigon theory that communist Ho Chi Minh should get all he can from the Russians and Chinese while DM gets all he can from the U.S in hope that in about five years North and South may be reunified outside the world power blocks. Vietnamese nationalists were jubilant. Could it be that time, State Department's spokesman, was preparing the public for a change of course? Through the Swedish diplomatic mission in Saigon they got the answer, no, time was only giving a warning to DM and Nu. America will continue to ignore the unrest in the country as long as no big explosion occurs. As long as DM can hold the lid on he will be backed.
the only big explosion possible would be a revolt in the army, a feudal army of Ngodin DMs which had replaced the feudal armies of Levanvin and the sects. Plots were rife, but so efficient was news in former system and so great the distrust it fostered among fellow Vietnamese that no group of plotters knew about the others. Chapter 16 The Downgrade Becomes Perceptible The critical year was 1957, the year when men studying developments in Asia as doctors watch the temperature chart of a patient, knew it was time for America to quit swimming against the current. Unfortunately everyone responsible for America's policy in South Vietnam regarded any criticism as an attack against themselves. Peter Callis's declaration in Colliers of July 6, 1956, that DM was upsetting the red timetable was arrant nonsense. Nothing was more elastic than the red timetable. It was the red plan that was immutable, and that plan had never ceased to move ahead. It is against the background of Ho Chi Minh's and General Jayap's first rule for a war of subversion that every event in South Vietnam must be studied. Carried that rule, long war, short campaign. Through long war the adversary ruins himself, is drawn deeper and deeper into a mire of local actions. The wager of subversive war profits by a slow mobilization, arming himself first by arms taken from the enemy, later with arms furnished from without. The adversary is kept struggling for terrain, the wager of subversive war spreads his domination over people. When the wager of subversive war senses that the balance is in his favor, the period of long war ends and the short campaign begins. His greatest cards are the climate of general fatigue in the camp of the enemy and control of the people in the adversary's terrain. During the long war period of small actions at places and times of the adversary's choosing, the surface picture of government control is carefully maintained. Not till the subversive adversary himself is ready to come into the open and launch his final short campaign is the government's delusion of power destroyed. The adversary who permits a subversive general to drag him through the long war stage to the final short campaign flurry and the knockout wastes his money, his time and his men, and in the end his country. The French army learned to its sorrow the lesson of Ho Chi Minh's golden rule. The American press, State Department and Pentagon never gave them credit for having learned it, thus, when assassination squads of the Tongbo, Ho Chi Minh's Northern Council, murdered 472 village notables in South Vietnam in 1957, over one a day, those American officials who knew of it interpreted it as a fight for terrain and concluded blithely, we are still winning. The contrary was the truth. By proving that the Tongbo could strike where it wished, and that the Saigon government was powerless to protect its officials. Tongbo administration first parallel then outweighed government administration. Village heads were permitted to present the external appearances of Saigon administration by day in return for accepting Viet Minh administration by night. The enemy's will was ruthlessly imposed. In 1959 the number of village chiefs assassinated zoomed to an admitted 1,600. On May 25, 1961, President Kennedy was to admit that 4,000 heads of villages had been killed in 1960, but the Vietnamese knew that 13,000, in a country that had only 12,000 to 14,000 villages, was nearer the true figure. That the long war stage was being won by the communists was undeniable. Yet censorship in Saigon and collusion in Washington were to suppress the facts till late 1963. Every study of the downhill progression inevitably brings us back to 1957 as the year when America should have struck at the real enemy and ceased to impose the man and family whose very presence drove people toward Ho Chi Minh, while our State Department and propagandists put pins in maps and boasted of holding ground. D. M. and his brother knew, who with no official post in the government remained in the wings like some Machiavelli guiding a ruthless Renaissance prince reasoned that if one could conceal the blight and repeat insistently that it did not exist, somehow everything would be all right. The fatal weakness of Nu and his wife lay in their delusion that they could outsmart, delude and suppress, indefinitely. 
In 1956 their advisors continually urged them to do something about Buhoy and his American companion Miss Ellen Hammer. DM was giving them too much ammunition the negotiations with Hanoi, the arbitrary arrests, the despoiling of the Chinese. Buhoy had means of knowing what was going on. In Europe he had a press in the Socialist Weekly favorable to Mendez France, Lex Press. In America Miss Hammer could publish their anti-DM reports in the Pacific Spectator, see Volume 9, Number 3, 1955, put out by Stanford Press. Princeton Press, in the East, was in her pocket. And these two could not be suppressed. Make peace with them. DM's propagandists and political advisers urged. So Buhoy and Miss Hammer were invited to Saigon as DM's guests in the fall of 1956 and overnight their attacks ceased. A series of pro-DM articles by Buhoy appeared in Lex Press, the two held a press conference in Saigon at which DM was showered with praise, and Prince Buhoy was made ambassador to Morocco. The whirring machine working for Mendez France in Paris continued the build-up of Buhoy as a valuable interlocutor in his new post in Rabat, linking DM, Ho Kaiman and the socialists in France. Buhoy was considered to be the man who would rise in Vietnam when Mendez France returned to power. The suppression of all information on this in America could only signify that Americans in high positions approved. In Vietnam maintenance of the picture of surface serenity was by police state methods. In a report headed DM's grip tight in South Vietnam, as early as February 15, 1956, Robert Alden reported in the New York Times that many persons suspected of communist subversion have been arrested, in Vietnam, recently. The figure is usually given as 8,000. In some cases at least there are indications that the arrests were made on unsubstantial evidence. Arrests are made in the middle of the night on flimsy evidence, letters are steamed open and personal mail read, brutality toward prisoners is not unknown. Carried communist techniques of self-criticism in government offices and the indoctrination of youth are also practiced. If millions of Americans on reading anything in the New York Times that they do not want to believe assume automatically that the opposite must be true, the blame must rest with the New York Times. Not until it is too late does the average reader have any way of knowing, when the odds are so heavy against him, which Times story must by the law of percentages be right. So Robert Alden's report was forgotten, and by February 22, 1957, when a young student took a shot at DM and Ban Me Thuot and missed him, no observations were made on the relation between cause and effect. Instead of asking why the boy acted, the event was used to engulf America in another wave of DM propaganda. Not a paper asked what happened to the boy, whether he was tortured, whether he was ever given a trial. He had attacked America's man, that was enough. When Generalissimo Franco executed a known terrorist whose hands were red with the blood of hundreds of innocent victims our press outdid itself, an avalanche of letters descended on Madrid. No one was told or has ever asked what became of the boy who shot at DM or why he did it. The pat answer was that he was a communist, which he was not. Two days before the shooting in Banmeath you at the armored car regiment stationed at Govap about six miles from Saigon, stood poised to roll on the capital, when the plot was disclosed by a sergeant who preferred the certainty of enrichment and promotion to the hazards of a coup d'etat. Colonel High, commander of the regiment, was trapped. A commandant named Ch managed to reach Phnom Penh. All Southeast Asia knew of the plot, its indication of rot within the army and the aggravation caused by the executions that followed, but not a word reached America. With Prince Buhoy and Miss Hammer, the only anti diemists with a press in America, bought off, the way was clear for a junket, and what a carnival it was. The propaganda team thought of everything. Repression of all opposition? DM took care of that with a stroke of a pen. The last thing he did before taking off for America was to announce the formation of a legal opposition, the newly formed Democratic Bloc under that old fair-haired boy of America's wartime OSS, Fan Ken Dan, formerly known as Fan Huey Dan. 
in Paris Stan was represented by a pockmarked doctor named Fam Huey Co who aspired to be ambassador to France under an eventual Dan government. Co was a great asset to Dan on any terms, for Co's brother-in-law was none other than Tran Shanthan, the former communist whose long arm extended into every security organization and informer ring in Vietnam. Co and Dan's friends in CIA were Dan's insurance against arrest. So if an opposition was necessary, even one hand picked by the man in power, to kid the Americans into thinking democratic government existed under their protege, Dan was the man who would get the nod. Fam Huey Co held a press conference followed by a cocktail party in the Hotel Lutetia in Paris. It was paid for by American aid. Most of the journalists present quipped about the invitation cards, on which legal opposition was emphasized as though being hand-picked by the man in power was something in Dan's favor. America's capacity for being conned was unlimited. Our press unblushingly swallowed the legal opposition, which was never allowed to campaign for anything in reality. Two years later when Dan was elected to the National Assembly, he was forcibly thrown out of the assembly by DM's police. What a heyday the DM lobby had whether calling itself American Friends of Vietnam or International Rescue Committee, from the beginning of DM's 1957 visit to the US until he left, for DM's triumph was their triumph. I personally awaited his distinguished guest at the airport in Washington as the Columbine 111, which had been sent to Honolulu to meet him, neared home. The National Press Club turned out, Congress on the eve of a debate over foreign aid, listened to DM as he campaigned for more money, appropriated for longer periods, a crash program for a leap ahead was what exponents of aid called it. DM fooled everybody, said a column, bearing all the earmarks of Harold Oram's public relations handouts, in the New York Journal American of May 11th. He eliminated gangster national police, outlawed gambling and prostitution in Saigon won the loyalty of powerful religious sects, crushed rebellious and jealous foes. Only the fooled everybody was true. For three days, May 12th, 13th, 14th, 1957, Marguerite Higgins, not yet campaigning for a communist-supported gang of cutthroats in Algeria, made her Herald Tribune column a dithyrambic plea for DM whom the Trib's editorialist advanced on his page and news writers on theirs. As Marguerite Higgins saw it, cutting off the funds with which DM was supplied might save $3 million, as proposed by Senator Bridges of New Hampshire, or $10 million, as proposed by the United States Chamber of Commerce, but it would bring communism to the shores of Japan, all Asia and the Middle East. Said an editorial of the Herald Tribune on May 9. His, DM's, people began to listen to him and turn their backs on communists. In the same issue Walter Briggs extolled the miracle maker from Asia, DM of South Vietnam. Senator Mike Mansfield, Democratic Whip, according to the Washington Post of that same day, said the speech, made by DM before Congress, was excellent and right to the point. The following morning the New York Times announced that in reply to a journalist asking if he sought more American aid, DM replied, we have accomplished a good deal. We have been successful in rehabilitating 860,000 refugees from the north and this problem is almost finished. We have maintained an army which is an army. On Sunday, May 11, 1957, America's folly took off for New York in a cloud of glory. American conservatives, caught up in the mass intoxication, swallowed anti-communist headlines. And exulted in the thought that somewhere we were coming out on top. New York dignitaries awaited DM, accompanied by Vu Van Tai and Tran Le Keng, the former Viet Minh officials, at the airport, rushed them to St. Patrick's Cathedral for a mass and from there to Tarrytown, New York, for a luncheon with John D. Rockefeller, three and Mr. and Mrs. David Rockefeller. Among the guests falling over themselves in praise of their guest of honor were Dr. Henry T. Heald, president of Ford Foundation, and his wife, Joseph V. Johnson, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, John J. McCloy, chairman of the board of Chase Manhattan Bank, 
and Mrs. McCloy, Ogden R. Reed, president and editor of the New York Herald Tribune, which gave DM Rave stories on pages 1, 13, 14 and 15 the following morning, and Mrs. Reed, James J. Rorimer, president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Mrs. Rorimer, Dean Rusk, president of the Rockefeller Foundation and Mrs. Rusk, Paul J. Sherbert, executive director of the Asia Society, and Mrs. Sherbert, Howard C. Shepard, chairman of the board of the First National City Bank, and Mrs. Shepard, and Kenneth T. Young, Jr., director of the Office of Southeastern Asian Affairs in the State Department, and Mrs. Young. On Monday, the 12th, D.M. was given his ticker tape parade, luncheon by the mayor at the Waldorf Astoria, and an afternoon reception by the Council on Foreign Relations. But of all the honors heaped upon him, including the fawning adoration of the Far Eastern Council on Commerce and Industry, the most transparent was the banquet at which Angie Biddle Duke presided on the evening of May 12th in New York's Hotel Ambassador. From the first a cursory glance at the men and organizations playing the DM card should have awakened decent Americans to the fact that they were being played like yokels at a county fair, but the public's gullibility was boundless because they wanted to believe. When the awakening came, when the forces boiling in Vietnam could be suppressed no longer and DM was pushed over, with the approval and encouragement of the former president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Dean Rusk, who had helped to lionize D. Emmett John D. Rockefeller highs on May 11, 1957, each dupe found an out satisfactory to himself. Joe also persuaged his ego by claiming that D. Emmons knew had changed. Thousands of American conservatives followed the course of most comfort and least thinking, they decided the forces represented at the Rockefeller luncheon had destroyed D. M. and arranged his death. When they found they could not manage him, and from that conclusion, which freed America's conservatives from charges of failing to think in 1957, they refused to budge. Picture the International Rescue Committee banquet for DM, at the Ambassador. At the head table Angie Biddle Duke and his clique, officially wearing their International Rescue Committee identities that evening, though everyone knew that the same men, with another set of calling cards and letterheads, ran DM's lobby the American Friends of Vietnam. With a straight face a United Press writer announced the farce in the Herald Tribune, Mr. D.M. will receive the International Rescue Committee's award for leadership among free nations at a dinner next Monday. Mr. D.M. will be the first recipient of the annual award named for the late polar explorer, Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The Vietnamese government contributed $100,000 to the committee's Hungarian relief work. Translated literally, Angie Biddle Duke, as head of the IRC, gave his man an award cooked up as a propaganda gimmick for just that occasion. No one else had ever received it, and DM paid off by writing out a check for $100,000, American taxpayers' money, for his own propagandists, who had honored him under the front organization and would ring the award of its last drop of publicity value under another. Mr. Joseph Buttinger of the IRC is perhaps best known due to widespread publicity, particularly from his best friend, Leo Kham, for having gone to Vienna at his own expense as representative of the IRC, to help Hungarian refugees after the revolt of October 1956. Mr. Richard Arens, director of the House Un-American Activities Committee, stated in Washington on April 18, 1957 that since the Hungarian patriots were in control from October 23, 1956, until November 15, the only ones who had reason to flee during that period were the Hungarian communists. On November 15, he added, the communists reasserted their control in Hungary. They took over and sealed the borders. Those who came out fell into two categories, first, the freedom fighters who were able to get through the machine gun nests that were established and, secondly, those whom the communists wanted to come out. The security officers have told us repeatedly that it is impossible to screen out the communists and subversives because background information is not available. This brings up a vital question about the types of refugees Mr. Buttinger and Mr. Chern expedited into the US during. 
The wave of sympathy in this country in late 1956 for Hungarian refugees? How many of these were actual freedom fighters and how many were communists? Equally important, how many were members of an intermediary group, the Socialist Party of Europe? The efficiency of which organization was shown in the Buttinger letter to President D.M. If Mr. Arendt's committee had no way of checking the backgrounds of the men in question, the same could hardly be said of Mr. Buttinger after reading the outline of his sources of information as put to D.M. The next man to receive the award on which Duke and Joseph Buttinger had hung Admiral Byrd's name, Byrd was dead and had no say in the matter, was Germany's socialist leader, Willy Brandt who used it to show Germans that he, not Adenauer, was the man America preferred. By 1964 a new front, the Dooley Foundation, named for Dr. Thomas Dooley was added to the keyboard, and the first man to receive. The Dooley Foundation's splendid American award was Henry Cabot Lodge, for his achievement in polishing off in 1963 the liability, which is to say the DM regime, which Duke, Buttinger, Leo Chern, Dooley's friends, in sum, were selling in 1957. P. T. Barnum was never more cynical than the gang that sold America on Gerd in D.M. Dooley, the idealist, was shamefully exploited, both as a fundraiser and for his publicity value, by Duke and his group. The New York Times Magazine of April 20, 1958 ran a story signed by Dooley at the time of his fundraising tour for Medico, an IRC front. Dooley donated the proceeds from his bestseller. Deliver us from evil, to Duke's organization. Luella Parsons reported in the Hearst Press on December 5, 1959, that Buddy Adler had just paid well over $100,000 for Dooley's movie rights. Pharmaceutical companies were constantly reported as making gifts of instruments and drugs running as high as $50,000 per donation. Dooley so believed in what he was doing that the day he appeared on Martha Dean's morning radio program, where Leo Chern regularly aired his views, he talked the taxi driver who took him to the worst studio into donating his tips for the day to IRC. The Tablet of February 15, 1958 quoted Angie Biddle Duke as setting a $1 million goal for the Dooley fundraising drive. Mike Corliss, in his New York Post column of March 10, 1958, lauded Dooley for taking nothing from his books, giving everything to IRC and Medico. Even Dooley's death by cancer was wrung to the last donation check by Duke et al. How much of the flow of dollars financed political activity rather than medical? no one has ever asked. On November 27, 1957, Dooley spoke in New York. A lady in the audience asked him if he could explain the National Catholic Welfare Conference report on April 8, 1957, on DM's sentencing a priest to prison and closing down a Catholic paper. So profoundly had the self-sacrificing young doctor been drawn into the game of those making money on him that he replied, if DM has imprisoned a priest, you may be sure he had good reason. Accompanied by Minister of Public Works and Communications Tran Le King, Ambassador and M. Tran Van Kuong, and a plane load of State Department officials, DM took off for Detroit and Lansing, where he and his team at Michigan State went through the same sort of performance Duke had set up in Washington and New York. The Detroit banquet was important, for one must remember that American labor had its own foreign policy and that policy was to meddle in Vietnamese affairs to any extent and by any means that would ensure the perpetuation of Ngo Dinh Diem's power. Vietnamese opponents of Diem are still asking if State Department's Kenneth T. Young, Jr., is related to the Kenneth Young who is Assistant Public Relations Chief for AU Thus Metal Workers Union. From Michigan, the presidential party was scheduled to visit Knoxville. Tennessee, then head for Los Angeles and a guided tour as guests of R. L. Menkela, president of General Petroleum Company, to show D. M. and King how oil is produced. In Los Angeles the big banquet was staged by the Los Angeles World Affairs Council in the California Club with executive director of the council, Walter P. Coombs, presiding.
The boys hoodwinking America shook hands all around and called it a job well done when the 16-day DM circus ended. Why not repeat it in Asia, they asked. Accordingly, in mid-August, with the US Information Service issuing glowing communiques like a press agency and users subsidized papers printing them. DM descended on Bangkok, Thailand, where no protective censorship existed and where DM himself was so hated that Thai press men were frisked for revolvers before being permitted into his press conferences. Thailand's premier, P. Bill Songram, tried valiantly to go through with it, but even American Daryl Berrigan's Bangkok World was forced to announce on August 19 that P. Bill had at the last minute backed out of accompanying his embarrassing guest on a jaunt to Thailand's ancient capital. The premier was playing it cautious and taking his distance. If dollars and adroit manipulation of mass communications media could not sell Asiatics on America's man, DM's Far East junkets, costly as they were to the American taxpayer, were still not a total loss. The DM machine in America could tell Americans that DM's every trip, Bangkok, Manila, Formosa, was a triumph. An honest reporter who knew what he was doing might not be able to get his story in print, but a Los Angeles writer named Polyzoides had no trouble in using the powerful Los Angeles Times to defuse any fool thesis he wished to circulate. End of Civil War Insight in Vietnam, Polyzoides told his readers. Meanwhile back in Saigon Nu and his wife counted the hall from confiscating Bao Dai's property and looked around to see what else they could seize. And the communists stuck to their knitting, plugging along in the villages and rice paddies, grabbing a supply of arms here and taking over another local administration there. As long as initiative remained with them, time could not help but be on their side. The tragic part of it was, as though D. Emmons knew and every American agent who knew what was going on consciously wished for a communist victory, a monster police machine in South Vietnam clapped a heavy hand over the mouth of every man who would cry the alarm. On December 8, 1963, the New York Times published a report by Hedrick Smith, stating that Saigon was no longer cringing from a state of terror. Arrests have been publicized and the treatment of political prisoners is far more humane than under the DM regime which had 18 different security apparatuses seizing people at any hour of day or night, wrote Hedrick Smith. The question is, why did the New York Times lower a blackout on this state of affairs for nine years when reporting might have saved Southeast Asia? Having been lied to for nine years. Is it any wonder that the American public refused to believe the truth when the New York Times could no longer avoid facing the facts? Vo Lang, the deputy ambassador whom DM's brother Luine had rushed to Washington in April 1955, struggled with his conscience for six years, then wrote letters to Senators Mansfield and Humphrey and everyone else he had met when on the DM bandwagon, begging them to do a bold face and help save his country. Desperate, with tears in his eyes and talking about suicide, he decided as a last resort to get in touch with Joseph Ballantyne, the retired foreign service man who had so impressed him when they met in Washington. It was no use, Mr. Ballantyne's wife was the daughter of the American poet, Robert Frost, of whom Leo Kham, an amateur sculptor as well as DM propagandist, had just made a bust. Madame la Comte de Nuit indignantly exclaimed, when told of the use of torture on DM's non-communist opposition, it's a lie. The head of DM's Jules translated my husband's books and I know he wouldn't do anything like that. Mrs. Clochette P., wife of a Columbia University professor, cancelled a tea appointment on November 9, 1956, because she knew the subject of Ngo Din DM was coming up.